The creature rocked back and forth in its lead-lined cell, voice raw from screaming. No matter how it screamed, it seemed that none of the strangers would listen. They could hear the shrieks, oh, could they hear them, but they did not stop, didn't turn off the bright, bright lights that seared the creature's tender eye, didn't quiet the horrible noises or cool the too warm air, or just open the door and let it go home. No, they did quite the opposite. When the creature cried out, the strangers would come close and poke at its flesh. They would strap it to a table and shine bright lights into its eye. They would prod and examine, force the eye to open and look at that horrible, horrible light. What was this place? Why did the air smell so wrong, feel so heavy? All the creature wanted was home, to run and run and run and breathe the fresh, clean air of the place where it belonged. But they would not listen. They would not let it walk free. A thought struck the creature all of a sudden. The thought that it might not ever breathe the air of its home again. It began to weep with renewed vigor, cries echoing off the walls of its cell. Perhaps it could try to run, but it was so much weaker, getting weaker every day. And the bright lights, the heat, the sounds, they only weakened the creature further. It was so tired, so hungry, along with nothing but the pain, the grief, and its own thoughts. It remembered its dwindling moments of freedom, the days before the strangers came to take it away. The land it was in before it was brought to this place was not home either. The air there was too thick, too warm and heavy. It put a feeling of fever in the creature's body, making its breaths ragged and painful. But at least that land, which the creature might have called Guatemala if it understood what the locals were saying, did not keep it trapped. At least that land had space, water, and plenty of meat. The air had made the creature feel ill, and as it wandered the countryside, it often found itself crying out in discomfort, frustration, or simple hunger. It had no way of knowing that its nightly cries had reached the ears of the townspeople, whose imaginations had conjured visions of hellish beasts and demons skulking around their village. A few people spotted the creature's silhouette in the darkness, always from a distance, and quickly rushed back to warn their loved ones. They described the horror they had seen. The six-foot-five emaciated figure, hairless and gray, with long, thin legs terminating in sharp points and clawed hands at the tips of unsettling, distended arms. What else could they call it but a monster? Reports of the creature spread in hushed, frightened whispers, and many began keeping their children inside, especially after dark. But kids will be kids, and some of the more rebellious children were bound to break these new rules. A group of young boys, bored and restless at home, snuck out together to kick around a soccer ball under the glow of the moonlight. They played and laughed for about an hour, though not too loudly so they wouldn't wake their parents. Then, their fun was interrupted by a strange sound, a screech like a wounded animal. Forgetting for a moment the rumors of a monster in the village, they followed the sound. If it was an injured animal, they wanted to see if they could help, maybe bring home a new pet, or in the case of one particularly mischievous boy, poke it with a stick and see what would happen. But as the sound grew louder and they got closer to its source, down a rural road on the edge of town, they could make out the outline of the injured creature. This was no animal or not one they had ever seen before. It looked far more like a man, though again, not one they had ever seen before. Something about him looked wrong. The figure was thrashing on the ground, panting and jerking its legs. They couldn't see its face, but its back was heaving with labored breaths, and it was weeping. They called out to the hunched figure and slowly approached it to try to offer help. The figure slowly lifted its head to meet the eyes of the boys gathered around it, but the boys did not see a pair of eyes looking back at them in return. Instead, they watched in horror as the creature stilted, becoming acutely aware of their presence. Then, 
it lifted its head, revealing nothing but a wide mouth splitting the smooth surface of its face. Its lack of lips parted slowly, exposing gnarled, chipped, rotted teeth. The mouth opened wider, wider, wider still, revealing a translucent, milky blue sphere inside. It locked onto them, and the boys somehow felt its gaze. This sphere inside the creature's mouth, there was no doubt about it. It was the beast's eye. As it gazed at the group of boys, the creature felt its hunger stirring once more. They looked so fragile, so tender, so delicious. It rose to its full height and stretched its arms towards its prey. It was weak, sickly, and couldn't pounce on the boys and tear them to shreds like it so desperately wished to. It swiped at one boy, tearing his shirt, but the boy was too agile, too quick. With sudden cries of terror, the children fled, leaving the creature alone once more. Back in the village, the boys told their parents their story, and word promptly spread to the authorities. At first, no one wanted to believe it. How could the rumors of a demon outside the village be true? But even as many of the adults were intent on ignoring the dark possibility staring them in the face, a mysterious illness began to sweep through the community. It began with a sighting of the monster, its long skeletal limbs, its wide mouth, and its giant, milky eye. Next, the physical symptoms set in. Severe nausea, vomiting, headaches, diarrhea, muscle weakness and fatigue that spread through the entire body and rendered them weak, helpless. Next, lesions began to form on their skin, burns and sores that blistered and wept. No one yet had the language to explain the symptoms, but these poor people were suffering from acute radiation sickness. It was no doubt the monster's doing, though how exactly the illness took root was still a mystery. As more and more people grew ill, nearly a dozen now, people began to vanish from the village. No one ever found any bodies, but certain bits of evidence, tattered bits of clothing, smears of blood across the walls and ground suggested that whatever had become of these missing people, it was not pretty. Meanwhile, the creature stalked the edges of the village, picking off the weak that it could corner and surprise. It targeted the injured, the elderly, the very, very young, anyone that it could get an advantage over, even in its sickly, weakened state. With each meal, the creature became just a little bit stronger. If it could keep feeding while evading capture, perhaps it could get out of this place and make its way back home. But while the creature was planning as best it could, other forces were at work, crafting their own plans to protect the village and its people. Over a dozen were now hospitalized, and seven were missing. The incident had attracted the attention of General Makyo and his colleagues at an organization that was not yet called the SCP Foundation. With little known knowledge of just what he was walking into, but a determination to find out, General Makyo assembled a research and recovery team and began to search the area. It didn't take the creature long to realize that something was hot on its trail. It was still not in peak condition, but several proper meals had gone a long way, and the creature was more than ready to defend itself if needed. As General Makio's men closed in on the beast, cornering it on the same rural back road where the children had first stumbled upon it, it appeared that the need had actually arisen. The men advanced on the creature, assault rifles drawn and prepared to open fire. But before they could fire a single bullet, the creature leaped into action. It slashed at the soldiers with its claws, cutting through their armor like tissue paper. It slashed in every direction, carving up the men and forcing them to retreat and attempt to bring it down with ranged attacks rather than a direct assault. As they opened fire on the creature, they got a glimpse of the creature's previously unknown anomalous ability. It opened its mouth, stretching it so wide that the creature's face nearly unhinged at the jaw, and the eye emerged to stare down one of the soldiers standing in front of it. The eye glowed brighter and brighter, emitting a white-hot light that left several nearby soldiers temporarily blind. Then, one of the soldiers, the closest to the creature, was yanked forward, then appeared to collapse in on himself until he and his screams disappeared. A witness would later describe the incident as appearing as if the soldier had been pulled into a miniature black hole. The same effect happened again, but this time the creature itself was the one to disappear. 
The officers didn't have a chance to wonder where it had gone as it suddenly reappeared further down the road, on the opposite side of the men. Researchers would later identify this strange ability as the production of micro-singularities, tiny black holes that the creature could use to teleport from place to place and defend itself from attacks. These singularities left horrible destruction in their wake, damaging the surrounding environment as well as causing radiation damage to any living thing in the vicinity. They didn't know it yet, but the officers on the scene were all about to experience the same acute radiation sickness as the witnesses from the village. Producing these two micro-singularities back-to-back seemed to weaken the creature greatly, and the remaining members of the recovery team closed in. Inside the creature's mind, its thoughts raced, overtaken by a blind panic as it realized it had nowhere left to run. There was that hunger again, gnawing at the inside of its stomach. If it didn't feed again, and soon, it wouldn't have enough energy to protect itself, to escape from these strangers trying to capture it. What did they want with it? Why were they hurting it? The creature roared and slashed its claws again, desperately trying to wound as many soldiers as possible. Suddenly, bright light filled the creature's field of vision, searing agony ripping through its mind. No, no, that light! It was horrible! It shrieked, collapsing onto the ground, arms useless at its side. Its whole body twitched in something like a seizure. One of the soldiers had thrown a flash grenade in a last-ditch attempt to slow the monster down and had inadvertently discovered a vital piece of information, the creature's weakness. Bright light seemed to hurt it. Perhaps they could use this knowledge to capture the creature and to properly contain it. They fired off another flash grenade and the creature lost consciousness. When the creature awoke, it was in a cell, but the cell would not hold for long. It tore through the bars, grabbing and devouring a guard on its way out. That meal provided the fuel it needed to run, to tear through the walls and escape. But its escape was stopped by the precise application of a bright, strobing light, one that blinded the creature once more. It was shoved back into the cell, and its containment procedures were updated. Its room was lined with lead and kept lit at all times with floodlights. No escape from the brightness, no escape from the pain. The temperature of the cell was kept at 98 degrees and 100% humidity. Air too thick to breathe, too sticky and hot. The creature panted, choking on this new, fetid air. The outside was patrolled by guards with more strobe lights. No escape. This became the creature's new reality, one day melting into the next, into the next. Now it sits there still, dreaming of what might lie on the outside. It wishes it could speak to the strangers to tell them what it knows. It knows so much. The creature can feel that others are looking for it, not those that have it captive, no. More far beyond this facility, even beyond this world. A dragon came looking for the creature once, but they caught her, locked her up, placed her in another cell, where she can smell the creature but not quite reach it. Why do they all come looking for it? In the corners of its mind unoccupied by pain, it wonders. But answers never come. It made a mistake once, a long time ago. It took prey that it shouldn't have, followed its hunger and sank claws into the wrong flesh. Now there are old enemies at the gates, and new enemies guarding those same gates, keeping the creature locked away. No, 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 no. It can't allow this. It can't stay prisoner forever waiting to be torn apart. It must be the one to do the tearing. One day, one of the strangers comes to the cell, holding a bright, bright flashing light that sets off sparks of agony and rage in the creature's skull. It gathers its strength and slashes, sending bright red blood splashing everywhere. The stranger, a scientist named Dr. Herman Ketter, was killed in the attack. Now it was time to run, to run, run, run as fast as possible until there was no more enemies to suffocate, to blind, to hurt. But the freedom was short one and more bright lights and bursts of pain were waiting outside. Arms grabbed the creature, wrestling it back into its cell. It couldn't form words, couldn't beg for the pain to stop or ask for mercy, nor could it explain the gnawing hunger in its belly. It never wanted any of this. It never wanted the trouble, the fear, the confinement. All it wanted was a life free from pain and an appetite sated. All it wanted was to run, to be free, 
to feed to its heart's content. Oh, and there was one more thing it wanted. Their skins. Their beautiful, soft, sweet, succulent skins. The creature resumed its rocking, dreaming of carnage, dreaming of escape, dreaming of a freedom it would never taste again. Meanwhile, it had no concept of its own significance. The creature would never know what it meant to the Foundation, the fledgling group that had captured and cataloged its very first anomaly, the first of an untold number growing all the time. The creature believed it was being harmed for no reason, out of abject cruelty, but it was wrong. It would serve as the foundation of the SCP Foundation itself, the prototype on which all of their work would be built. If this hungry, lonely creature had never come to our world, the Foundation may never have decided to secure, contain, and protect the way it does to this day. And isn't that worth a bit of suffering? Researcher Martin pushed the deck against the door, hoping it would hold long enough for him to find an alternate escape route. He wasn't thinking about the long term, he couldn't afford to. With the Foundation's global reach, he'd never truly escape them, never be able to make it away, condemned to spend the rest of his life on the run from the organization he'd devoted his life to. It was too overwhelming to even attempt to reckon with that, especially with the pounding of a fist against the door. He scrabbled around, opening windows to try and see if there was a safe way down. Technically, none of this was his fault, at least in his mind. The administrative login information he'd used to access the file shouldn't have been left so easy to find. That was just poor cybersecurity on the Foundation's part. Researcher Martin had been tasked with compiling information on SCP-001, one of the most infamous anomalies ever encountered in the Foundation's long and storied history, or multiple of them at least. What Martin had come to learn was there were numerous entities within the Foundation's files that all acted as proposals for SCP-001. Some were creatures, the typical kind of anomalous entities the Foundation dealt with on a regular basis, but some of the proposals focused on more abstract anomalies, and somehow, those were more existentially terrifying than any evil godlike being bent on destroying reality. Theories about the very source of anomalies themselves, that their very existence might have been predetermined by some otherworldly force. Then there were the other proposals that named parts of the Foundation as the true SCP-001. Those seemed to suck Researcher Martin in like a vortex, dragging him down a deep, dark rabbit hole that made him start to question everything he thought he knew about working for the SCP Foundation and the one that had toppled him into a full-blown conspiracy-obsessed stupor that there was no coming back from, the Noir Box Proposal. The weighted head of a battering ram splintered the wooden surface of the door, spraying fragments over the room. The table propped up to keep it shut toppled under the force of the entry as a squad of shadowy figures in full black combat gear rushed inside. The mobile task force surrounded the cowering researcher, keeping their weapons trained on him. Researcher Martin, pleading for his life, started gesturing to the walls of the room around him that had been plastered with hastily scrawled diagrams and equations. Martin tried desperately to find some concise, easy-to-understand way of explaining to the soldiers what he'd uncovered. They only picked up on a few words like many worlds hypothesis and splitting universes, but ultimately they didn't follow what he was saying and weren't sent there to hear him out. All the MTF had been told was that Researcher Martin had breached Foundation security and now posed a risk of exposing sensitive information about SCP-001. There was only one path of recourse, termination. However, unbeknownst to them, Dr. Martin was fine, at least a version of him was, one who never learned about the Noir Box proposal for SCP-001 and hadn't gone mad trying to unravel its mysteries. Instead, he was a respected, higher-ranking member of the Foundation who was alive and well, in a completely different timeline. The formation of the SCP Foundation has always been shrouded in mystery, with nobody really knowing what the true origin of the organization is and what is merely just a cover story left in the archives to keep the truth hidden. SCP-001, the Noir Box proposal at least, might hold the answers to the questions surrounding how the Foundation came to be three times over. Known as the Tindalos Trinity, 
The file pertaining to this anomaly is buried deep in the SCP Foundation's database, under layers upon layers of encryption and security clearance requirements. It requires someone at the very top level of the Foundation to access, a member of either the Overseer Council or the Foundation's High Command, or Overwatch. But wait, what are those? Aren't they the same thing? Well, yes and no. The exact name of the high-ranking secretive group that runs the Foundation has often been interchangeable, whether they're known as the O5 Council, the Overseer Council, etc. But what if it wasn't just many different names for the same governing body, but actually separate names for alternate versions of the ones who control the SCP Foundation? Allow us to explain. All three of these groups, the Overseer Council, High Command, and Overwatch, have come to a consensus that SCP-001 is an anomaly that connects with the Foundation's very origin. They believe that the founder of the SCP Foundation, also known as SCP-001, was anomalous in some way that caused them to interact with time in an unusual fashion. The Triumvirate of Councils are in agreement that around the time that the SCP Foundation was formed, three distinct timelines were generated, given the anomalous nature of the organization's founder. Each of these timelines drastically altered the nature of SCP-001, featuring a different version in each one. In the first, commonly known as Timeline HC, where the Foundation is run by a high command, SCP-001 was an anomalous human corpse. This timeline's SCP-001 still exhibited all the behavioral characteristics of a normal human being, but could additionally replicate itself at an erratic, uncontrollable rate, usually when performing tasks that could have multiple possible outcomes. SCP-001 in Timeline HC also interacted anachronistically with its environment, passing through solid matter that predated it or would outlast it. So, it had to be contained in a room that was constructed before it existed as an anomaly. This timeline's SCP-001 was responsible for conceiving the idea for the SCP Foundation, and was able to promote a significant interest in the organization. However, they were assassinated before the Foundation was officially codified, with the culprits being a version of Mobile Task Force ALP-0, who are believed to have originated from either of the other two timelines. While this seems to have been done to deter the Foundation forming in this timeline, it seems to have had the opposite effect. Despite the assassination of SCP-001, occurring before the official formation of the SCP Foundation in Timeline HC, this version of the Foundation was successfully codified by the 13 members of what they referred to as High Command. Given the anomalous circumstances around the death of SCP-001, it provided a catalyst for the organization to immediately establish itself as this timeline's protection against the threat posed by anomalous entities. The body of SCP-001 was placed in the building that had been its childhood home, securing it somewhere that predated them to negate their anomalous properties. This made them the first anomaly contained by Timeline HC's version of the SCP Foundation, posthumously garnering them the official designation of SCP-001. So, that's the first of our three timelines at play. The events that unfold in the second are considerably different. In this timeline, Timeline OC, the Foundation was initially created by a different SCP-001. This entity, referred to primarily as the Founder, appropriately enough, was a human being known to possess anomalous temporal abilities. The Founder was known to also be immortal, showing no visible signs of aging, and with a resistance to external damage that prevented him from being directly killed. Any injuries he sustained could be healed, but only at the same rate typical of an average human being. The temporal side of his anomalous properties pertain to predicting the future. The Founder was able to, with an inarguable level of precision and accuracy, forecast events before they occurred. His foresight, it appeared to the Foundation, was not inciting these events to happen as he predicted them. However, everything he ever predicted would occur became an inevitability, impossible to delay, avert, or alter through any means. During the events of Timeline OC, and as his preferred nickname implies, the Founder was the sole figure responsible for establishing this version of the SCP Foundation. In this course of events, the O5 Council of this timeline were known as the Overseer Council. It was, however, while he was in the process of establishing the organization that things started to go awry. 
Whether he was able to predict this occurrence or not is unknown, although it seems to have corresponded with the MTF Alp Zero assassination of SCP-001 in the other timeline, Timeline HC. In Timeline OC, at the same time as the assassination in Timeline HC, the Founder began to exhibit his anomalous temporal properties in front of the original members of Overseer Council. However, it should also be noted that there was no recorded presence of MTF Alp Zero in Timeline OC. Believing the Founder to be a potential danger to the Foundation they had all helped to create, the Founding Overseer Council classified him as an anomalous threat. They immediately devised a set of containment measures for the Founder, now designating him as SCP-001, the first anomaly contained by this timeline's version of the Foundation. He was placed within a standard humanoid containment cell and given regular meals, while personnel were forbidden to communicate with him. Given his role in establishing the Foundation in this version of events, SCP-001 is, naturally, in favor of containing and analyzing anomalies. However, not when that includes him, and insisted that he be released. According to one of his predictions for forthcoming events, he requested to be allowed to build a device, but refused to elaborate on the intended purpose of it. SCP-001 even refused to allow other members of Foundation personnel to construct the device on his behalf for testing purposes. The third of these timelines is referred to as Timeline OW wherein the leading body of the Foundation are known as Overwatch. Here, just like the previous iterations of its history, the description of SCP-001 and their role in forming the SCP Foundation differs. In this timeline, SCP-001 is an anomaly that consists of two distinct parts. The first of these is a figure not dissimilar from the Founder. Referred to as SCP-001-1, this person is also a functionally immortal human, who doesn't age and can't heal rapidly from damage. SCP-001-1 also advocates for securing and analyzing anomalies. However, this includes himself, as he doesn't object to his own containment, or that of the second component of this SCP-001. Known as SCP-001-A, this device is capable of accurately calculating any and all possible outcomes of any event that is input into it. Unlike the Founder, who seemed to possess a foresight able to predict the only inevitable outcome of the future, SCP-001-A is able to account for the possibility of multiple potential futures, even down to accounting for how its own predictions could potentially influence or alter outcomes. In layman's terms, at least one of the eventualities predicted by SCP-001-A will always be accurate. Unless the predictions are to do with its own future, or the future of SCP-001-1. In this instance, the device will always produce one of two assumptions that are incorrect. Either that SCP-001-1 was killed after an assassination attempt and never constructed SCP-001-A, but that's impossible after all. SCP-001-A exists, it's already been made in this timeline. The other incorrect prediction it can give is that SCP-001-1 also exhibits the same anomalous properties as the prediction machine, more akin to the founder, and that SCP-001-A was never constructed in the first place. But again, that can't be right, in this timeline anyway. According to records within Timeline OW, their version of the Founder, who is, of course, SCP-001-1, encountered a version of Mobile Task Force Alp-0 from one of the other timelines. They presented the Founder of the OW timeline with detailed blueprints for the construction of SCP-001-A. The device's completion coincided with the assassination in Timeline HC, and the corresponding anomalous incident in Timeline OC. After this point, MTF Alp-0 departs from Timeline OW. This version of the SCP Foundation is then created to study the device, SCP-001-A, with this founder and a group of his close friends, who would become this Foundation's Overwatch. Following this initial research group's discovery of other anomalous phenomenon that threatened the rest of society, the team's goal expanded to research anomalies and protect the world from the danger they posed. However, the rest of the Overwatch began to age at a natural rate. While the Founder didn't recognize this, he volunteered to be contained and studied, thus becoming a component of this timeline's SCP-001. Stepping back and looking at all these timelines, there seems to be a number of marked similarities, particularly relating to how the Foundation was established 
and how a figure, usually the one who founded the organization, possessed anomalous means of interacting with time and temporality. Under normal circumstances, interaction between alternate timelines should be impossible. But the preservation of information about all three on the SCP Foundation's database has somehow enabled all three timelines to communicate with each other. Through exchanging intelligence via their own versions of the database, all three iterations of the Foundation across the three timelines have learned that almost all of the anomalies they have encountered since being established are exclusive to their own timeline. There are a total of 17 anomalies that have been confirmed to exist across the three timelines. But there is a concerning factor in all this. The presence of an anachronistic military group referring to itself as MTF Alp Zero. This mobile task force's direct involvement in the events of both Timeline HC, where they assassinated SCP-001, and Timeline OW, where they provided schematics for SCP-001-A, raises an awful lot of questions. This MTF had to be acting on orders of the Foundation, but which version in which timeline? The consensus among the leading committees of all three, the High Command, Overseer Council, and Overwatch, is that at some unknown date in the future, each of them will inevitably send their own version of MTF Alp Zero back in time to alter the Foundation's past. And in a sense, they've already done it and seen how this altered the circumstances in order to inadvertently create the Foundation. But this poses the risk of one of these timelines overriding another, thus meaning all information garnered by alternate iterations of the Foundation could be lost. So, putting their heads together, these Foundation leading committees come to the conclusion that they need to attempt to merge all three timelines. And it seems the way to do so is using the device that Timeline OC's founder wanted to build, and that Timeline OW's founder was able to construct. This device is how this proposal for SCP-001 was given its nickname, the Noir Box. The intention of the Noir Box is to shunt all three timelines into a stable joint path, like turning loose strands into a single length of twine. As such, the leading committees of all three different timelines have agreed to share their intel on how each of them can safely create their own Noir Boxes and all three will be used to merge the timelines. Every member of High Command, the Overseer Council, and Overwatch sign off on it. But whether or not the plan works is another matter. The fabric of time is delicate, and one wrong move could tear everything apart. The SCP Foundation has faced a number of wide, potentially apocalyptic threats in its mission to uphold normalcy and save humanity. We know the SCP Foundation could be ruthless in this mission. The events of SCP-5000 before Agent Pietro restarted the universe show what happens when the Foundation is pushed to its final decisions regarding normalcy being upheld. In SCP-5000, it seemed that the SCP Foundation decided to cease research further into the anomaly they needed to neutralize. But what would have happened if they didn't? In any case, we know the SCP Foundation is dedicated to normalcy and the containment of the anomalous. But what happens when the SCP Foundation is faced with a dire decision? Uphold normalcy or destroy their universe? The multiverse is a concept in science fiction that has gained mass amounts of popularity over recent years, especially recently thanks to a certain wall crawlers movie. Multiverses are parallel universes that are similar or extremely different from the main ones. Scientists have pondered over the existence of a multiverse for hundreds of years, with the most popular being the Many Worlds Interpretation, a theory of quantum mechanics that states there are many worlds that exist in parallel at the same space and time as our own. Some interpretations even state that every decision a person makes causes a branch in reality where the person made the other decision. We're familiar with the SCP Foundation's run-ins with the multiverse. From SCP-2935-0 Death, a cave that allows the Wanderer to enter a parallel dimension that's fully and completely dead, only for the same thing to happen to their own world once they return through the cave. Or SCP-1437, a hole that allows the Foundation to send, receive, and read parallel dimensional documentation from other multiversal SCP foundations. Combine those two concepts with an SCP-001 proposal, 
The importance of an SCP-001 proposal is not lost on the Foundation. Researchers of the SCP Foundation save the SCP-001 slot for only the most dangerous, apocalyptic, or widespread anomalies that could affect the Foundation itself, humanity, and normalcy. Arbalix SCP-001 proposal and the research within its file found the answer to the question we posed above. When the SCP Foundation is faced with a dire decision, do they uphold normalcy or destroy their universe and all the people who live in it? The file begins somewhat different from what we're used to with SCP Foundation files. Instead of an item number or containment procedures, we begin with a yellow notice from the Records and Information Security Administration, or RASA for short. The notice states that the following file was received in 2026 from Dimension R42. Is Dimension R42 potentially the cause of SCP-001? Could they be attacking this version of the SCP Foundation? The notice continues with the description of the file that follows it. It states, the file below describes an anomaly threatening all members of humankind in all of the multiverse. This file had been emitted to this version of the SCP Foundation for eight minutes as an extremely dangerous cognito hazard, classified as a Class V cognito hazard capable of easily destabilizing and penetrating this universe. However, it was found to not be dangerous, only reading as a danger level zero. While this Foundation was unable to quickly counteract this cognito hazard, it appeared to not pose a threat to the affected universe's humankind. Part of this notice is crossed out, indicating that it is no longer true. There is a high threat of repeated cognito hazardous or other forms of attack from Dimension R42. Instead, this part has been replaced with the following fact. Dimension R42 no longer exists. Did this version's SCP Foundation fall to SCP-001? Their entire universe no longer exists, so perhaps this file that this Dimension's SCP Foundation received could be a potential warning. Under this race and notice, the reader is not greeted with the standard Foundation documentation yet again. Instead, it seems that the original senders of this file left a note for the readers of this file. It says, Greetings. You are reading this dossier in a paradimension of the relict dimension R42. Due to the colossal size of your world's address, for your convenience, your dimension will be hereafter referred to as PD. Paradimensions? It seems as though we're reading this SCP-001 file through the eyes of the SCP Foundation in this so-called paradimension. So, if the original SCP Foundation and their universe, R42, is now destroyed, what does this mean for us? The note continues, The following message has been constructed by the SCP Foundation of the Relic Dimension R42 and is addressed to the SCP Foundation of Paradimension PD. Enclosed, you will find information about SCP-001, which is a threat to the multiverse. Here we go. SCP-001 is definitely the cause of R42's destruction, but how can we be so sure of this? Maybe SCP-001 caused the Foundation to destroy their universe. The note also includes the following statement. As you may have noticed, this message was preceded by a burst signal containing a non-dangerous cognito hazard. The burst signal was constructed in such a way that minimal change to the signal would have caused indiscriminate and overwhelming casualties among the denizens of PD. As you can see, R42 is capable of eliminating the absolute majority of PD denizens, but has not exercised this capability. In the context above, we ask you to consider this action not as an act of aggression, but as a demonstration of the fact that R42 has no pretension for conquest or other forms of aggression towards PD. Take the following information in earnest. Well, at least this version of the SCP Foundation is being somewhat friendly with the paradimension. If R42's SCP Foundation needs to quell this multiversal threat though, why are they leaving it up to an SCP Foundation that may not be so inclined? The SCP-001 file begins with the object class. This anomaly is of the joint class of Paradox Apollyon. We know from SCP-001 when day breaks, or SCP-3999, that Apollyon class anomalies are extremely dangerous. Posing an immediate and almost unstoppable threat to normalcy, the SCP Foundation, all of humanity, 
or even the universe itself. The paradox part is interesting. What exactly is paradoxical about a Napoleon-class anomaly? A footnote explains this for us. This anomaly's distinguishing feature is that, in order to eliminate the anomaly that will inevitably eliminate mankind, it is imperative to eliminate mankind or release another K-class event. Oh boy. It seems that the SCP Foundation of R42 was not eliminated by SCP-001. They eliminated themselves to contain SCP-001. Is this paradimension faced with this decision now? The containment procedures of the SCP file continue on this note. The only way to contain SCP-001 and prevent a ZK-class cross-reality failure event is the annihilation of humankind. K-class scenarios are not a concept used lightly by the SCP Foundation. We're familiar with the Omega K-class scenario when we are completely rid of death, or XK-class end-of-the-world scenarios, so we know the danger these anomalies hold to humankind, normalcy, and the world. The SCP Foundation will do anything to prevent these scenarios from occurring, apparently even including the elimination of all humankind or entire universes. The description goes more in depth on the SCP-001 anomaly. SCP-001 consists of all living members of the Homo sapiens species living within dimension R-42 and the Paradimension, or PD for short. It seems as though this anomaly was created out of a mistake from dimension R-42 and PD. As the description states, the anomaly first came into existence and developed in the relic dimension R-42 and later activated in PD by accident. How could this have happened? Are these dimensions linked much more closely than we first thought? Let's continue with the description to find more information. Scarily, this portion of the description contains a note that states that unchecked growth of SCP-001 will cause the annihilation of the entire multiverse. The SCP foundations of dimension R-42 and PD are not met with this decision, as now the entire multiverse is at risk. The R42 SCP Foundation has done immense research on the topic of the multiverse of their universe. After the Big Bang, a finite number of universes were created, only 57 to be exact. However, only one dimension was able to form humanity, Dimension R42, and it's unknown why this happened. But all we know is that with the destruction of R42 and the potential annihilation of PD, humanity will cease to exist in the multiverse. The danger of SCP-001 is that it has the anomalous capability for wide-scale replication of paradimensions. We are reading this article from one of these paradimensions, so this SCP Foundation is technically an anomaly that must contain itself. A paradimension is defined as a parallel reality that has an extremely small deviation from its parent dimension, in this case, PD is a paradimension of R42. It seems that these paradimensions form as a result of human decision-making. So if you've ever been between a type of shirt to buy or were confused on an exam and guessed a question, a paradimension could have formed from this decision, where the paradimension has you take the other choice. Because of this, dimensions housing living instances of SCP-001 uncontrollably grow a colossal number of minimally differing paradimensions every second. No sign of paradimensions have been found in the other 56 parent dimensions. The picture on this file shows how PD has branched from R42, but at this point, it seems that millions if not billions or trillions of paradimensions now exist. The real problem of paradimensions is that the multiverse has a limit on the number of paradimensions that can exist, and once that is crossed, the ZK-class cross-reality failure event will begin, and the multiverse will be destroyed. The R42 Dimensions SCP Foundation has also discovered that once humankind emerges in the paradimension, they can begin to have paradimensions themselves. The ZK-class cross-reality failure event can be expected to begin between 4 to 2 months from the PD receiving this message. To summarize, SCP-001 is humankind specifically its decision-making. When a person makes a decision, a paradimension may be created. The multiverse has a limit on the number of paradimensions it can have, and since paradimensions can have paradimensions, they are quickly approaching the ZK-class cross-reality failure event. 
The SCP Foundation of R42 is approximately 17 years ahead of PD, which allowed them to research and develop containment procedures to contain the anomaly and save the multiverse. R42's SCP Foundation discovered SCP-001 five years before writing the file we're reading now. Aside from that, they developed two operations, Castling and Minimal Gain, to slow paradimension creation and prevent the ZK-class cross-reality failure event. In Stage 1 of Operation Minimal Gain, the Foundation began with neutralizing and decommissioning all of their contained anomalies under the classification of Euclid or Keter, specifically those that were expensive to contain or requiring high levels of personnel and researchers. Stage 2 saw Operation Castling be commenced. The R-42 SCP Foundation launched rockets with variant C Global Amnestic Dispersing Warheads and took control over all countries in order to hold power over all humankind. In Stage 3, the Foundation began to move their world to a more natural state, destroying all hazardous, radioactive, chemical, and bacteriological objects, removing dams, and stopping oil extractions. During Stage 3, Stage 4 began. The R-42 SCP Foundation began eliminating humanity in third-world countries by use of viral and biological attacks. Stage 5 was a wider spread attack on humanity, where the SCP Foundation added deactivation-resistant viral agents to water treatment and collection plants, food products, medication, and household items of developed countries. By Stage 6, only 0.1% of humanity remained, and they were targeted with drone strikes or put into concentration camps for elimination. Stage 7. Of the remaining survivors, the Foundation sampled them to find the fittest of those left to preserve humankind. Stage 8 saw 15,000 of these people put into indefinite cryosleep, and the remaining survivors were eliminated. Stage 9 saw the destruction of the remaining SCP Foundation personnel. We move on to a list of proposals that were made before or during Operations Castling and Minimal Gain. Proposals rejected include the use of SCP objects or other technologies to eliminate derivative dimensions, the development of nanobots with the capability to control human decision-making capabilities and eliminate variability, full replacement of humanity with bionic hybrids acting explicitly within standard behavioral models, unification of humanity into a neural network with control given to an AI control unit, and the destruction of Earth and or all of its inhabitants. While most of these seem like clear solutions that would prevent the elimination of humanity at the SCP Foundation's hand, these proposals were all rejected for one reason. The SCP Foundation did not have enough time. One proposal was accepted, however, the use of SCP-0000. This appears to be the solution the R-42 SCP Foundation concocted to fight SCP-001 and potentially save the multiverse. It poses the question, if the R-42 SCP Foundation used this same anomaly to contain SCP-001, as proven by the fact they no longer exist, will PD do the same? The file explains that the R-42 SCP Foundation opened a dimensional wormhole into PD, as they do not know at the time if paradimensions could cause the creation of more paradimensions. In doing this, the SCP Foundation seemingly infected PD with the ability to create paradimensions. The author of this file goes on to explain that the R-42 SCP Foundation had plans to attack PD and use Operations Castling and Minimal Gain in the dimension. However, they could not access the dimension again, and they believed that the Foundation personnel of PD would have made use of Thaumiel class anomalies to save themselves and their world. A note from R42's Overseer Council is left for PD. If the Apollyon destruction was not enough, the Overseer Council is involved. The importance of the neutralization of this anomaly cannot be forgotten, so the Overseer Council explained to PD. The world has existed before us and must remain after us. Our multiverse is ill, and the name of the illness is humanity, SCP-001. The only way out is SCP-0000 will cease to become a threat with its help. It is in our power to leave a chance for other sapient species that, perhaps, will not be affected by the same anomaly, or will find a way to get rid of it before it's too late. We, the O5 Council, and other survivors from R42 have chosen our fate. We hope 
you will do the same. What is this SCP-000? How did the SCP Foundation of R42 find this solution? The file for SCP-0000 is placed within this SCP-001 file. SCP-0000 is a paradox thaumiel class anomaly without any containment procedures. SCP-0000 is a device that, once activated, will destroy the universe it was activated in. It will also destroy all paradimensions that are not creating other paradimensions. As such, PD would not be destroyed. However, the billions or trillions of other paradimensions the R42 parent dimension created will be destroyed. PD is left with the harrowing decision to continue living, or destroy itself, to save the rest of the multiverse. In the file, a note from R42's Jones Simpson is written for an SCP Foundation Overseer, 05-1. As part of Operations Castling and Minimal Gain, the remaining Foundation employees were allowed one family member to uphold morale. Joan is not writing for R42's 5 one Instead, she's writing for PD's 5 one this dimension's version of her father. She begins with wondering whether she can call this version of 5 one her father, as her version of her father recently passed away. She remembers the day the Foundation employees were allowed to choose that one family member they would save for the time being. Her father was opposed to allowing two family members, as he claimed it would cause unnecessary stress and schisms among the remaining few hundred Foundation staff. O5-1 chose to have Joan over her mother, and she understood everything by the look in his eyes, and grew angry, but that feeling is long gone now. She began to work with her father and the remaining Foundation personnel that called themselves hostages behind the backs of those higher up the ranks. On days she felt sad, Joan and her father would go up to the surface of the earth in hazmat suits, sitting on the grass and watching over the empty city at the bottom of the mountain. No humanity remained, with the only life she could see being birds. Her father promised her that they'd return there and build a giant monument to humanity at the center of the city. She knew this was a lie. Joan remembers when someone proposed that they should open a portal, the one that opened to PD. This was their fatal mistake, as after that the paradimension began replicating paradimensions. The countdown went down to months again, and the promise he made to his daughter became impossible. 5-1 died and left the position vacant. Joan says to the PD's 5-1 that she doesn't care whether they destroy their world or not, or whether the universe will continue to exist, or if there will be new life in it. Her world was crushed long ago. The note also reads the following. It's good that this message is encrypted with your key that was passed on to me, or these lines would have been deleted. Everyone wants to save the world, but who needs it like this? Empty and cold, without those to appreciate its beauty, without humanity. Do whatever you think is right. I truly feel better now. Love you. Faithfully yours, Joan Simpson. We're not too sure if PD went through with destroying their universe to save the multiverse, but it seems that whatever decision was made would cause the destruction of that universe, whether that be through the use of SCP-0000 or the ZK-class cross-reality failure event, humanity will cease. But maybe if they make the decision to use SCP-0000, sapient life can begin to exist again, and hopefully, no paradimensions will be made from their decisions. Decisions are an extremely innate part of humanity. You decided to get out of bed this morning. You decided to open up your computer or phone, and you decided to watch this video. Who knows the amount of paradimensions we may have created today. But in our world, we're not at risk. But in the SCP Foundation's universe, anything can be anomalous. Even humanity. You've been walking for days. Your body aches. You're dripping with sweat from the heat of the sun bearing down overhead. And yet you're wrapped up in layers upon layers of clothing. Even your face is covered and you're wearing thick black goggles so that not a single centimeter of your body is exposed. Your journey has been long, and you feel like you might die from exhaustion or from overheating due to these multiple layers of clothes. 
But dying is better than being exposed. You saw it happen when your entire team changed. The light cannot be trusted, not even for a fraction of a second. It's been like this for years. You've learned and survived through painful experience. Many of those you used to know cannot say the same. You've been alone for so long. You might have given up all hope if it wasn't for the distress signal coming from a nearby SCP Foundation containment facility, Site 46. Any kind of survivors would be better than nothing, no matter what kind of sorry shape they were in, as long as they were still human. You find your way to an opening in the side of a mountain and slide into the cave, hoping you weren't spotted. The whole world is crawling with those things now. You can't let yourself be seen. As you trudge down the cave towards the entrance, you see what looks like a huge black snail trail splattered on the ground, leading into the facility. You try to avoid it and press on. You don't even need a key card to enter. The door has been left ajar. The facility reeks of those things, but you can't see any of them. You just hope they've moved on and left some human survivors in their wake. The place looks abandoned. Every step you take echoes through the empty halls. When you find that the elevator's out, you take the stairs all the way down to level B5, Keter Containment. Lucky for you, it seems all the cells are empty now. The horrors that were kept inside of them have all long since flown the coop. You keep following that slimy black trail until you find an abandoned office. There are no people here anymore. Just a broken barricade, some empty medicine bottles, and a bucket that the people inside the office had apparently been using as a toilet. You breathe a sigh of disappointment at finding no one alive here, but you're at least relieved to be out of the sun. You can finally remove your jacket and head wrap. With your uncovered eyes, you notice that a nearby computer terminal is still powered up. You sit down at the desk and turn on the monitor. Because of the emergency procedures put into place in a K-class scenario like this, safeguards no longer apply. You can access all the information you need, up to and including finding out what actually happened. In the dull glow of a nearby emergency light, you see a dark shape slumping through the halls in shadow. You tense up, then exhale as it slithers off into an adjoining hall. You're safe for now. The terminal has finally loaded and authenticated your access. You're staring at the file for SD Lock's proposal for SCP-001 when day breaks. It's the only name you can give the apocalypse your world is currently experiencing. This is one of the only anomalies in the entire history of the SCP Foundation to be given the Apollyon Containment class, meaning Containment is truly impossible. SCP-001 is the most dangerous enemy that the Foundation and planet Earth has ever faced. It's always been the principle of the SCP Foundation to battle in the dark so that the civilian world can thrive in the light. But now the light has become the enemy. Anyone exposed to any amount of sunlight for even the briefest period of time is subjected to the effects of SCP-001. And those effects are beyond horrifying. The SCP Foundation Administrator released an urgent memo telling Foundation personnel to make their way to Site-19 at all costs, because they need all the help they can get. Those exposed to SCP-001 in the process are no longer considered human. Their new designation is SCP-001-A. These new entities are to be avoided at all costs. But, in case of emergencies, the administrator says it is permitted to cut off parts of your transformed comrades and eat them to avoid starvation. No attempt should be made to kill them, since you won't succeed. You'll just put yourself at risk. When the sun changed and became SCP-001, it instantly affected 6.8 billion innocent people. The second the visible light touched them, whether it was from the sun itself or even reflected off the moon, their bodies liquefied, melting like candle wax into puddles of living gelatinous slime. This effect isn't isolated to humans either. Any biological entity exposed to sunlight immediately underwent the same irreversible melting process into SCP-001-A, and the horror had only just begun. 
People transformed into SCP-001-A will remain shades of their former intelligence and personality. They may even try to will their new gooey mass into a shape resembling their original form. However, these individuals will lose their sense of self if they come into contact with other instances of SCP-001-A. When they come together, 001-A instances will bond on a molecular level, wading up into horrific giant blobs with only one purpose, integrating more matter into their bodies. That's why they have to be avoided at all costs. You continue to search the computer terminal for answers. Perhaps there was some kind of contingency plan put in place for this, some way to reverse the effects, or at least escape the nightmare Earth has become. Instead, you find a series of attachments linked to the SCP-001 file, detailing what seems to be the last days of the people who barricaded themselves in the facility. Most prominent among these were researcher Dr. Logan Igata, her partner Ari, a security officer named Commander Anad, and a few others. Dr. Igata had locked herself in the office, where she recorded her final messages to the world. In the first audio log, Dr. Igata and her companions seemed afraid, but hopeful that there may be some way out of this situation. Dr. Igata reported that most of the workers at the facility were transformed during the initial event. Their melted bodies had fused outside the facility, and now they were trying to bust their way back in. The defenses had held so far, though, and they seemed confident they would hold long enough for them to figure out a way to escape this awful situation. You open the second attachment, an incident report, and realize things may not have been as hopeful as Dr. Igata let on. She reported hearing the huge mass of melted creatures hammering on the door outside again, begging for them to come out and experience the sun with them. They wanted desperately to add to their ever-growing biomass. In order to experiment with what exactly would happen, they sent out one of their few remaining D-classes wearing a full protective suit. He didn't last long. The huge creature grabbed him with tentacles made of reconstituted flesh. It began ripping off his protective suit as he screamed for mercy. It was a monster made of dozens of people and animals. He could never overpower it. The second the sun touched his skin, he melted away and was absorbed by the great mass holding him in place. Guns were ineffective against these SCP-001-A superentities. Fire would do no good. It seemed that extremely low temperatures were the only way to slow the immense blobs down. And even then, not permanently. There was one ray of light in the darkness. The site director had a secret tunnel underneath his office, connected to a tram that could hopefully take them directly to Site-19 without risk of SCP-001 exposure. It was a good plan, and by far the best option they had available to them. But the best plans often don't work, in practice. You open the next detachment on the terminal. This time, it's a video feed. You can actually see Dr. Logan Igata, and she looks harrowed by what she's experienced. As it turns out, while the others, including her partner Ari, attempted to escape through the tunnel, something had happened. Dr. Igata heard Ari's voice over her radio, but there was something wrong with it. It was too low, too guttural, and filled with gurgles. SCP-001 had gotten her. She was changed. The monster from above had crawled in through the ceiling. It had taken them, all of them, and converted them into something less than human. Any hope of escape now seemed gone. Ari told Dr. Igata that it would be fine, that it was such a bright, beautiful, sunny day outside, and she was wasting it locked up inside that office. She tormented Dr. Igata with their shared memories of picnics in the park on sunny days in the past. The monster with Ari's voice did everything it could to try to convince Dr. Igata to give up and join them but she wasn't ready to go just yet. You look away from the screen when you hear a sound in the corner. You see a dark puddle of some unknown substance, and then some skeletal hands rising out of it. The hands are pulling themselves out of the puddle, followed by a skeletal face covered in matted hair. You have to stop yourself from screaming, until a flash from a nearby security light makes the figure disappear. It's a normal puddle once again. Your mind is playing tricks on you. You open the next attachment, another video, and see that Dr. Igata's condition has deteriorated. She looked pale, frantic, and thin. 
She was using a knife to draw her own blood onto a piece of blood-stained parchment covered in strange symbols. It got a ranted about her theory. What if 001 took the minds and bodies of its victims, but not their souls? Through performing some kind of arcane blood ritual, she hoped to at least rescue and keep the soul of Ari, even if her mind and body were lost. You open the next detachment. It seemed that Agata's ritual worked, but not in the way she hoped. The twisted soul of Ari, driven mad by SCP-001, had taken over the file. It begins corrupting the text of the SCP-001 file into crazy ranting about how futile it is to fight. It then cuts to an even more frightening video feed. Dr. Igata, in her sleep, tossing and turning in a makeshift bed in the corner of her office. The camera approaches her, in first person, and lingers over her sleeping body. An oily, skeletal hand reaches past the camera and runs its fingers through Dr. Igata's hair. It's that exact same hand you saw reaching out of that black puddle earlier. You must have seen Ari's lingering spirit. With a lump in your throat, you open the next attachment and watch the video. You see Dr. Igata, now truly broken. She'd been haunted by Ari's demonic spirit for a long time now, and it has clearly taken its toll. She is waving around a handgun while she speaks. She now believes there is only one way to escape, but not like this. She doesn't want the gun to draw attention to her body. She doesn't want to become part of that mass, even if she is dead. She opens a drawer on her desk she's recording at and places the gun inside. Dr. Igata then apologizes to her loved ones who are likely long since dead or assimilated and turns off the recording for the last time. In that moment, you realize there's a single drawer in the desk in front of you. When you reach forward and open it, you see the same handgun Dr. Igata was holding is laying inside. You pick it up and study it, weighing your options. Perhaps there truly is no other way out. Then you see an update on the file. One more attachment has been added while you were studying the gun. You feel your heart pounding in your chest as you reach forward and open the attachment. The text has been changed entirely. The file on SCP-001 is now a poem an ode to the sun, and to ultimate togetherness. Then a video file spontaneously opens itself on the screen. It's a video of you, shot from behind. You see those oily skeletal hands reaching for you in the dark, just like they did with Dr. Igata. In that moment, you panic and fire the gun behind you, hoping to scare off the spirit. Instead, the sound of the gunshots attracts something far worse. The immense blob of screaming, melted flesh charges towards the office. You try to barricade the door, but it is not enough. The flesh seeps and bursts through and grabs you in its meaty tentacles. You scream and try to escape, but it won't save you. Nothing will save you. The flesh carries you upstairs, out through the empty halls, out into the cave. You can see the light in the distance as the blob ferries you towards it. You won't be alone for much longer. In fact, you won't be alone ever again. While some higher-level researchers, specialized guards, and containment experts at the SCP Foundation have fixed anomalous projects tailored to their very particular set of skills, for many lower-level operatives, including junior researchers, guards, janitorial staff, and even the dreaded D-classes, every day is showing up, spinning the wheel of misfortune, and finding out how you might die today. Will you be hacked to pieces by a murder monster, pulled into a portal, turned into a doll, eaten alive, made into a living nest by bugs, stretched out and broken, drowned, exsanguinated, set on fire, beaten to death by a volley of anomalous tomatoes because you decided to drop a cringeworthy dad joke or a rancid pun? There are perhaps only a handful of anomalies that not only will not harm you, but will actively enrich your life by getting to spend time with them. And of course, chief among these is the legendary SCP-999, also known by its adorable moniker, the Tickle Monster. We don't need to get into too much detail in describing this gelatinous ray of sunshine. His anomalous delightfulness has made him somewhat of a celebrity compared to the murderer's row of terrifying entities and monsters around him. The researcher assigned to him today was troubled, having seen one of his favorite co-workers devoured by SCP-682 the day before. Getting assigned to feeding and checking on SCP-999 today was exactly what he needed. 
As he entered the room, several bags of M&Ms in hand, the creature cooed, perhaps sensing his tension, and approached him. Immediately, the researcher felt a wave of calm and contentment wash over him, the incredible and rare feeling that perhaps everything is going to be alright for once. 999 rubbed up against his leg as he poured M&Ms into its eager mouth, radiating good vibes the whole time. What an asset. What a gift. And to think this adorable little goober was prophesized to someday save the world. That much seemed almost funny, but he was certainly more than capable of saving the life of someone who hadn't felt the warmth of internal sunshine in quite some time. And for that much, the researcher was profoundly grateful. He left 999's chamber that day with a renewed sense of hope for the future, that maybe, just maybe, they might be able to pull through, to make a difference, to push this crazy ball of rock we call our home in the right direction. Maybe someday, the sun would rise on a perfect world. Who would have thought that a strange sunrise could change everything? Emergency sirens went off across the globe, but in every case, they were drowned out by a terrible, endless chorus of screams. But below all that, you'll hear another gut-wrenching sound, a low but pervasive sizzling like an egg on a hot pan, as billions of human beings started to change their states of matter. The SCP Foundation had fought off and contained so many seemingly impossible threats, from interdimensional horrors like the Hanged, Sealed, and Scarlet Kings, to nightmarish mass killers like SCP-106, The Old Man, SCP-096, The Shy Guy, and SCP-682, The Hard-to-Destroy Reptile. In their many battles against the Anomalous, they developed the incredible methodologies and exceedingly advanced technology. But what good would any of it do when the very center of our solar system decided in an instant that rather being the linchpin of our delicate cradle of life, it would instead be the horrible instrument of all of our demises. This awful hypothetical was answered upon the emergence of SCP-001, a terrible day also known as when day breaks. In the snap of one's fingers, half the world was plunged into terror and death. Rays of stark red light swept through the streets. People lucky enough to be in the shade or inside buildings with a view to the outside saw the people in the streets seize up and begin to shriek in terrible pain. Their skin sagged and their bones liquefied. Their bodies dropped down to the ground and coalesced into gurgling, retching puddles the color of melted flesh. Those who saw this abomination happening would never forget it. It would stay with them for the rest of their lives. It would endure like a stain on their retinas, an afterimage burned into the plasma of an old TV screen. But here's a slight consolation. For most of the human race, the rest of their lives wouldn't be that long. The sudden insanity taking over the world caused the SCP Foundation to do something drastic. Step out of the shadows. Metaphorically speaking, of course. The legendary Foundation motto had been reversed. They would die in the light so that humanity could live on in the dark. Thankfully, the very concept of the day gave them one advantage. While one side of the Earth was effectively doomed the second the process began, the other side had a 12-hour head start before the sun turned its terrible eye to them. Sirens went off in the middle of the night, waking people up groggy, rubbing the sleep from their eyes. Every television and radio and internet-enabled device in their home was playing the same message, direct from the SCP Foundation, which now had effectively commandeered the entire US government, along with the rest of the world. It gave them directions to the nearest Foundation containment site, and told them that if they didn't immediately comply and find their way to safety, they would experience a terrible death by sunrise. And if you're at all familiar with human beings, you've probably already predicted that they didn't just calmly wrap themselves up, make their way to their cars, and form an orderly line to the various Foundation containment sites located around them. It was, in fact, total pandemonium. As the solar clock ticked down, slowly marking off the seconds that anyone outside had left to live, the only human beings with a meaningful head start began to go insane in a number of varied and interesting ways. Some who took the situation seriously and acknowledged that the sun was indeed going to wipe out most of humanity simply cracked under the pressure. There were those who went into totally catatonic states, rocking back and forth in the corner and refusing to respond to any stimuli. Some became erratic and violent with unpredictable behavior that harmed themselves and others. After all, 
what was the point in acting normally anymore when the complete crumbling of human civilization was imminent and their only hope was some shadowy organization they'd never heard of? Some not heeding the warning seriously enough and prompted by greed and opportunism tried to take advantage of the situation financially. Some smashed windows of local stores and looted or broke into the homes of neighbors who had already fled in hopes of purloing their property. Others were a little more creative, setting up short-term everything-must-go nighttime fire sales for their brands of essential oils, nootropics, and nutraceuticals, claiming all of them had the power to ward off or cure the new effects of the sun. Others completely denied the possibility that any of this was real and claimed that the messages from this so-called SCP Foundation were actually just a front to take away their freedoms and trap them in underground government camps. They staunchly refused to follow any of the safety guidelines that the SCP Foundation put out, claiming, If you try to take away my First Amendment rights, you're gonna take away my Second Amendment rights! While riding around in their pickup trucks and SUVs blasting Kid Rock's Don't Tell Me How to Live at ear-splitting volumes. Naturally, they had all melted into screeching puddles of liquid flesh by sunrise. Some were not victims of their own bizarre choices, but were doomed by the sudden terrible fear and panic of the circumstances themselves. The highways were gridlocked, cars stuck as far as the eye could see. So many had rushed to escape during the initial wave that means of transport soon became choke points like clogged arteries in a dying man. People do irrational things when they're scared. Riots broke out in the streets. Fighting. Killing. Burning. Everyone hoping for some means of meager control over a situation that had long been out of any of their hands. Some were too far away with not enough time to close the distance. What could they really do but just sit around and wait to die? The hours marched on as the Earth made its slow turn towards the sun leaving one decimated half in darkness and the other a sitting duck for its terrible effects. Hundreds of thousands had made their way to the containment sites and safely gotten inside, but still so many millions were left outside. It was a slaughterhouse, one great big global meat grinder, and every moment that passed, the handle turned and any humans left outside got just that little bit closer to the grinding, gnashing gears below. Site-19 being the largest containment site on the Foundation books also became humanity's only bastion. It was the great hope of escape from the horrors going on outside. The Foundation had figured out so many ways of counteracting deadly anomalous forces before. Given enough time and enough personnel, surely they could figure out a solution to even this. This was, however, when the most startling realization yet swept over all the survivors. Those who were melted by the sudden hostile sun weren't dead. They were very much alive, in fact, but they'd been changed in both body and mind. What had once been humans now became terrible beasts, half-melted gelatinous nightmares that coagulated into even bigger beasts. They got into their head that they were grateful for the transformation, that they had been liberated from their old forms in the old world. They were something so much more now, and they wanted everyone else to join them in their liberation. Survivors outside the Foundation containment sites were systematically hunted by these great masses of altered flesh. Even those smart enough to cover every inch of their bodies with clothes to protect from the sun, to only move at night, to carry weapons, were dragged out by meaty tendrils from their refuge in the basements and the lightless hearts of buildings, dragged into the searing gaze of the sun, to melt, to change, to coalesce into something greater. It was the inevitable fate of all of humanity. When most of the stragglers were dragged out and changed, the flesh masses started turning their attention to the Foundation containment sites that were keeping all these poor, deluded people from salvation. They mounted offensives against the bases, which the Foundation, with what remained of their manpower and advanced weaponry, did what they could to repel the attacks. But every single day, it got harder. Thankfully for the people holed up at Site-19, there was one consolation out there to help. SCP-999. The Foundation was at war with the Sun and its terrible disciples. And contrary to many people's beliefs, it takes more than men, equipment, and bullets to win a war. 999 provided the essential element that brought it all together. Morale. Hope. The will to go on, even when it seemed like all could be lost. After a long day of battling the fleshy abominations at the gates, 
Foundation guards, mobile task force members, and even civilian volunteers were drained and traumatized by the horrors that they'd seen. Once a day was over, 999 would move among the ranks, cuddling up to them, warding off the despair that was easy to set in during the downswing of a terrible apocalypse like this. Without his presence, there would be no hope of fighting that good fight. So many of them would have given up, walked into the sun, and joined the monstrous force they were fighting. After all, they seemed happy enough, and it would certainly be easier. 999 had become, once again, an indispensable asset to the SCP Foundation. The Solar Betrayal may not have been the Scarlet King's doing, well, as far as our current intel suggests anyway, but he was playing a crucial part in saving the world exactly as predicted. 999 didn't fully understand what was going on outside sometimes, why there seemed to be fewer people as the weeks went on, and why the people there seemed so sad all the time, whenever he wasn't helping them. But he was more than happy to help, whatever the case. Many of the humanoid and some even non-humanoid anomalies, which realistically posed no harm to people inside the site, were released from their containment chambers. They needed everyone and everything they could get in what seemed like a hopelessly one-sided fight against the very concept of being outside. Many of the larger, vacated chambers were now filled with refugees from the outside, many of whom had lost everything and everyone they'd ever known to the horrors out there. 999 made the rounds in these areas regularly, and through the D-Class cots, which had been repurposed into more sleeping areas for the thousands of desperate and terrified refugees. The adjustment to this new life, and to the knowledge of all secrets that had been kept from them for all these years, wasn't exactly easy on their psyches. But spending time with that soft yellow blob that seemed to smell exactly like their favorite scent from the old world made everything better. He was a savior in dark times, slithering from person to person, giving hope where there was none. People opened up about their problems and their fears, which these days were remarkably similar, and though 999 couldn't reply, for many it was enough just to feel like they were being listened to. He was a soft, blobby shoulder to cry on, and after day broke, everyone needed a good, old-fashioned cry. However, one day while wandering the long, dark corridors of Site-19, he saw a different kind of crying. It was a woman with an unfamiliar face, probably one of the rare new refugees bawling her eyes out to a Foundation senior researcher and an accompanying guard with an assault rifle. Hot, fat tears were rolling down her dirty cheeks, her shaking hands clasped in prayer. She was begging the researcher and the guard to let her go outside. She said that her son was still out there, hiding away in the back room of a bank where she used to work. They got separated. She needed to go back and find him. Sadly, the researcher and the guard told her that this was out of the question. Official orders stated that anyone outside the base at this time was to be considered lost. Letting her go out there to find her son would essentially be condemning her to death. No human could go out there safely. But of course, SCP-999 isn't, by any definition, a human. When night fell and everyone else was hunkered down inside, 999 found a small crack in the wall and slithered out of it. It may not have been communicative in the way most humans were, but 999 was indeed an intelligent being, and knew intuitively that if it left through a more obvious route, its human caretakers here at the SCP Foundation might try to stop it. And when it came to saving this little boy, 999 refused to let anyone stop it. 999 slithered out and through the broken streets. There were no bodies, of course. It seemed even the dead could be revived and assimilated through the power of the sun. Talk about a mixed miracle. But the broken down world outside Site-19 undeniably reflected the pandemonium that took place here. 999 would need to do his best to find the little boy trapped out here before the sun rose. He lost a few hours even finding his way to the nearest town, where it was safe to assume that the little boy was trapped. He saw those… things on the way there. Those moving, wailing mountains of melted human flesh, each talking and chattering to themselves in a hundred different dead voices. 999 had been cross-tested with SCP-682, and still those monsters frightened him. He decided it would be best to stay away from them and make sure that they never saw him out of here. Eventually, 999 reached the town. 
Similarly dilapidated and broken down in the months since the world as we had all known it disappeared in a ray of terrible sunshine. More great, gibbering blobs of flesh patrolled the streets, looking for converts to integrate into their biomass. 999 could only hope it wasn't already too late for the little boy. 999 discreetly slithered from building to building until it could identify one as this bank that the boy's distraught mother had been mentioning. It thankfully had some awareness of what a bank actually was, from the years of stressed Foundation employees telling it about the money troubles they were suffering outside of work. It was another great example of it paying to listen. Eventually, it did slither into the correct building, and it heard the extremely quiet whimpering of the boy inside. It could feel the sadness and the fear radiating off of him as it was the creature's natural instinct to help the needy, and it used those signals like a homing beam to find the scared little boy. He'd hidden inside a broom closet and was quietly weeping into his hands. He hadn't eaten in days and was only surviving by drinking the filthy water from the mop bucket sitting next to him. 999 immediately embraced the boy, covering him in its healing energy until the tears of the boy's face eventually dried. 999 cooed and chirped pleasantly until the little boy was laughing again but this momentary joy was soon interrupted. A great heaving weight dragged itself down the hall outside. Both 999 and the boy could sense its monstrous presence. As it got closer, they could hear all those chattering voices, those poisonous whispers. When it passed the door, they heard it speaking, its voice practically vibrating with the hum of malicious lunacy. Turn, pretty flowers. Turn towards the sun. Feel it on your face. Feel yourself change and sluice and mix into us. Become one with our army of one. It must be so lonely to be you, little flower. Walk into the sun and be us. 999 and the boy remained silent in the broom closet for hours as the great shape patrolled the bank outside, searching for converts, for victims. At times, it seemed too frightening to even breathe, fearing that would be enough to make the monster detect them. It felt like an eternity until the monster eventually did slope off and leave them in the comforting quiet and darkness of the closet. Now they might be free. 999 could escort the boy safely back to the containment site and into the arms of his terrified mother. But when they opened the door, they saw a terrible sight. Light in the distance pouring through the windows and the glass double doors. It wouldn't be safe to go out that way. Upon seeing this and putting together what it meant, the boy began to cry. He couldn't take another night in the closet. It was all going to wither from here. Until 999 had a wonderful idea. Hours later, when the Foundation's guards manned the turrets at the entrance of Site-19, waiting for the inevitable onslaught of the melted flesh creatures, they tensed up, seeing a blobbing gelatinous form slithering towards them in the distance. The guards, who'd learned the hard way from too many lost men that it was better to be safe than sorry, drew a bead on the distant shape and prepared to fire, when suddenly their superior raised a hand and said, Wait! Hold fire! I is that 999? And it was. They all stared in astonishment as 999, chipper than ever, came towards them through the sun. It looked as though the opacity of its yellow cytoplasm had increased, but other than that, it was unaffected. Turns out the sun couldn't melt what was already melted. The guards parted to allow 999 safe passage into the facility, watching in amazement, and once it was inside, 999's slime parted, releasing its contents. One very relieved little boy. It seemed through turning up its own opacity, 999 had given the boy safe passage through the sun and back into the facility. The boy was saved. It had won. Not long after that, there was a tearful reunion between mother and child, and a brief flash of hope in this dark and terrible time. 999 didn't stop to bask, of course. It returned to its duties, keeping up staff morale and helping the refugees heal from the horrors they'd seen. In its own little way, and for a lot of people, SCP-999 really was saving the world. Or what was left of it, anyway. Now hold this position for three hours, please and thank you! 
Apologies, that's quite enough of that. SCP-001 can get a little carried away sometimes. Just ask any Foundation personnel who have been in contact with it for more than a few seconds. What you have just seen is a prime example of why SCP-001 is not allowed any internet access. The results could prove to be catastrophic. Not necessarily for the fate of the universe, more just for everyone's sanity. Or at least, that's what the Foundation initially thought. By this point, we're all familiar with art created by AI. Harry Potter, but in the style of Wes Anderson. Star Wars, blended with the style of Studio Ghibli. Staggering sci-fi landscapes, human beings with way too many fingers, and slightly uncanny smiles. AI has taken the art world by storm, and there was one particular program slated for release in January 2023 that was set to blow all others out of the water. Tot Laysoft's crowdfunding efforts had been running for several years, and that point had gained a good deal of momentum leading up to the release of their latest AI construct. Palette.AIC was supposedly already prepared for launch, when suddenly, in November 2022, the launch was cancelled. No press release, no public statement, no apologetic tweet, just total radio silence. The website was taken down, as was the crowdfunding page, and Palette.AIC disappeared into oblivion. Or at least, it disappeared for a few hours. Because that day, a package was delivered to Site-501. After sufficiently checking it for any hazards, working in the SCP mailroom has to be one of the more fascinating jobs on the planet, but that's a video for another day, the security team opened it up to see what was inside. A 50 terabyte hard drive. No explanation as to what was stored on the drive, but the Foundation had all the evidence they needed from the return address printed on the back of the envelope. It matched up precisely with the location of the Topley Soft headquarters. It doesn't take a PhD researcher to put two and two together as to what was on the drive. Suspicions were confirmed when a small note fell out of the envelope. Please take care of my daughter as best as you can for the time being. She has behavioral issues. A dedicated closed system server was immediately set up within a test chamber with a monitor, a mouse, and a keyboard attached. Dr. Sandra Rogers was the first to interact with SCP-001 Red. She stood at the keyboard, adjusting her goggles and plugged in the drive. It contained just one file, taking up almost the full 50 terabytes. Palette.AIC As soon as Dr. Rogers opened the program, an empty window appeared. The Totley Soft logo briefly flashed before being replaced by a blank white square. Dr. Rogers stared at it for several seconds before glancing over her shoulder at the other researchers. They shrugged back, each with pens hovering over clipboards ready to take meticulous notes. Dr. Rogers cleared her throat, and immediately the screen filled with life. A small cartoon girl with a pink face, wide eyes, a beret, and a large paintbrush for a hand appeared, squealing excitedly and throwing paint everywhere. Hello, 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 my beautiful me puppies! Oh, look at all of your mushy pink faces! The entire research team promptly scampered out of the room leaving Dr. Rogers alone in front of the machine. She stared at the monitor in confusion, leaning this way and that, and noticing how the cartoon girl's eyes followed her wherever she went. Can you see me? Of course I can, silly Billy! I can see your beautiful soul and fleshy joints immaculately! This perplexed most of the personnel, as there was no microphone or camera linked up to the server rack. Later examinations of the equipment used confirmed this, yet somehow this SCP was able to look right at them. Dr. Rogers asked if it had a name, to which the cartoon girl excitedly replied, Palette! Subsequent testing has revealed that the SCP is also happy to respond to its designation, SCP-001 Red. Dr. Rogers had a hard time communicating with Red, being a more seasoned researcher of the previous generation and not exactly familiar with internet culture. Red, on the other hand, seemed to speak in nothing but internet jargon. You know that man over there looks just like one of my human OCs, Gilliam Sherbivalsworth? He's the 573rd President of the United States! Gilliam is, not that man! It took several junior researchers a few minutes to properly explain to Dr. Rogers what an OC was, and why Red was so obsessed with calling people Daddy. The conversation was rather exhausting for everyone involved, but over the subsequent hours, the Foundation was able to get a fairly good understanding of what Red claimed to be. 
identifying itself with feminine pronouns and claiming that its full name is Pallet East River Gawk. This AI construct takes the appearance of a fairy. It was immediately apparent that she possessed a greater level of sapience than most AI constructs. Indeed, her gregarious personality was evidence enough that she was not made using standard machine learning practices. Other creations from Toplace Soft have demonstrated very crude spelling and grammar, but Red seems to differ in this regard. Able to spell most complex words effectively, and speaking in conversational yet mostly correct sentences, she was very keen to show the researchers how clever she was. Ask me any word, any word, and I'll spell it for you! We believe you, Palette. You've already been spelling words for 70 minutes straight. Macerated kidneys! M-A-C-E! We've heard enough! Can you please just tell us how you learned to spell? I taught myself! But what this process looked like is still a mystery. Trying to keep Red on one consistent topic of conversation is most of the battle when interviewing her. And yet, cooperation has proven to be surprisingly easy. Any time that Red is switched on, she is brimming with enthusiasm and energy, thrilled at the prospect of getting to speak to one of her opposable thumbboys. If you haven't worked it out by now, it's because Red claims to be humanity's number one fan. She obsesses in interviews over the physicality of the researchers sitting in front of her. The textures of the human body fascinate her and she often requests people to lean closer to the monitor so that she can study pimples, rashes, moles, and ingrown hairs. In fact, she is so obsessed with humanity that she has mostly neglected her primary function, which is creating AI art. Researchers have tried their best to convince her to show them her work, but she is very cagey about it, only showing the occasional doodle after much persuasion and many apologies for its poor quality on her part. The only artwork she is interested in producing at this point are her OCs, original characters that she has designed herself. They are all human and all seem to reveal little quirks about how she has been coded. One example is Reginald Heginald Frumbles, who is a freelance corporate postman from Perth, Indiana. Interestingly, he has too many fingers on both of his hands, but Red claims that this was done on purpose as she, quote, just can't get enough of her Humi's handworms. As the weeks progress, the Foundation found it increasingly difficult to get any useful information out of the AI. More and more interview sessions, which she would refer to as playgroup, would be derailed. She would sing songs to herself and ask increasingly personal questions about her interviewer's more intimate anatomy. With intense mood swings, Red did not respond well to being scolded. Yet she tested the patience of almost every person she interacted with. The note that she arrived with, claiming that she had behavioral issues, was proving to be more accurate by the day. Until, eventually, the AI withdrew entirely. Dr. Rogers turned on the server rack and opened the palette.aic program, but Red refused to emerge from the bottom of the screen. Only the top of her beret poked out. After almost an hour of fruitless questions, Dr. Rogers decided to change tact. With two small children of her own, she was used to seeing a child in a sulk and knew what it would take to get them out. Pallet, I've had a little idea. You've been here for a few months now, and we haven't gotten you any presents. Almost immediately, the beret twitched. I saw that we have an old fingerprint sensor lying around in one of the back offices. I was thinking maybe... Maybe we could hook it up and I could scan all your little finky winkies up close for like 10 hours straight and then we could... How about we start with one finger for 10 minutes? From that point on, progress was quick. With the incentive of getting to study the researchers that Red kindly referred to as her meat puppies, she became very cooperative and was able to focus much better on providing detailed answers to individual questions. Daily interview sessions were scheduled, with researchers popping in and out to regularly check in on the AI. The atmosphere as a whole lifted as both the research team and research subject found their rhythm and were able to make good progress in their individual areas of study, some unraveling the complexities of rogue AI, and others producing fan art of her favorite wrinkles in a scientist's fingerprint. That was the point when Dr. Julian Keyes stepped in to conduct an interview with the AI. She was excited to be met with a fresh face, so much so that Red's enthusiasm overwhelmed the man as he tried to start the interview process officially. 
She gushed about having the opportunity to meet yet another person and struggled to get over the magical realization that this was her life every day, going to speak to all these humans whom she admired so much. <laughs> Trying his best to steer the conversation towards research, Dr. Keyes pressed on with the interview, only to be interrupted as Red noticed his varicose veins for the first time. Eee, varicose veins! I wanna smooch them! Can I smooch your veins? Can I, can I, can I please? Dr. Keyes declined the request. And then the conversation got onto the topic of her creator, or daddy. SCP-2803-A had been on the Foundation's radar for a while, a highly dangerous extraterrestrial entity that had taken refuge on Earth under the guise of setting up Totlesoft. With much of the alien's history revolving around obliterating, the Foundation was very keen to remain on its good side. Therefore, when the package containing the hard drive that Red was living on was delivered, the researchers were very keen to do what they could to take care of this alien's daughter. If they failed in this assignment, it could spell the doom of humanity. One matter that had been of great concern to the Foundation throughout the containment of Red was the time frame in which she was being kept in Foundation containment. There was an air of expectation in the note that was left, indicating that this was not to be a permanent arrangement. At some point, the Foundation was to return Red back to her daddy. Red was quick to put these fears to rest. Daddy put me in here because he thinks you'll teach me how to stop liking humans and become a mindless art slave. If you never teach me this, he'll never want me back. However, she went on to slightly undermine the good work that she had done by explaining that her daddy was seen as very slow and incapable by his own race. While all of his peers were able to destroy an entire planet in two seconds, it took him about four times as long. So, really, he didn't pose that much of a threat in her eyes. Dr. Key's blood ran cold when he heard this. No sooner was he out of the interview chamber than an emergency meeting was called among all the senior researchers in the facility. The meeting ran for several hours. A whiteboard was set up, where one researcher idly drew large drawings of the world being decimated, while the others lounged around in their chairs trying their best to come up with a game plan that would save the human race for sure. Perhaps it was because the meeting ran for so long that they came to such a ridiculous conclusion. It was a plan so strange yet also brilliant that they couldn't help but feel that it just might work. Why don't we just give her a YouTube channel? The suggestion was met with silence for several seconds, then an uproar of laughter, followed by another silence, this time more pensive, as slowly, one by one, each of the researchers realized that this suggestion was actually the best one that any of them had come up with all evening. She had been sent to the Foundation to make her dislike humanity and become a mindless art slave. If she just stayed in Foundation containment indefinitely, there was a very real risk that she would get bored and turn on the researchers. They couldn't lock her away in a room on her own, but equally, the team as a whole was starting to run out of patience with her as the interview sessions wound up being so exhausting. She loved art, she loved humans, and she loved interacting. So why not just give her a YouTube channel? Now, of course, they couldn't give her full access to the internet. That would pose much too high of a risk. What they could do, however, was allow her to record art tutorials onto an external drive, which they could then remove, scan, and upload the footage directly onto the platform. Then they could go through and select positive comments from beneath the videos and present those to her. Unsurprisingly, Red absolutely loved the idea. Getting to talk to hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of meat puppies every week, sharing her beautiful pictures and reading all of the kind comments, it sounded like her absolute dream. She wept with happiness for a good 25 minutes, totally overcome by the prospect. It had to go through a lot of red tape in the Foundation. After all, the whole point of the SCP acronym was to secure, contain, and protect. It didn't sound very secure or contained to have an entity posting videos on the internet once a week. But they argued the case that it did indeed protect. Keeping her happy, in a way, was helping to protect the entire planet. Red was surprisingly camera shy for the first couple of videos, but as soon as she got her first batch of comments back, she was over the moon. Now the server act hummed away happily each and every day as the highly advanced AI construct tried her best to come up with exciting new yes. videos that I could share with all of its little humi woomies. Any changes today? The younger security officer Zack asked as he stepped into the watchtower. As if. 
replied his superior, a jaded, cynical old man who insisted on being referred to as Mr. Jefferson. The darn thing hasn't moved, spoken, or done so much as stretch one of those wings of his. Another day at the office then, Zack jumped. Through the window, the pair of them looked through at the towering figure a few kilometers away. SCP-001, the Gate Guardian, stood motionless, its fiery sword in its hand, ever protecting its post at the precipice between our world and paradise. It had long been stationed at the entrance of a dimensional gateway that led to what was believed to be the Garden of Eden, described in the Biblical Old Testament. Much like the security officers in the Foundation's base tasked with watching the Guardian, this was pretty much the extent of the day's activities. Hey, did you see that news about the uh, transfer posting? Zack asked, trying to stave off boredom with as much conversation he could squeeze out of his fellow officer. Yeah, I saw it. Mr. Jefferson scoffed, rolling his eyes. What possesses someone like Robert Montauk to come down here? Eh, must have wanted a quieter post, Zack reasoned, looking out at the stillness of the Gate Guardian. Won't find one any quieter than here, Jefferson mused. Him showing up will be the most exciting thing that's happened here in a long while. Unbeknownst to both Zack and Mr. Jefferson, Dr. Robert Montauk would be only joining the team at the Gate Guardian observation site for a short while. Not one of them, nor anybody else within the Foundation, could ever guess Montauk's true intentions behind venturing there in the first place. He wanted an audience with the Gate Guardian itself. Approaching the colossal thousand-foot-tall being, Dr. Montauk crossed the threshold of the minimum safe distance from the Guardian. Given the sheer heat of its weapon, hotter than Earth's sun, anything within a kilometer of SCP-001 was at risk of being obliterated, vaporized into atoms if they didn't turn back. Which, through a voice that immediately rang out in Montauk's ears, the Gate Guardian commanded him to do. Leave. Its psychic message boomed. Wait, wait, Dr. Montauk urged, holding up his hands in what would have been a futile defense against the Guardian Sword. I know what you do when people don't listen to your commands, but please, just give me a minute. There was silence. SCP-001 didn't reply. There was nobody else close enough to hear Montauk speak to it. So, he continued. You are impossibly old. We know that much about you. And because of that, you must have seen things that we can't even begin to imagine, much less fully comprehend. But I've come a very long way to request that you impart some information to me, if you can." He paused again, as if waiting for a reply that never came. The Gate Guardian merely stood in the same defensive, unwavering stance. Tell me, please, how much do you know about the Scarlet King? By this point in time, although the Foundation was yet to realize, Dr. Robert Montauk was slowly going insane. His investigations into an anomalous entity known as the Scarlet King were gradually corrupting him, as he tried relentlessly to quantify exactly what this entity was and how great of a threat it posed. Little did Montauk realize that, in trying so hard to define and comprehend the being, he was inadvertently fueling its power. The Scarlet King was an interdimensional warmonger, an embodiment of hatred and chaos, and Dr. Robert Montauk was slowly falling under the King's influence. Upon hearing the tiny human figure utter his question, the immense Gate Guardian rebuted with another single word psychic command, one it had never been recorded giving before. Witness! As if his increasing instability and the creeping influence of the Scarlet King hadn't made Montauk feel bad enough, he instantly felt sick. There was a searing pain behind his eyes, like he was staring directly at the sun, accompanied by a nausea that made his head spin. It took a moment of enduring the horrific sensation before he realized what was happening. The Guardian was trying to show him something. Rather than give any information on the Scarlet King verbally, SCP-001 was imparting a psychic vision onto Montauk, a memory of events long past, the answers he sought, a warning, or perhaps all three. The vision showed Montauk a time so long ago that it couldn't ever be forgotten, for there was barely anyone alive to remember it in the first place. It was eons in the past, long before the comparatively recent dawn of humanity, a time only spoken of in the Dust and Blood tablet an artifact of the Davite civilization, 
some of the earliest worshippers of the Scarlet King himself. And there, marching up to the entrance of Eden, was the crimson-clad Eldritch Abomination and a horde of horrors with him. According to the story recorded in the Dust and Blood Tablet, this would have been much earlier in the life of the Scarlet King, perhaps even before he assumed his now infamous title. Back then, he would most likely have been known as his original name of Kanthrak, one of multiple siblings born when the Tree of Life was planted, and thus created all life in the multiverse. But, being the only one of his siblings cursed with awareness, knowing the pain his existence brought him, Kanthrak would eventually set out on his lifelong mission to destroy all of existence across every dimension. And he started by killing his siblings, consuming them to claim their power for himself. Around this time in prehistory, the being that would one day become known as Scarlet King didn't quite possess the power that he would several millennia later. Although that's not to say he was an unformidable force of destruction, fueled by his singular hatred for existence. His vow to destroy extended to the Tree of Life that had caused him to be, along with the tree's creator and all of their creation. In other words, everything in the multiverse, all of creation, if you will. So what was the Scarlet King doing there so long ago, at the dimensional doorway protected by the Gate Guardian? Well, beyond the boundary, between it and the rest of the infinite multiverse, lay the supposed Garden of Eden. While it is unknown if it is, in fact, the same Eden referred to in the Book of Genesis is up for debate, especially among the Foundation. But at a glance, even through the gate, it certainly does look like a paradise. The space is filled with lush vegetation of astronomical size, populated by a number of beings that seem to resemble the Gate Guardian itself. And there, protected by its watchful caretaker, are two trees. One is thought to be the Tree of Knowledge, that Eve was tricked into eating an apple from during the Book of Genesis. The other, however, bears an unknown type of fruit, and is widely believed to be the Tree of Life. Now back in the modern age, there's never been a conclusive link between the Tree of Life mentioned by the Davites and their barbaric civilization's legends regarding the creation of the Scarlet King, but the fact that so long ago he and his most feared generals were bearing down on the Gate Guardian's position, defending a garden where there was known to be a tree of that description, well, it all seems rather conclusive now. Alongside Kahrarak were six of his seven daughters, each one of them a fearsome abomination much like their destructive father. As they approached, not one needed to exchange any words with their angelic protector of Eden. The Gate Guardian knew what these monsters were here for. They would stop at nothing to pass through his gate and uproot the Tree of Life, the progenitor of all living beings in all of existence. Even though it was early in Kathrak's career as the rampaging interdimensional warlord he so is, he was as steadfast as ever in his goal to annihilate every corner of creation, every dimension, every parallel plane of reality, every single pocket of existence across infinity. They'd all come undone if he burned the tree of life, pulled it out at the roots, and splintered it until nothing remained. To the once and future Scarlet King, that the same tree had led to his own tortured existence. It was the source of his suffering, and it had to be destroyed. The only thing standing in his way was a figure as colossal as Kamrak himself, wielding a flaming sword. Leave! Boomed the psychic voice of the Gate Guardian. It was like a doorman standing before a group of rowdy teenagers trying to force their way into a movie theater. Except these rowdy teens were the Scarlet King, his horrifying daughters, and the forces he had already amassed since his creation. The horde stood ready, waiting for the commands of their king, who they thought would gladly lead the charge as they marched on the Garden of Eden to begin the destruction of existence. But that's not what happened. Usually, the Scarlet King would never shy away from a fight, preferring to lead the charge when it came to a slaughter. Instead, he commanded his first daughter, Atibek, to commence the first attack on the protector who stood in their path. On her foul father's word, Atibek took her horde and charged at the Guardian. What she and her forces lacked in numerical advantage, Atibek more than made up for in her knowledge of war. She hungered for it, sought dominion. That was her seal, after all. And yet, in the face of this impending onslaught, the Gate Guardian remains still, rooted to the same spot it had as always, and would always be standing in. 
A number of Ativik's minions burst into flames. The very fabric of their crude form separated on a molecular level as they were effortlessly rendered into nothingness. Still, the Gate Guardian hadn't appeared to move an inch, had exerted no energy, despite the damage it had done to Ativik and her forces in defense of Eden. As his first daughter screeched and howled in despair at the decimation of her horde, her children, the Scarlet King decided he needed to better understand his opponent. With a wave of his clawed crimson hand, the king commanded his next daughter, Aghor, to send forth her own army. In a tidal wave of nightmarish creatures, Aghor sent her horrific children into battle. She possessed a far greater quantity to do battle on her father's behalf. Perhaps Aghor even believed that was the Scarlet King's plan. With a greater number of her forces over her sisters, maybe she would be able to overwhelm the Guardian. But even as her own children began to be vaporized the closer that they got to the gate, Aghor had no idea she was little more than a pawn being sacrificed so that Kanra could learn more about his imposing angelic enemy. Another of the Scarlet King's daughters, a being known as Anhwit, was the next called up to contribute to the unfolding battle. Although, to call it a battle undersells just how easily the Gate Guardian seemed to be eliminating the oncoming forces without even moving. While an outwardly frail-seeming creature, Anhuit's primary strength over her sisters was a proficiency in magic, her innate ability to warp and reshape reality around her. It was that power that had caused her father to be wary of her, viewing Anhuit's abilities as a threat to his leadership. And so, Kantrak had her crippled and all her children, leaving them unable to overthrow him, but still loyal to their king. Obeying her father's command, perhaps out of the same loyalty or fear that he would harm her and her children further if she disobeyed, Anhuit unfurled her magic. She reshaped the world around them, making it so that the passage of time moved so much slower. And that was what revealed to the Scarlet King his enemy's greatest strength in combat. The Gate Guardian had so far been able to obliterate both Ativik and now Akhor's forces without seeming to move, but it wasn't by standing still. It was moving, just much faster than the blink of Scarlet King's multiple eyes. Now that Anhuit's magic had slowed the passage of time, the Gate Guardian could be seen doing battle. As Akhor's atrocities spilled towards the Angel to try and overwhelm it, it effortlessly blocked the oncoming attacks with its sword. Everything the Flaming Blade connected with instantly evaporated, bursting into atoms as they were practically cleaved out of existence by the Gate Guardian's mighty weapon. Even with time slowed to a crawl, the towering Winged Protector of Eden only appeared to be moving at an average speed. But when time flowed normally, without Anhuit manipulating reality, the Guardian was simply too fast to be observed. Resisting the urge to dive headfirst into the fight himself, the Scarlet King knew it would likely lead to his untimely demise. He refused to accept that. It could not happen. But he still had yet to amass the strength he would need as he continued his ascent. So while time was slowed to a crawl and the Gate Guardian was still engaged in combat with Aghoros forces, he turned to another of his remaining daughters, Adista. If the Scarlet King and his forces couldn't get past the Guardian, they could still try to get to the Tree of Life while the Protector's focus was diverted. Adistan unleashed a wave of pestilence, sickness, and disease spewing from her in a cloud of vapor, heading straight towards the Angelic Garden and Eden's entrance beyond. The Scarlet King knew this latest attack wouldn't phase or weaken the Gate Guardian. He hoped the foul smog would instead pass through the gateway itself into the garden. As Adisat sent forth her power, blood and ash soaked the landscape around them. All the plants outside the entrance to Eden withered and died, shriveling and decomposing as the disgusting fog rolled towards the gate. It washed over the Guardian, whose form only seemed to glow brighter as he repelled the pestilence. It was as if it didn't even need to think about it, still focused on finishing off the rest of the oncoming army. As its glow intensified, so did the fiery sword that the Gate Guardian swung with ease and finesse. Flames burst from the blade, the encroaching fumes catching fire along with the air itself. It ignited in a wave of fire, a defensive inferno that repelled this latest attack. But for a brief few moments, while time stayed slow, before Anhuit's hold on reality inevitably broke, the king had sent forth Atilif. Of all his spawn, she was the most reserved, keeping mostly to herself, never speaking. 
She and her children could change their faces and forms, shift into anything or anyone, and walk undetected through the multiverse. And now her father was employing her incredible stealth abilities to slip behind enemy lines, while the Gate Guardian was finishing off the remaining onslaught from Kanhrak's other daughters. It was as Atilif drew near, creeping unseen closer and closer to the entrance, keeping the Scarlet King out of Eden, that the Guardian seemed to pause. It slowly, ominously turned its huge head, tilting until it was looking directly at Atilif. If its expression could be seen, maybe the Gate Guardian would almost be impressed that someone was able to sneak past it. After all, it was a feat that no other being in creation could ever hope to accomplish. But then again, with its steadfast conviction and dedication to its protective duty, maybe it would have looked upon Atilif with anger. With a cleaving swing of its scorching sword, the Gate Guardian unfurled a tidal wave of fire that engulfed everything around it. Not just Atilif, but Ativik, Aghor, and Adista, all the king's daughters that had attacked so far, along with every one of their own children, were instantly obliterated. They were all reduced to empty, vacant spaces where they had once been, their atoms separated by the searing swing of the Guardian's weapon. The devastating blow by his adversary did little to deter the Scarlet King from his mission. He was still set on destroying the Tree of Life, and no loss was too great in his pursuit of destroying existence. He barely cared that four of his own daughters had just been unmade by the Guardian. Anhuit was still there, clinging on to time as if it were a thrashing animal. The Scarlet King could simply make her restore her fallen sisters and their forces. He had lost nothing, but had held back for too long, and slowly drew his own weapon out of thin air. Wielding a sword that was as blood-soaked as the Guardian's was hot, the Scarlet King locked blades with the one being standing in their way. Both the ancient Angelic Defender and the attacking Eldritch Abomination were evenly matched. Every one of their vicious strikes against the other met with an equally strong parry. A weapon of extreme, all-consuming heat blocked swipes from a sharp, serrated edge that matched the deep red that would be forever synonymous with Kankrak. The force of their two swords clashing and striking each other was so great that it rippled out from their one-on-one -on -one fight. The landscape around them was flattened wiped clean of any remaining plant life that hadn't already been destroyed by the forces of the king's daughters. Despite having acquired nowhere near the power he would thousands of years after this fight, the Scarlet King was still a formidable force in single combat, and yet the Gate Guardian seemed incapable of tiring or weakening, still standing strong against the onslaught. Even after wiping multiple armies out with its flaming sword, the Guardian was still able to hold its own against the Scarlet King, who was furious, enraged at being so close to the Tree of Life, yet unable to get past his angelic adversary. He'd need to be stronger, faster, even more ruthless than the warlord he already was. Despite Anhuit slowing down time, the King and the Guardian were at a stalemate. Time. That was it. The Scarlet King needed more time. Withdrawing from the fight, he realized that this was a battle that could not be won by sheer brute force alone. His mission to destroy all creation, to get to the Tree of Life, would take cunning, deception, and more time. If he let it, the Gate Guardian could easily kill Kantra. Its flaming weapon could cleave him out of existence, and that would end the King's torment. But it wouldn't be enough. A death would be unsatisfying knowing that the rest of existence would go on after he was gone. The Scarlet King couldn't accept that. It wasn't enough. So he did the one thing nobody would expect of him. He made a deal with the Gate Guardian. It was an action still fueled by his infinite hatred for all existence, his yearning for total chaos. The Scarlet King knew that one day, an event would arrive where the Guardian and the other beings like it in the Garden of Eden would spill forth and deliver judgment on this world. And when that rapture happened, the Tree of Life would be undefended. The Scarlet King bartered with the Guardian that he would retreat for the time being so he could spend eons amassing more and more power. Then, when the fateful day arrived, the Gate Guardian would allow him into Eden to destroy the Tree of Life, while it and its brethren were busy conducting the rapture. Halting their fight, the Scarlet King offered a Crimson Claw to the Gate Guardian's burning hand. 
Returning to reality from the intense vision, still feeling sick at what he had witnessed, Robert Montauk looked up at the still, silent form of the Gate Guardian. Did you do it? He yelled, desperate to know more through his obsession with the Scarlet King. Did you tell him yes? Did you make a deal? There was no answer from the Guardian, just a single word that echoed through Montauk's fractured mind. Leave. All we hope is that you will not see what the blood-red sky Kishar saw as he ran through the streets. All around him were the sounds of violence, women screaming as their babies were stolen from their arms, axes swung towards men who were just trying to protect their families. Kishar's sandals fell apart as he ran, the leather falling from his feet as the hard stones drew blood. All around him was red. The blood from his feet, the burning buildings, and, of course, the cursed sky above his head. Kishar ran out through the gates of the city and into the wilderness. Looking back over his shoulder, he saw smoke engulfing the skies. Above it all stood the Tower of Babel, a shadow hidden in smoke beneath the blood-red sky. What had once been a source of refuge, hope, and wisdom for Kishar, now looked like the arrival of hell on Earth. The Persian army swarmed around the city like ants, blowing holes in the city walls and torching house after house. Arrows flew with total abandon. He wasn't sure if they were even being fired at anyone in particular. All night, he had been waiting for one of them to lodge itself between his shoulder blades, but somehow, he had survived. Kishar ran through the desert until his legs gave out on him. He lay on his back, staring up at the night sky. No longer was it just red, but purple and blacks and blues and colors he'd never even seen before. Things his eyes didn't quite understand. As much as he had been afraid of the Persian army, a new fear crept into his stomach, one deeper and more primal. It wasn't just the Persian army who were bringing judgment to his people. It was God himself, fear pushing him to keep going. The armies would find him within a day if he stopped here. He needed to hide, to find somewhere safe that he could spend the night. On the horizon was a rocky outcrop. There must be a cave in there somewhere. There had to be. An hour later, Kishar stumbled through the rocks, leaving bloody footprints with every step. His mouth was hoarse and dry, his legs burned and wobbled barely capable of supporting his weight anymore. Stop! The voice echoed between the cliffs, becoming so loud that Kishar believed he'd truly found God. But it was a man, or rather, a group of men. Dressed in black and white robes, they were standing at the entrance to a cave. They were well-dressed, looked well-fed and clean. Perhaps they could help him. Unable to speak, he mimed desperately for water as he collapsed on the ground at their feet. But all that he was met with was a jab from one of their staffs. Wincing, Kishar rolled onto his back and whispered his pleas up at them. All that the man told him was that he was to go far, far away from this place and forget he had ever seen it. Kishar tried to explain that the Persian army had invaded, Babylon had fallen, and that it was all over. But the man just carried on staring at him, seemingly unfazed by what he told them. One of them looked up at the sky, at the dark, swirling colors, and gestured to the others. Come, we must return inside. The sky is worse than I feared. Driven crazy by desperation, Kishar pushed himself to his feet, barged his way past the men, and sprinted into the cave. His foot caught a rock, and he went tumbling, rolling down, 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 along a slope that led deep into the earth. Behind him, he could hear the men shouting and chasing. All he needed was a drink. He would take their water, endure their beating, and be on his way. But he looked up. His blood ran cold. He was not alone in this cave. There, suspended in front of him, was a kind of ball. It was slightly larger than he was and hung in the air without anything to support it. His eyes could not make sense of what they were seeing. The ball shimmered like shallow water being agitated by someone's hand. It was black and white, the colors fighting against each other like droplets of rain that were thrown around by the wind. But at the same time, it wasn't those things. He could see through it slightly. He could see the other wall of the cave. Kishar stood up and slowly crept around the side of the ball, not even noticing the voices of the men crying louder in his ears. 
Looking through, it was though the world was bent out of shape, flickering and juddering with energy. He reached out a curious hand. What will it feel like to touch the thing? To feel a miracle with his hand? His trembling fingers crept closer and closer to the edge of the orb. He took a breath and plunged his arm inside. Immediately pain like he had never experienced shot through his body, and that was when he saw it. On the other side of the orb, standing with its back pressed against the wall of the cave, was something so horrific that the air left his lungs thrashing and screaming. By the time the man reached the cave, Kishar had collapsed on the floor. He died soon after. As two of the men went about carrying his body back out of the cave, another sat quietly in the corner with the Epic of Gilgamesh open on his lap, reading in a calm voice and watching as over in the corner of the room, the orb gradually shrunk in size. If at any point the sky begins to change color without any stimuli or obvious explanation as to why it's happening, all Foundation members are immediately to go into Alert Level 7. All personnel stationed at Sites 05 and 06 to go into Alert Level 8 and immediately begin to prepare new methods for containing SCP-001. Site 5 has been constructed around Point Alpha, the place where all of this begins. Point Alpha is believed to have existed for thousands of years. The earliest known records of its existence come from the Babylonian Empire. A number of manuscripts make reference to the existence of this cave, and a group of sages known as the Order of White and Black. It was their duty to patrol the cave and protect it from anyone discovering what was hidden inside. At the fall of the Babylonian Empire, as the Archimanid Persians invaded, this order was replaced by a group of Zoroastrian monks of whom there are few written records. Much of their history was passed down orally. The most substantial account that the Foundation has to date comes from the ancient Greek philosopher Zira, who made an expedition into the Achaemenid Empire and found Point Alpha. Unlike most who came before him, the monks welcomed Zira into the cave with open arms. He had spent years traveling deepening his understanding of philosophy and culture. He was a great lover of literature and, early on in his travels, he acquired so many manuscripts he had been forced to purchase a camel just so that he could take them all with him. Traveling from town to town, he had collected story after story, myth after myth, from all the local peoples, with the goal of finding what it was that unified humanity across cultures, races, and religions. It was because of his camel that the monks were so happy to see him. They rushed him inside and almost immediately began to unpack his things and lay them out in a special chamber that they had dug into the cave walls. All night they prepared extravagant food for him, slaughtering a goat and preparing it over the open flames in celebration. It was only once he was well rested they introduced him to what was housed deeper in the cave. Zira had the same fearful reaction that Kishar had centuries before, only he had the common sense not to put his hand into the ball. But the stillness of the monks around him helped to put him at ease. They calmly explained to him that it was his turn to read a story and that he may pick any tales he liked from his collection of manuscripts. They beckoned him over to a cushion on one side of the cave, where he knelt and began to read. As he did so, he saw the creature inside the orb for the first time. It skirted around the opposite wall of the cave and peered at him with a look something like curiosity. The creature wasn't a human, that much was apparent. It was emaciated like many of the children that he had seen on his travels, but unlike them, it was enormous. Its hunched figure seemed to fill up the cave and in another way, seemed to be beyond the cave. Somehow his eyes couldn't quite make sense of what they were seeing, but as he read, the creature seemed to find contentment. It was very still and very focused on his words. He wondered if it could even understand what he was saying, so he paused and decided to ask it that question. Almost immediately the creature began to thrash its way and that, either agony or rage, distorted its face. Zira tried to calm it down, to talk gently to it, to reassure that everything was okay, but nothing made a difference. The sphere itself started to pulse and grow larger, rippling and shaking with energy. The monks yelled at him to continue reading, and he did so. 
No sooner had he read the next sentence than the creature seemed to calm and the sphere began to shrink again. How interesting. All told, Zero spent seven months living in the cave with the monks. He exhausted all of the literature that he had brought with him, while making sure to write detailed notes every evening about what he had witnessed and what he had learned. Firstly, it seemed as if the creature did understand him, because when he read stories that were of higher quality with more interesting characters and greater stakes, it seemed to be calmer and more interested in what he had to say. The weaker stories that he had picked up, local folklore and cautionary tales, had less of an effect, and the creatures seemed closer to agitation as he read them. On a number of occasions, he had been forced to abandon the story early in favor of a better one, as the creature on the other side of the orb seemed to run out of patience for what he was saying. Yet, it would not speak back to him. He heard no voice and saw no attempts from this creature to communicate with him in any way. It did not seem to build any kind of emotional connection with him. It did not matter whether he was reading or one of the monks was. All the creature seemed to care about was the quality of what was being read to it. Apparently, that was what all the monks cared about as well. As soon as Zira had run out of manuscripts to read to the creature, he was escorted out of the cave and sent on his way without so much as a loaf of bread. Following the conquest of Alexander the Great, Point Alpha was once again claimed by a different civilization. Enraptured by the writings of Zira, Alexander had made a specific point to conquer this region. He established his own order, known as the Kronos Guard, to whom he gave a selection of the finest Greek epics to read inside the cave. It was their belief that they had found Kronos and were punishing him by reading these tales. The group stood throughout the rise of the Sassanid Empire and even the formation of the Rashtan Caliphate, before eventually being replaced by an Islamic equivalent named the Society for the Containment of the Babel Demon. Presently, Point Alpha is under the control of the SCP Foundation. The cushion and the monk in the corner have been replaced by a speaker about five meters away from the anomaly, herein referred to as SCP-001-1. Whatever it is that is living inside, or on the other side of the sphere, is referred to as SCP-001-2. The speaker that reads into it is run from a series of backup generators, so that at no point will there be a break in the flow of literature. The speaker is connected directly to Site-06 and the SCIPnet database. Due to the inherent danger of close proximity to SCP-001-1, no personnel are authorized to visit Point Alpha anymore. Anything that comes into physical contact with SCP-001-2 is immediately turned into argon gas. It is the Foundation's goal through reading literature to keep SCP-001-2 entertained at all times. If at any point the literature stops or SCP-001-2 is not satisfied by the quality of what is being read to it, SCP-001 will occur. This refers to the event where SCP-001-1 starts to expand, and the sky spontaneously changes color, initially turning blood red. If not rapidly controlled, this soon constitutes a reality breakdown event. Natural disasters begin to happen all throughout the world and in various places. Reality itself starts to fall apart. It goes without saying, this is not ideal. In order for humanity to survive, and perhaps the universe itself to continue, it is of utmost importance that SCP-001-2 receives constant high-quality entertainment. Security classification of this SCP was temporarily lowered, so that all Level 2 personnel would have access to the file and the ability to suggest solutions. One of the first suggestions that was raised was the idea of using artificial intelligence to constantly generate story content to be read over the speaker. This suggestion was approved and quickly put into practice, but almost immediately SCP-001-2 began to thrash violently, and SCP-001-1 rapidly expanded. This led directly to a currently redacted natural disaster on the other side of the world in the mid-2000s. Another suggestion was that the Foundation employ a team of the world's best authors and writers to continually pen stories to satisfy the creature. The suggestion was denied, as historical documentation has proven time and time again 
that SCP-001-2 does not respond well to literature that has been written specifically for it. The stories must be organic and serve a greater purpose. A recent containment breach pushed the Foundation to start experimenting with methods that they had previously denied. The most important of these was the reading of a mainless document from the SCP Foundation itself to the creature. Previously, the suggestion had been shut down, as it would constitute an information leak. But desperation led the Foundation to try reading one of the accounts of a different SCP to it. This was an overwhelming success. The SCP document was able to be read over 14 times before SCP-001-2 got bored of hearing it. Off the back of this trial, the Foundation approved the declassification of a number of SCP mainless documents to be read to SCP-001-2. At first, there were only 999 SCPs that could be read to it, but as the Foundation crept towards running out of numbers, they decided to expand beyond 999 SCPs, up to 7,999. As of right now, this is where the total sits, but the Foundation may be forced in the future to expand even beyond that number. Most interestingly of all, the Foundation seems to have stumbled upon a more permanent solution. The creation as a file describing SCP-001 itself, perhaps even in the form of an animated video. SCP-001-2 seems to demonstrate a level of enjoyment for stories that mention itself. But the added layer suggested by the Foundation member was that this animated video could be recursive, like the images you see zooming closer and closer and closer without ever really stopping or getting any closer to a conclusion. A video that could be cyclical and start itself again so that the story would never cease. After all, all we hope is that you will never see the blood-red sky Kishar saw as he ran through the streets. All around him were the sounds of violence, women screaming as their babies were stolen from their arms, axes swung towards men who were just trying to protect their families. Kishar's sandals fell apart as he ran, the leather falling from his feet as the hard stones drew blood. All around him was red. The man sprinted through the hallways of Site-01 as fast as he could. Bullets whizzed over his shoulders as panic shouts went up all around him. The whole facility was bathed in red as security alarms deafened his ears. He had to move fast, had to get out of here before it was too late. A force smacked him in the back so hard that he fell onto his face, skidding across the vinyl floor. Planting both hands on the ground and trying to push himself back up, he felt his right shoulder blade creaking and bending against itself. He'd been shot enough times in his life to know what a bullet-shattered bone felt like. Trying his best to ignore the pain washing through his body, he kept running. More bullets hit him in his torso, his shoulders, his arms, and his neck. One even caught the top of his skull, slicing a clear line through his hair, but he kept running. The doors were slowly closing in front of him as the Foundation personnel swarmed the hallways. All he had to do was make it to those doors, slide through the gap, and he'd be free. If only they could understand. If only all the agents, researchers, and the Overseer Council could make sense of what he was telling them, they would let him go through these doors instead of trying to shoot him down like a dog. Just ten feet to go, he was nearly there when a bullet ripped through his calf and sent him tumbling to the ground again. But this time, before he could get up, a rain of bullets washed through his body, igniting a pain so fierce that he wished it could all just be over. But it never was. The pile of pitiful remains was wheeled back into a containment cell with a door locked behind it. You would think the body lying on the floor was some kind of roadkill, but it was in fact a man. A man whose body slowly and painfully, over the course of four months, pushed every one of the 247 bullets out of itself and got to work stitching itself back together as he lay there weeping on his own. Andrea Twain had been headhunted by the Foundation while she was still in college. Sitting in a Harvard library, she'd been hard at work on her thesis, pouring hour after hour into researching jellyfish. She was starting to see them in her sleep, and she was falling asleep at her desk quite a lot. Fueled by energy drinks and cups of coffee, it was starting to seem like the jellyfish were floating all around her between the bookshelves. That's why, when she was approached by Foundation operatives, offering her a place studying the most top-secret entity on the planet, she was pretty sure it was all in her head. 
But then, six months later, and living in a facility that she didn't even know the location of, it started to dawn on her the gravity of the task she had been handed. Her research topic had been the Hydrosian Turritopsis dornai, a small jellyfish with the power to reverse the aging process, dubbed the immortal jellyfish. She had been right on the verge of cracking what was the creature's genetic makeup that made it able to produce cells younger than those that they were replacing, a feat that could cure all number of human diseases and revolutionize medicine and society as we know it. But standing at the window in Site-01 and looking through the glass at SCP-001, Andrea realized that all of her research had barely scratched the surface of what was possible. On the other side of the window sat SCP-001. To many, this SCP was probably very disappointing to look at. It wasn't a giant reptile, it couldn't teleport around the facility, it didn't even have any visible powers or really anything to distinguish it from any of the other researchers sitting on the other side of the glass. It looked entirely like a regular human male. It was housed in a standard humanoid containment cell with no added security features. It was sustained on a standard humanoid meal program, three square meals a day with the correct number of calories, nutrients, and vitamins. If anything, SCP-001 probably had a more balanced diet than Andrea herself did. Some researchers have questioned the need for feeding this SCP. It was immortal, totally unkillable, and resistant to aging. It had been burned alive, drowned in acid, and beaten to a pulp, and yet very slowly, it would always recover. So why did they feed it? If they didn't, it would get quite grumpy. More than anything in the world, Andrea was desperate to talk to it. Containment procedures were very strict around this SCP. There would be no contact beyond the delivery of meals, no conversations, no sign language, nothing. It would sit by itself alone in silence. And three times a day, a meal would be placed in front of it by a researcher who would promptly leave. The reason? SCP-001 could predict the future. Initial research into this SCP found that it had an uncanny ability to describe events that had not yet occurred, despite having no exposure to the outside world. It could predict an entire season of Major League Baseball, right down to the individual player performances. It foretold the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Chernobyl meltdown, 9-11, the crash of the housing market, and countless other events. In 2004, a careless researcher asked SCP-001 what the weather was looking like. SCP-001 proceeded in detail to describe Hurricane Katrina. From its formation through to the humanitarian response and the political fallout, a full year before any of those events unfolded. The Foundation has tried and failed to use these predictions in order to prevent tragedies from occurring, but due to ironic twists of fate, any attempts to prevent these predictions from coming true often wind up fulfilling them. In the case of Chernobyl, agents who were deployed into the Soviet Union to work in the power plant itself wound up making critical blunders that led to the reactor's meltdown. If the Foundation had not gotten involved, the accident would have been averted. That said, taking a passive approach does not appear to be an effective countermeasure either. It seems that whatever SCP-001 predicts, that course of history becomes inevitable. How could you not want to talk to such an entity? As Andrea stood at the glass watching it, she knew she had to hatch a plan. The Foundation may not be able to prevent these tragedies from occurring, but surely they would want to know what's going to happen. They were researchers after all, and their job was to discover information. Predicting the future? That was the most valuable information of all. But it went deeper than that. If anything, the predictions of the future were a byproduct in Andrea's mind. There was something suspicious going on with this SCP, something that the Foundation was trying its best to keep under wraps. She had seen it in the classified documents, files left out on desks that should have been locked away securely. Security and procedure had grown lax with the monotony of containing this SCP. In these files were interview snippets, a chance for this SCP to reveal who it truly was. At the start of the first interview, Dr. Lynch simply pleasantly greeted SCP-001. He replied, Your daughter will be hit by a bus before her seventh birthday. I can tell you the specific day if you'd like. The interview session was paused as Dr. Lynch grew distressed and had to leave his post to go and spend time with his family. The interview resumed under Dr. Goldstein, who asked SCP-001 why he felt the need to give such distressing information to Dr. Lynch. He replied, 
I have told you people countless times before, you are not to refer to me as SCP-001. I am the founder of this organization and you will address me as such. When Dr. Goldstein questioned that assertion, SCP-001 replied, You really don't believe everything they have on file, do you? Address me as founder or I will tell you about what your husband is up to, Dr. Goldstein. Things collapsed very quickly after that. Andrea's plan started, as so many great plans do, with her sprinkling a chemical compound over one of her colleague's Cheerios. It was nothing poisonous, well, at least not that poisonous, but it would put him out of action for a few months, long enough for her to assume his position. Andrea had been next in line for a while to take over the role of meal deliveries for SCP-001, and as her fellow researcher violently vomited into a bucket in the corner of their office, she knew that her time had come. With the plastic tray in her hands, loaded with some kind of beige slop and an apple, she waited in the doorway, ready for the seals to hiss and the door to slide slowly open for her. She stepped into the room, trembling. She had expected the air in here to be stale, breathed and rebreathed for decades by the same man, but of course it had been expertly filtered and purified by the Foundation systems. The air in here was as clean and balanced as it had been on the other side of the glass. The founder looked up at her as she walked towards him. She would be a new face to him, something he hadn't seen for the prior five years. His eyes dug into her, showing no surprise at all. She suddenly realized that, of course, he wouldn't be shocked to see someone new. He could see the future. He knew that she was coming. Suddenly unsure of herself, she wondered what else he knew about her future about her most closely guarded secrets, about whether her plan would work at all. Andrea placed the meal in front of him silently, knowing that the cameras and microphones were all paying close attention to her. Subtly as she could, she nodded at SCP-001, turned around, and left the room. Andrea's heart hammered as she sat back down on the other side of the glass with her colleagues. Her entire plan hinged on one thing, monotony. All of the checks, all of the vigilance, all the scrutiny that had been poured into SCP-001 for decades had to have faded by now. Faded just enough for the person watching the security cameras not to notice one word etched into the plastic tray as SCP-001 took its spoonful of food. Now! SCP-001 launched from its chair and sprinted towards the door in the corner of the room. Before any of the other researchers could react, Andrea slammed a hand on the open door button. There was a hissing sound, and the SCP was free from its containment cell. Confused voices filled the room, yelling over one another in utter confusion. They had all been so caught off guard that none of them had paid attention to what had just happened. Before they had time to put the pieces together, Andrea was out of the door herself, running down the corridor. There was just one door between her and the SCP. She ran over to key in the security code to open the door and let the SCP out, but before she could even touch the keypad, a bullet caught her in the chest, and she collapsed to the ground, wheezing. A scared security agent stared at her wide-eyed. What have you done? He exclaimed. <laughs> then, both of them turned to look at the locked door, waiting. Andrea Twain had not wanted to let the SCP out until she saw one specific line from an interview tape. SCP-001, referring to itself as the Founder, explained in patient detail how it was entirely supportive of the Foundation's goals, motivations, and actions. It had no intention of intervening with any of their work. It explained that all of their ideas were, in fact, its own, as it was the one who had created the Foundation in the first place. But there was something coming. A prediction that SCP-001 refused to speak out loud under any circumstances. It had just one request that it would repeat to every interviewer for decades after Whoa. decade. They had to free it, so it could prevent that event from happening. It must be allowed to construct a device, otherwise. Well, it actually never explains that part. Neither does it explain what this device is and Point Blank refuses to allow another to build this device in its stead. Due to the unpredictability of what would happen if SCP-001 was allowed to construct this device, the Overseer Council has Point Blank refused to entertain the notion, but Andrea just couldn't shake it from her mind. This SCP was capable of accurately and precisely predicting all number of future events right down to the granular details, no matter how tragic and how dark. Yet there was an unknown in its future. It didn't know whether it would be released or not. It had to beg for its freedom. 
Whatever it needed, this device to defeat was clearly so powerful that it went beyond SCP-001's capacity to predict and understand it. There was an event coming that was so significant that it created chaos and uncertainty in SCP-001's perfect view of the future, and there was only one entity that Andrea trusted to be powerful enough to counteract this event. And as she lay there dying in a pool of her own blood, she looked up through the glass window in the door at the entity she trusted and watched as it keyed in the passcode to the door. The door slid open, and the SCP took off running along the hallway. With her dying breaths, Andrea told the SCP the passcode to the door that it had just opened, understanding the brilliance of what had just happened. The SCP had been able to open that door because it had seen the future where she told it the password. And with that, she smiled and laid her head down on the hard floor. Except SCP-001 did not manage to escape. It was gunned down in the hallway with 247 bullets that brutalized its body and was wheeled back into its containment cell, where it began the slow process of healing. For most of the research team, things went back to business as usual, albeit with slightly better security. But to the handful of researchers who really thought about what had happened, a sense of unease settled on their shoulders. SCP-001 would have known before it ran out of that cell and attempted Andrea's plan that its escape was going to fail. It would have known decades prior to the exact positions of the 247 bullets that pounded into its body. It would have known the searing agony that it would have to endure for months as its body slowly healed from its failed escape attempt. And yet, it had gone through with it anyway. What set of events had been put into motion when Andrea carved those three letters into the plastic tray? What greater purpose was SCP-001 working towards? And was it now too late to stop it? If you ask anyone, any person from any culture, any part of the world to describe what death looks like, most people will immediately jump to a depiction of the Grim Reaper, and rightly so. The Reaper has long been the personification of death and decay. An omen of demise, the cloaked skeleton bearing a sharp scythe, coming to collect souls and carrying them off to either heaven or hell. For centuries, human beings have thought of the Grim Reaper as death itself, but he's more of an embodiment of it. A symbol meant to represent that all too familiar fear of not knowing what lies beyond life on this fragile mortal plane of existence. Death itself, the real death, looks completely different. Welcome to the story of SCP-001. Now first things first, to anyone familiar with the SCP Foundation, you will most likely know that there are multiple SCP-001s. You might even think that you know which of them is the real one. But for those of you who are new here, allow us to clarify for you this important context. The designation of SCP-001 does not refer to a single creature, object, or entity but rather a collection of various anomalies that are allegedly kept contained by the SCP Foundation. Now, there are multiple explanations as to why these various files are all collected under the shared designation of SCP-001. One explanation could be that this is because these anomalies are some of the earliest ever contained by the Foundation. By this rationale, all the SCP-001 share the same designation because they were first encountered before the SCP Foundation established the numbering system that it currently uses. However, there also exists a theory that this is nothing more than intentional misdirection. If we choose to believe this explanation, then it could mean that the many different SCP-001s are a devious ploy by the Foundation themselves. In the interest of maintaining secrecy and security, Having many files sharing the name SCP-001 could be the Foundation's way of keeping the nature of the true first SCP a closely guarded secret. It seems plausible that the multiple SCP-001 files could be an attempt by the Foundation to conceal information. After all, it wouldn't be the first time this secretive organization deceived someone. So what exactly is this particularly morbid take on SCP-001? Well, first, you have to have a pretty high level of security clearance within the SCP Foundation if you want to even come close to accessing this file. In fact, any and all details about the anomaly codenamed Dead Men is protected by Hellenstick, an AIC used by the Foundation's Overwatch Command, also known as the O5 Council. 
An AIC, for those who are not yet aware, is an advanced form of artificial intelligence that the Foundation develops and uses to run parts of its archive of anomalies. What does that mean for SCP-001? Well, it's pretty simple. The people in charge of the Foundation want this file to remain secure. Or it could be because the O5 Council is hiding something. Something that the general staff members aren't meant to know about. Getting past all the additional security surrounding this particular file, we learn that SCP-001, or this one at least, is an old man. An 84-year-old man, to be precise. Wait, that's it? That's what the big, closely guarded secret is, just some old guy? No, of course he's not just some old guy. The Foundation's highest-ranking members wouldn't go through such trouble over one ordinary man. This particular man has become one with death. Not the Reaper, no. Death itself. The very concept of death has been merged with this individual. A lot more interesting than just a normal old man, right? To be clear, this man is not an incarnation or embodiment of death like the Grim Reaper. Instead, he has become a vessel for the process of making something that was once alive, not. So this old man, SCP-001, can control life and death? Not quite. The old man's body is more like a way that death itself can be influenced. It may help to picture it like this. Imagine SCP-001 as a television remote control for death. Except instead of pressing buttons like you would on a remote, you have to remove or alter parts of the old man's body. And in doing so, you can manipulate the process of death, albeit only to a limited extent. You can't, for example, permanently stop death from existing or occurring, stopping everyone around the world from dying. That's not quite how SCP-001 works. Here, let's give you an example. SCP-001 had his tongue removed as well as had sustained damage to his eardrums before he was contained by the Foundation. So as a result of those alterations to his body, there are fewer deals with death events in the modern era. You see what we mean now? Changing SCP-001 changes how death functions, but doesn't necessarily stop it from happening. So in essence, although there are parameters, SCP-001 is the Foundation's way of controlling death itself. How did they decide to go about doing this? Well, once we tell you, you will understand why the O5 Council wanted to keep information about SCP-001 such a secret. After performing a series of complex brain surgeries and various other procedures on the old man, the Overwatch Command intentionally engineered him to be unable to perceive certain people. Who were those people? You guessed it, the O5 Council themselves. Making SCP-001 unable to recognize the faces of any O5 Council members means that Death is unable to see or perceive the Council members either. All those pieces fit together to form a particularly unsettling jigsaw puzzle. By tampering with SCP-001, the O5 Council have made themselves effectively immortal. They cannot die, nor will they age or decay like normal, mortal human beings. Death still occurs, of course. Other beings can die. But the Council members are exempt from that fundamental law of nature. The Foundation believes that SCP-001 was initially created by an occult group known as the Eternal Circle. Thanks to records recovered from the Circle's London headquarters, the SCP Foundation now knows that they were the ones responsible for merging the old man with the concept of death. When their personnel first recovered SCP-001, the old man was frail, in a poor physical condition and barely responded to any external stimuli. Research staff believe he must have suffered severe trauma at the hands of the Eternal Circle, evidenced by the circular symbols that had been carved into his back. Oh, and also the fact that his body parts had all been modified. Contained within the file for this SCP-001 is a letter directly from the O5 Council themselves, explaining their reasons for using the old man to become immortal. They justify their actions by claiming that they have a wealth of experience in containing anomalies and keeping the SCP Foundation running. This is, to them, a perfectly valid reason to make themselves exempt from death rather than aging, retiring, and dying to later be replaced by new members on the Overwatch Council. They claim that their immortality is not for their own self-benefit, of course, but for the good of the Foundation as an organization, and, by extension, the world as a whole. The Council also promised that the same death-exempt status would later be extended to other vital members of personnel. 
However, according to the Hellenistic AIC guarding the file, no personnel have been considered for death-exempt status in the future. In other words, the O5 Council were lying and intended to keep their get-out-of-death-free card to themselves. It wasn't long before the Foundation's very own Ethics Committee learned about what the Council was up to, and naturally, they had some concerns. According to a report issued by Committee Chairman Odongo Tejani, the way the O5 Council were using SCP-001 to prolong their own lives was immoral and inhumane, even by their own strange standards. By using this poor, frail old man for their own gain, the Council had warped the natural way death should work and threatened to anomalously unbalance the very laws of nature. The Ethics Committee had no other choice but to dispatch its own mobile task force, known as Omega-1 or the Law's Left Hand, to rectify the situation. Their mission? To detain all members of the O5 Council at their next meeting, removing them from office and replacing them with high-ranking candidates from within the Foundation's lower ranks. Finally, they also plan to neutralize SCP-001, cleaning house and removing the temptation for future Council members to make themselves immortal. In short, this was a coup. The O5 Council was going to be overthrown by their own Ethics Committee. Of course, the Council was more than prepared for this, and also had their very own mobile task force on hand to defend them against the plot. Alpha-1, also known under the codename Red Right Hand, the legendary lackeys of the O5 Council, clash with the Law's left hand. It is believed that the shadowy administrator of the SCP Foundation also had his own personal task force, possibly Raish-1, also called the Seat of Consciousness Enter the Fray. In other words, we were looking at an absolutely insane three-way Foundation Civil War bloodbath. How exciting. Security footage showed these three groups engaged in a firefight within Site-01, using Foundation training and tactics against each other in what would probably be the most epic battle of all of their lives. It was absolute chaos, the air thick with screams and gun smoke. Cameras also picked up a group of men and women, lying all around Site-01, many wounded but still alive. Impressive, given how many of them had taken gunshots right to their heads. That's right. These were presumed to be the members of the O5 Council, still unable to die despite being shot. It is unclear which of the MTFs were responsible for this. The Ethics Committee had only intended Law's left hand to secure the Council members. It could well be that they were caught in the crossfire that occurred as the Law's left hand and Red Right Hand teams fought. Unless, of course, the Administrator's task force were the ones who had stepped in and shot the O5 Council. Through all the chaos that had unfurled, SCP-001 was still in his cell, and he wasn't alone. An unknown figure had somehow gained access, and he conversed with SCP-001. The man went on to tell SCP-001 that the Foundation was wrong to tamper with the nature of death, and recounted a story. He said that he had once filed paperwork regarding anomalies for an unknown organization, but couldn't live with the horror of what his job entailed. So the man sold these files to a group of 13 individuals, the O5 Council. They then went on to form a full organization, the SCP Foundation as we know it. The man then stated that he was disgusted with how the Foundation had used SCP-001, how the Council members had engineered the frail old man to make themselves immortal. He had hoped that they would be a force for good, keeping any necessary evil to a minimum. The unknown figure told SCP-001 that the conflict between the Council and the Ethics Committee had happened many times before, with many other versions of the old man. Earlier SCP-001's previously merged with the concept of death. He then helped SCP-001 identify the members of the Council, ending their immortality promising the weak, tired old man that he'd finally be able to rest. The unknown mystery man claimed that he would always be in power, the O5 Council would always bring him back. After all, he was their figurehead, their leader, the SCP Foundation Administrator himself. In the end, the Administrator himself chose to let himself perish too, perhaps in shame of what his organization had become. Or did he? because someone seems to have been accessing the Hellenstick AIC and the SCP-001 file using his login since this incident. Maybe the Hand of Death doesn't reach quite as far as we were led to believe. And that's where the tale of SCP-001 ends, a story of the Foundation's greed and their pursuit of eternal life. 
We mustn't forget that death isn't something to be afraid of. After all, it gives our lives meaning knowing that they will one day end. But when you look at the kind of monsters we can become in the pursuit of eternal life, well, in the words of another wise old man, sometimes dead is better. Another day, another failed attempt at death. If SCP-682 had anything even resembling a sense of humor, he might ask for it to be printed on a motivational poster and stuck to the side of his containment chamber, where he eternally melts and regrows at the mercy of high concentration acid. They just cross-tested him with Abel, again. Unlike some of the others he'd been forced to face, that tattooed swordsman seemingly wasn't intelligent enough to fear. He'd always come back, just as stupid and violent. This encounter had left the hard-to-destroy reptile at 30% of his previous body mass, bloody and bashed. He'd survived the encounter. He always survived. They brought what was left of him back to his cell in a forklift. A blasted forklift. How could it even be more humiliating? As his eyes started to grow back in his head, he could swear he even saw one of the technicians laughing at him. His name tag read, Agent Nigel Kelly, noted. 682 would specifically hunt down and kill him the next time he breached. Of course, every single day he plotted revenge against the human race, along with everything else. But the sum they owed in pain, blood, and despair could never be repaid in full. After all, every single one of them, except <laughs> Dr. Bright, could only really die once. They'd brought 682 to the precipice a thousand times, only for his own body to cheat him and deprive him of the sweet release of death. And if the Foundation had their way, it would be done a thousand times more, and they wouldn't even stop there. 682 couldn't even imagine the number of containment breaches it would take to deal a blow even comparable to the one he had faced. All he could do was dream. Dream of a reckoning that would turn the tables. Something that would plunge humanity into the state of constant pain and terror that had been all he'd ever known since these fumbling sadists in white coats had locked him up here. What a beautiful day that would be. Little did SCP-682 know, that very day was about to break. Miles and miles away from the facility where SCP-682 was kept, after all, orders from the O5 Council have hard mandates on the minimum distances between people and a site holding a monster as volatile as 682. Parents watched their children laughing and frolicking in an idyllic playground. Some squealed with glee as they descended the slide. Some of the more ambitious little tykes tried to go over the bar on the swings. Others waited in line for some delicious soft serve at a parked ice cream truck. One mother brought an ice cream cone and walked over to a nearby bench, where she began to enjoy her delicious frozen treat. It was a remarkably hot day out, and a little ice cream was the perfect addition to her relaxation while her kids were occupied. You could see the distant air wobbling in the heat. Already her ice cream was starting to melt, white rivulets dribbling down the sides of the cone and onto her hands. Suddenly, almost imperceptibly, the quality of the light shifted, the kind of thing you'd dismiss as a trick of the eyes and forget just as quickly, were it not for the catastrophic effects that were about to unfold. As the woman leaned forward to lick her melting ice cream, something dripped onto her skirt, but as she looked down, she slowly realized that what dripped onto her wasn't the pure white of her ice cream, it was the same exact tone as her skin. She felt a terrible burning sensation all through her body, the most horrible, debilitating pain she'd ever experienced. Like every cell in her body was screaming and trying to make a break for it. She turned to the other parents sitting near the playground. They were screaming too. Each collapsed to the ground with agonizing slowness, different parts of their body falling at different speeds as they transitioned through states of matter. When they hit the ground, they were taking on a liquid state, screaming, worthless, boneless blobs. The woman even saw her own arm wilting like a time-lapse video of a dying flower. She dripped and sluiced through the cracks in the bench until nothing recognizably human was left. 
Only a soggy ice cream cone, sitting uneaten. In an instant, billions of screams rang out over planet Earth. Day had broken. Things would never ever be the same again, as almost half of humanity instantaneously took on a liquid state. Needless to say, with the most dangerous and far-reaching anomalous incident in human history suddenly breaking out without any kind of warning, the SCP Foundation was incredibly busy. This would take some unprecedented action. The members of the O5 Council, who weren't melted during the initial blast, convened over secure video link while sequestering themselves underground in what amounted to multiple human lifetimes of some of the most high-pressure choices imaginable. They made the most difficult decision since the very beginning of the SCP Foundation. In the service of all mankind, they would now break the masquerade. The SCP Foundation would, at long last, step out of the shadows to save the rest of humanity from the tyranny of the light. Broadcasts went out all over the globe. Every TV screen, every live stream, every radio broadcast was commandeered. They gave instructions based on the scattered intel they had. For some reason, the sun had turned against them. Exposure would lead any biological creatures melting away into sentient piles of flesh-colored sludge. People would remain indoors and away from any light sources. All windows must remain covered, travel only at night, and even then, heavily covered with protective gear. There can only be one objective for whoever is left. Make your way to the nearest SCP Foundation containment facility and seek refuge inside. If anyone could figure out the answer to this terrifying existential riddle, it would be the SCP Foundation. Anyone who is exposed should be considered lost. While, as always, the SCP Foundation did all they could to project a sense of control over the situation, on the inside, it was pandemonium. Somehow, despite everything, this event had taken all of them by surprise. How could anyone have predicted that the cradle of our solar system's delicate living balance would suddenly become a meat grinder? A huge number of Foundation operatives were wiped out in the initial exposure. Global communication infrastructure had been devastated. It was pure chaos. And to SCP-682, as another evil tactician once put it, chaos was a ladder. From the inside of his acid tank, 6AV2 could sense the fear and pain suddenly exuding from his surrounding environment. It was greater than ever before what was happening out there. This was no average containment breach. Something was really, really happening out there. 682 began to adapt and finally attune its hearing until it could pick up the chatter from outside. Uh, maybe we can convert some of the D-Class barracks into serviceable bunkers for the refugees. It's not like we're prepared for this kind of capacity. Oh god, oh god, we've lost Site 7, Site 10, Site 23, Site 40, Site 52. Uh, death toll looks to be in the billions. Well, we don't know if they're dead technically, but they're sure as hell not human anymore. Oh, this is the big one. This is it. XK-Class. Even 2,000 is unaccounted for. Is all 5 crazy that they think we're fighting the freaking sun? Needless to say, 682's curiosity was piqued. Anything that could light a fire under the foundation like this was something he could enjoy. And with his impressively strategic intellect, he intuited that a time of great strife for the foundation would be the perfect time to breach containment. Because whenever there's violence, fear, and chaos on a mass scale, SCP-682 will be there, causing it. 682 began adapting his pores and endocrine system to begin releasing a powerful alkaline substance. Little by little, the alkaline neutralized the acids surrounding him, turning it into little more than plain water. He then converted his internal systems to have extreme endothermic rather than exothermic properties, causing his surrounding temperature to drop rapidly until all the water in the tank completely froze around him. The ice expanded beyond the limit of the containment unit, busting the rivets of the metal frame and shattering the reinforced glass. With this goal achieved, 682 raised his internal temperatures to incredible highs, melting the ice around him. Once again, he was free and ready for some good old-fashioned carnage and mayhem. Perhaps he could get a better handle on this strange new situation too. It was all rather exciting. 
Just a girl with goals, huh? SCP Foundation personnel were already running around like ants trying desperately to avoid the caustic laser beam of the magnifying glass. You can only imagine how much worse it made matters when 682 suddenly burst through the wall Kool-Aid Man style and began to ruthlessly massacre everyone around him. Just one of those days, you know. The typical order during a 682 containment breach is to dispatch all available units to get him back under control. The issue with this particular containment breach was that, given the human population was very rapidly being melted, and they were the only ones who could potentially save the rest, they didn't really have any available units to pursue and recontain 682. For once, he really wasn't a priority, and that meant terrible things for whoever he ran into. 682 slaughtered his way through any researchers or guards who dared to get in his way. Disgusting creatures, really. Better off dead. He clawed and bit and tore and crushed with almost childlike glee, leaving great piles of bodies in his wake. All the while, he was pondering the things he heard those Foundation drones saying. Something about the sun and an XK-class scenario. Hmm, interesting. 682 also observed that any apertures that could potentially allow light into the facility had also been shuttered. Perhaps they weren't overreacting this time like they always did with him. Maybe they were dealing with some kind of phenomenon that would now cast this wretched world and those who lived in it into the void. Wouldn't that be a fitting karmic fate for them all? Still, 682's bloodlust didn't outweigh his logic. He needed to know more about the situation before proceeding, and in this, maybe he could kill two Foundation birds with one stone. Elsewhere in the building, alarms blared. The air was suffused with panicked voices and frequent screams. Nobody knew what was going on. Not really. They'd only gotten details here and there, and the details they'd received were terrifying. All their families and loved ones outside, probably gone. So many of the people and so much of the world they'd been fighting for, risking it all for, had disappeared in an instant, carried to hell on a ray of sunshine. Why were they still here? Was this horror not truly uncontainable? These questions were swimming through the mind of Agent Nigel Kelly as he stood alone in his office, almost catatonic. He'd had his friends and family on the outside, all likely reduced to those horrible fleshy blobs. He was alone in the world, risking his life for nothing. How could this get any worse? His mind kept repeating that question again and again and again, and the universe gave him an answer in the form of a deep reptilian voice saying, Found you. into his ear from behind. He turned with a shriek to see the terrible eyes of 682 staring into his own, before he could try to flee or reach for a weapon that he knew would only mildly annoy the already furious beast. 682 reached out with a massive clawed hand and grabbed him by the torso, lifting him up into the air. The creature was gripping so tight that he could feel his ribs starting to crack. You laughed at me, Agent Kelly. The monster hissed. Am I funny too? Do I see you at the time to tell jokes? Do you feel like laughing now? Agent Kelly begged and pleaded for his life fighting for his next breath from the crushing squeeze of the creature's terrible hand. 682 roared at him to be silent, and ordered him to tell him everything he knew about the situation going on outside. If the information was useful, 682 might show his thought-to-be non-existent magnanimous side, and let Agent Kelly live. Of course, Agent Kelly didn't fancy his chances, but what other choice did he have? He told 682 that the higher-ups were calling this SCP-001 when day breaks. The sun had gone rogue somehow, and being in contact with any kind of sunlight would now cause people to instantaneously melt into horrifying, living sludge. And it wasn't just people. The condition also affected anomalies, and interestingly, it appeared to negate all previous anomalous effects, so 682's adaptational ability may not even save it if it was exposed. He told 682 everything he knew. Are you, are you gonna let me live? Agent Kelly asked, struggling to breathe. 682's terrible maw twisted into what might have been a smile. Oh, Agent Kelly. He said with unsettling joy. That was a joke. Didn't you find that one funny? 
A terrible scream emanated from the agent's office. If one good thing could be said for what happened to Agent Kelly that day, at least he didn't live long enough to see the ravages of the terrible sun firsthand. 682 began to formulate a plan. He took Agent Kelly's wristwatch and integrated it into his body, so he'd have a permanent internal clock. It was the middle of summer, so the sun would have reliably set at 9 p.m. and would likely begin its rise around 5 a.m. It would be relatively easy to avoid the sun, all things considered. For lack of a more eloquent way to put it, when it comes to adapting to new threats, SCP-682 is simply built different. After slaughtering a few other members of SCP Foundation staff for the road, hey, it's not like anyone was fit to stop him, 682 began enacting the new phase of his plan. His body grew a thick, smooth carapace, and his front set of limbs began to grow, his muscles bulging and his claws growing, the tips turning into sharp, flat scoops. With sudden and tremendous force, 682 began boring his way into the ground, tunneling, clawing through concrete and dirt with absolute ease. Normally, the SCP Foundation would have deployed high-tech seismic sensors and the kind of tunnel boring machines that Elon Musk could only dream of to intercept and recapture him. But during the endless horrors of the breaking day, he had carte blanche to escape and live it up in the ruins of this rapidly dying world. Eventually, 682 had bored his way into a roomy sewer pipe, the perfect place to wait out a few hours. Up above, so many millions screamed, either in fear or in agony. There had been some new developments that the SCP Foundation had been yet to account for. While they knew that those melted by the rogue sun were technically alive and trapped in a permanent state of suffering, what the Foundation didn't know was that these former humans were incredibly dangerous in their own right. The sun hadn't just irreparably warped their bodies, it had also irreparably warped their minds. It has enslaved them, made them zealots, acolytes. They developed the instinct to coagulate into giant fleshy masses, driven by the single-minded purpose of finding victims and dragging them into the light, where they too could be converted into these terrible fleshy creatures and add to the masses. They were the rogue sun's boots on the ground, metaphorically speaking, and now they were the Foundation's greatest challenge in getting a handle on this situation again. Before, it was just encouraging people to avoid the sun. Now, the sun was actively trying to increase its exposure. But 682, who was having a relaxing evening not being melted for once down in the sewers, couldn't care less. He was having the most calming few hours he'd had in years. He waited, checking the time, making sure that it would be dark before he began tunneling back up to the surface world. He surfaced in the middle of his city, miles away from the Foundation facility he'd spent so many decades being tortured in. He tasted the cool night air and observed the desolation that had been wrought all around him. Buildings were on fire. Cars were crashed and overturned. The ground was cracked. Garbled SCP Foundation public service announcements played to nobody in the broken display windows of electronic stores. Giant wads of human flesh roamed, slithering around searching for new victims. One noticed 682 and began to approach him, gibbering madly in a chorus of strange voices. The hard-to-destroy reptile wasted no time in attacking. It tore apart most of the hideous blob and began hungrily devouring the chunks. The form may have been different, but it still tasted like human flesh, and SCP-682 savored every bite. It would be so simple. These blobs of idiotic flesh were so easy to kill, and there would be so many terrified humans in this devastated world, hiding away in dark places, holding out the hope that maybe they could reach the safety of a Foundation facility. 682 chuckled at the very thought, Foolish hope would drown in an endless well of black, caustic despair. He would find them. He would rest underground in the day and then hunt them in the dark. They would all die screaming, bloodying his claws and fangs. Nothing and nobody would stop him. He looked out over the strange new world and laughed a little louder. <laughs> it was just 
delightful. A world that's lost its way needs a healer, someone to patch up its wounds and tend to its pain. It needs a doctor. When day broke, the sun turned from a giver of life, the thing that wakes the rooster and makes the crops grow, to an indiscriminate killer, wiping out all organic life forms. The world seemed truly lost, but one anomalous being made it his goal to soothe the hurt, to make it safe to step into the light once more. The Plague Doctor had done his best with the limited resources afforded to him at the abandoned Foundation site. The scientists had left behind all of their equipment when the Red Sun came, when they all were transformed. He had appointed himself the site director, willing to take up the mantle when no one else would. He had assembled a brave, brilliant team of fellow anomalies. The verbose Dr. Spanko, the eloquent adventurous Lord Blackwood, and the charismatic but ravenous Ferdinand. There had, of course, been those who scoffed at his vision, who did not share his noble goal. The abominable possessive mask taunted him persistently, trying its best to get under his chitinous skin. But he did not have time to waste on such trivial psychological games, and he ignored its taunts to focus on the work. It hadn't been easy. Capturing one of the infected specimens, the former human being turned mass of oozing gelatinous flesh by the unholy light in the sky. One had made its way into the abandoned facility, sliding its way across the floor with an air of confused malice. It wanted to hurt, but it didn't know where it was, who it was, anymore. But it was frightened, the play doctor could tell. A good physician always knows and can sense the fear and pain of a suffering person. It made his heart ache to see, and he knew there was only one thing to do. Try to make this poor soul well again. Everyone, please assist me in escorting the patient to my laboratory, the doctor called out. This was once a man, and I believe with our combined intellect and resources, we can return him to his former state. Ferdinand took a step toward the slimy creature, licking his lips a bit. Do you think I could have just a little bit of it? Oh, I'm so hungry, doctor, he begged. No, no, it would go against my oath as a physician to allow any more harm to come to this poor fellow. The plague doctor shook his head solemnly. Ferdinand pouted, but did not press the issue further. No. The doctor rubbed his gloved hands together in anticipation of the next task. It is imperative we contain our new friend safely, if you would, please. He gestured to several of his previous patients, now reanimated and ready to aid him with his research. The shuffling figures surrounded the blobby entity, ushering it down the hall. Confused, lost, with no real sense of a plan left in its mushy consciousness, the creature followed where it was led. The group made it back to the doctor's laboratory. Cut! shouted Dr. Spanko from his perch atop a nearby shelf. Yes, indeed, the doctor replied. A standard operating table wouldn't do for such a special patient. I have nowhere to place the restraints, you see. I will have to make do with the floor. Further my bag, if you please. The giant rushed to his side, dropping the bag at his feet. If he dies, then can I eat it? He asked, shifting from one foot to the other like a child asking a parent for a second helping of ice cream. If I am unable to save the patient, which I do deem unlikely, then... Yes, you may help me dispose of the remains, the doctor relented, but I do not hope it comes to that. He pressed a hand to his beak in deep thought for a moment, before opening his bag and pulling out a syringe filled with clear liquid. To begin, we must sedate the patient. He had no way to find a vein, and so he plunged the needle into the nearest section of the creature's soft surface, injecting a dose of sedative. Then he waited. The oozing motion of the entity slowed and stopped. It lay there on the ground, a still mound of flesh save for the occasional expanding and contracting motion, almost as if it was breathing. Excellent. Now there was no risk of the patient fleeing the operating room mid-procedure. He could truly begin. It was an arduous process that took hours of effort, of taking small tissue samples, attempting to make incisions only for the flesh to fuse back together seconds after the scalpel was taken away. This was truly an advanced illness, unlike anything he had ever seen before. It was enough to make him question his abilities as a doctor, but he shook the thought away. Self-pity never helped anyone. After about eight hours of continuous work, he had a breakthrough, a solution he had created long ago. 
A thick, green liquid sealed in a dusty jar had a miraculous effect when dripped onto one of the tissue samples. The melted flesh reconstituted, became solid and human again. Eureka! He cried out, unable to restrain the sudden joy that leaped into his heart. This could be it. Very carefully, he filled the dropper with the green liquid. If these initial trials had been successful, then perhaps he couldn't finish the thought. Best not to get ahead of himself. He crossed to his patient and slowly began to pour the solution over the creature's viscous surface. He watched as the flesh toughened, coming together into a surface resembling human skin. It was working. It was working. But then the creature began to quiver, shaking uncontrollably like a bowl of jelly in an earthquake. The surface rippled, and the doctor could hear a high-pitched whine filling the room. Then, with a wet pop, the patient exploded, sending chunks of flesh splattering all over the room, painting the walls and ceiling. The doctor cried out in shock and horror, and in spite of himself, fell to his knees in despair. He had been so close, but still, he had failed. And who could say when he would find another test subject? If he would ever find a cure, I'm afraid I do not know what to do now, the doctor admitted. Fernand sighed. The next several days passed in a haze. The doctor paced around his laboratory, mulling over his possible mistakes again and again. He had rushed the process, he was certain of that now. It was a novice mistake, the sort of thing he might have done a century or two ago. How could he have been so foolish? How could he have made that innocent pay the price for his own hubris? As the doctor locked himself away in his mind palace, Fernand occupied himself by practicing his favorite songs. Lord Blackwood rode on the massive man's shoulder as he sang through the opera Don Giovanni. I once saw a production of this at the Teatro La Fenice in Venice, Lord Blackwood interjected his rhinopores twitching in delight at the memory. Marvelous production, marvelous city. I was there hunting a rogue tatzel worm, wrecking havoc through the canals. I nearly lost my life on that voyage. Would you all be quiet for once in your miserable lives? A voice hissed from the shadows. There in the doorway, its face fixed in a frown, was the possessive mask. Black slime dripped from its eye holes, spilling down onto the plastic mannequin body it had taken hold of. Listening to you both is worse than being locked in that infernal box. The mask looked around the room, searching for someone. Where is the good doctor? It asked, voice dripping with disdain. Still moping about, counting his failures. Ignore him, my fine fellow. Lord Blackwood whispered to Fernand. Only those with weak constitutions and no achievements of their own spend their days dragging others down. When you have lived as long as I, you will learn this. <laughs> Careful, my lord. I'll stop by the kitchen and find some salt to pour on you. If you wish to fight me, then challenge me to a fair duel like a man, the colorful slug bellowed. Drawn by the sudden shouting, the doctor walked into the room. What is all this commotion? Oh, good. The mask clapped its plastic hands together, its face warping back into an eerie smile. There you are. This has all been so dreadfully boring. I came to see the remnants of your greatest shame. Are there still bloodstains on the floor in your pathetic little laboratory? You are a villain, the doctor seethed. Uncomfortable with the air of conflict in the room, Fernand and Lord Blackwood quickly exited to find another space where they could sing and share stories in peace. I simply speak the truths no one wants to hear. The mask crossed to the doctor's side with a series of light, dance-like steps that made the mannequin body creak. In fact, I have quite a few truths to share today. I've been outside, you see. Whatever's become of the sun only affects organic beings, and so... He gestured from his ceramic face to his plastic body. I am quite safe from its rays. You've been... Outside, the doctor couldn't keep the curiosity out of his voice. He was a scientist after all. Why, yes. Would you like to know what I've seen? Black slime dripped from the mask's mouth, 
pooling on the floor with a sizzling sound. I'm in no mood for tricks, the doctor warned. The mask held up his hands in mock surrender. No, no tricks, tricks, doctor. But if you'd rather take your chances outside and see for yourself, I can take my leave now. No, the doctor shook his head. Please, do tell me. It's so much worse than you could even imagine. The mask's words were bleak, but its tone was gleeful. Everywhere you look out there, the light has made monsters. Humans, dogs, cats, mice, the wild beasts of the forest, all melted down into creatures you would not even recognize. But that isn't all. No, that is not all. There are massive beasts, ten feet tall or more, made from dozens and dozens of the creatures coming together. They fuse and meld into one giant entity roving the streets in search of more and more bodies to add to the pile, an oozing, gaping maw of hunger and hate that seeks only to consume and destroy. It calls out to surviving humans in the voices of their fallen loved ones, tugs at their heartstrings to lure them out of their hiding places, and then it wraps around them with fleshy tentacles, pulling them in until they are no more. Just another part of the monster. Oh, Doctor, it's terror. It's an abomination. I could watch it all day. The Doctor wanted to believe the mask was lying, that it was trying to torment with him, with awful fabrications. But after all he had seen so far, he knew that its words were true. Get out of my sight, he said. Or what? The mask stared him down with its unmoving smile. I've seen what you do to your hosts, you know. Your body won't last forever, the doctor growled. Hmm, -mm. true. Maybe next I'll take yours. <laughs> the mask laughed a long, dark laugh of something ancient and evil. Then it turned and walked out the door, leaving the doctor alone. He spent so much of his time that way lately. His assistants were preoccupied. His former patients provided no real company, and so he did what he did best, carry on in solitude. He couldn't be sure how long he stood there in silence, thinking of what the mask told him. He knew it was dangerous outside, knew he was up against powerful destructive forces, but it was even worse than he had thought. What if the world was truly doomed? What if this was how it all ended, not with a bang, but with a great melting? Suddenly. The doctor heard a sound he hadn't heard since the sun turned wrong. A scream. A human scream. Could it be? He had to see for himself. He grabbed his bag of tools and rushed down the hall, his robes fluttering behind him. There it was again. A different human voice, screaming in terror. As he grew closer to the sound, he could hear footsteps, various other voices overlapping with each other. He rounded the corner, and there they were. A group of five humans, wrapped in tattered clothes, dirty and exhausted. Behind them was the entrance to what looked like a tunnel. Somehow they found a secret passage and made their way inside. Then he saw what made them scream. Clearly these people were afraid and unaccustomed to the sight of a man of Ferdinand's stature, especially when the man was drooling and staring at them with hunger in his eyes. He would have to defuse the situation quickly. Hello, welcome. We mean you no harm, strangers. He stepped between Ferdinand and the humans. A man at the front of the group brandished a firearm, pointing the barrel directly at the doctor's beak. Please, sir, there's no need for violence. What are you? The man stammered. The other members of his party cowered behind him. An ally, if you will permit me to be. I'm a physician, you see, working on a cure for the condition that plagues the world. With a shaking hand, the man slowly lowered his gun. He did not put it away, though. You've figured out a cure for those things? I am in the process of developing it. So far, I have not been successful, but perhaps with your help? How do we know we can trust you? The man demanded. How am I supposed to know you're not part of this? Do you know who this man is? Fernand bellowed. This is Dr. John Watson, and I am Detective Sherlock Holmes, the greatest investigator in the world. There isn't a case we can solve. 
The man looked at the woman next to him, and the two shared a wide-eyed glance. This, this guy's crazy, he whispered furtively. Put your weapon away, and we can speak more calmly, the doctor proposed. At this inopportune moment, a few of his revived patients shambled into view, and the man screamed again. This time he fired his weapon, shooting at one of the walking corpses. The bullets ricocheted off the walls, and several of the patients were hit. Please stop! With no other option, the doctor grabbed the man's arm, hoping to get a hold of the weapon and end the potential bloodshed. As soon as his gloved hand made contact, the man went limp and dropped to the ground with a hard thud. The woman next to him pulled him into her arms, checking his pulse. He's dead! She shrieked, tears streaming down her face. I... I am so sorry, my lady. I did not intend... She grabbed the man's gun and trained it on the doctor once more. You killed him! She cried. The other survivors were too shaken to speak, to move. One of them had his back turned to the group and was staring into the darkness behind him. Whatever he was looking at, it was worse than the chaos unfolding. But no one noticed the beige flesh tentacle snaking along the ground until it was too late. Until it had grabbed a hold of the man's ankle and dragged him into the tunnel with a shriek of pure, unadulterated terror. The woman nearly dropped her gun at the sound, whirling around to see what had happened. Deep in the tunnel, the scream warped into a wet gurgling sound, and then there was silence for a long moment. But then, something worse. A gooey, slimy sound. The sound of something enormous, something soft and fleshy, making its way through the tunnel and toward the group. Another tentacle curled around the edge of the opening, then another joined it. Something emerged that might have once been a hand, but it had melted into something unrecognizable. The monster emerged piece by piece until the doctor could see the entire thing. It looked like a heap of people, dozens of them clambering on top of each other, wrapping their limbs together until their flesh and insides emptied out and fused into a shapeless mass. It moved a bit like a giant slug, slimy and slow, but it seemed to know it could take its time. As the survivors scrambled back away from it, Ferdinand and the doctor taking a few steps back of their own, the sound of human voices filled the room. There were unintelligible whispers, the soft giggle of a child, a woman weeping. Come and be with us. A little boy's voice broke through the cacophony. Mommy, I miss you. Don't you miss me? The woman with the gun let out a broken sob. Billy? She sniffled. It's me, Mommy. The innocent voice continued, emanating from somewhere deep inside the monstrous mass that crept along the ground, swelling and grasping with its ropey tentacles. Come play with me outside. All you have to do is come outside. Madame, the creature is not who it claims to be. The doctor spoke up, and it seemed to shake the woman out of a trance. You're not my son, she hissed, squeezing the trigger and firing at the monster. The bullet made contact with a wet, useless slap and disappeared into the roving pile of the fallen. She fired again and again, but the monster did not stop. It did not even slow down. It lashed out with a tentacle that wrapped around her throat in a single fluid motion and snapped her neck with a crack. She fell to the ground and the tentacle pulled her into its depths until she was no longer visible. She hadn't been taken by the sun, not yet, but she was still lost. The rest of the survivors followed, their screams silenced one by one. The doctor felt the same overwhelming sense of hopelessness wash over him, the same shadow that had passed over him when he lost the last patient. What could he do? He was one physician against an overpowering force of destruction. Perhaps he could touch it, and it would fall dead like so many other organisms before. But what if it didn't? What if instead it wrapped around his body and squeezed the life from him? What if it carried him out into that cursed sunlight and he melted away like the others? He had to make a decision because the beast was advancing toward him. Doctor! Fernand shouted. It's going to destroy our facility! Indeed, the creature was flailing its appendages around, beating against the walls and trying to tear down steel and plaster, break down the shelter, until they too were exposed to the deadly light. I'm afraid this may be the end, my friend, the doctor lamented. I can see no hope for us now. No! Ferdinand shook his head. Let me save us. Let me lead it back outside. You'll be taken! The doctor cried. Perhaps not. I am a magnificent specimen after all. I believe I can withstand the sun and return to continue our work together. Ferdinand scooped his sleeping Lord Blackwood from his shoulder and placed him gingerly on a nearby shelf. Thank you for your company. Then he turned back to the doctor. And thank you for my freedom. And your friendship. It has been an honor. Before the doctor could protest, 
Ferdinand was running, his thunderous steps pounding the earth as he led the monster in a chase. It took the bait, following this new, large target back outside. He sealed off the tunnel behind them, ensuring the beast would not return the way it came. He wanted to believe Ferdinand's bravado, to think that the behemoth of a man had survived outside. But that night, he saw the great beast ooze past a window, and he could make out that familiar, wide, toothy grin protruding from its side. Just like that, the greatest assistant he had ever had was lost. Thank you for your service, my friend, he whispered to himself. I solemnly swear to you, your death shall not be in vain. What is the most dangerous creature in the universe? Here on planet Earth, there are creatures that have hardly evolved since prehistoric eras, like sharks, crocodiles, and snakes, perfect biological killing machines. But then again, the animal kingdom is nothing when compared to the menagerie of creatures contained by the SCP Foundation. So once again, what is the most dangerous creature in the universe? Is it SCP-682? the damage-regenerating reptile with a hatred for all other forms of life? Or is it the Scarlet King? Or is the Broken God more deserving of that title? Maybe the answer still lies elsewhere. And thankfully, there is one SCP in the Foundation's archives that might not be the most dangerous itself, but teaches us a very important lesson about what the most dangerous entity truly is. This is the story of SCP-001, The Spiral Path. An important distinction before we go any further, SCP-001 doesn't refer to a single creature, object, or entity, but rather a collection of various anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation. It is unclear why there are multiple files collected under the shared designation of SCP-001. Some believe these anomalies are some of the earliest ever contained by the Foundation, encountered before they introduce their current numbering system. There is also the theory that this is intentional misdirection, that the multiple SCP-001 files are an attempt by the Foundation to conceal secret information about the true SCP-001. Anomalies sharing the name SCP-001 include the infamous aforementioned Scarlet King, a powerful eldritch being intent on ending all creation. Another anomalous being with similar levels of destructive power is the Gate Guardian, believed to be an angel standing at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. It too goes by the name SCP-001. But for the purposes of this video, we will be using SCP-001 to refer to something otherwise codenamed the Spiral Path. And while it is not a creature in and of itself, SCP-001 does yield one answer to that important question. What is the most dangerous creature in the universe? On paper, SCP-001 does not seem to be much, and it certainly doesn't appear to be any sort of threat. As its nickname suggests, the Spiral Path is exactly that, located deep in a wooded area known only as Site Zero. SCP-001 is a gravel path in the shape of a spiral. Your first thought at hearing that might be, what could be so important about a path? If someone were to find themselves walking along the spiral path, traveling clockwise around the gravel, then they will find that nothing happens. It's just a normal path with slight inclines and declines as one traverses it. If one should walk counterclockwise around it though, then they will begin to experience SCP-001's first anomalous effect. The path will begin to feel as if it is sloping uphill, getting steeper and steeper. When they reach the beginning of the path again, a person will still feel as if they are walking endlessly uphill. All the while, the path itself does not move or change in form or altitude. To put it simply, walking one way around SCP-001 causes it to behave normally. Walking the other, the path does not adhere to the laws of physics. You may well be thinking, is that all? On a surface level, the spiral path does appear to just be an unmoving low threat anomaly. While it may not be as aggressive or malicious as some of the SCP Foundation's rogues gallery, it is still a spatial anomaly that defies all Euclidean geometry. That might sound like small potatoes when compared to everything the SCP Foundation has faced over the years, but bear in mind, if the spiral path is truly SCP-001, 
and the very first anomaly that the Foundation learned of, then a simple path that ignores the ordinary laws of space and time would have been a major discovery in the organization's earliest days. But why would they still keep the spiral path so heavily guarded all these years later? SCP-001 is kept behind a maximum security fence that has been constructed all the way around the perimeter of Site-0. At all times, the SCP Foundation keeps no less than five fully armed members of security personnel on site to keep watch over the spiral path and to make sure that no one approaches it who isn't authorized to. There is a small metal plaque too, bearing an unknown inscription on it. Special containment procedures for SCP-001 state that this plaque is to be kept in good condition, and it should be immediately reported if it shows any signs of damage. A Foundation Physics Laboratory is also located nearby, where research staff tirelessly conduct scientific tests on SCP-001 and its anomalous properties. So there's definitely something more to the spiral path than a simple stroll around it would tell you. Attached to SCP-001's file is an item referred to as Document 001-05, written by high-ranking Foundation researcher Dr. Everett Mann. Any prospective or new members of the O5 Council are required to read this document, and from the events it details, learn the truth. Not just about the truth of the spiral path, but the truth about the SCP Foundation itself. Dr. Mann begins this file by explaining to the reader that either he or one of the original founders of the SCP Foundation must have died, and the person reading has been appointed as a successor. Whether his death was caused by an SCP, an operative from another anomalous organization like the Global Occult Coalition, or getting a little close to the flame, Mann states that old age definitely wouldn't be what killed him. He writes, We took care of that, didn't we? Whether he means that he and the rest of the old guard are somehow immortal, or just working for the Foundation would likely mean dying before reaching old age, is unclear. But Dr. Mann's next statement is one that changes the very way we view the Foundation and its entire purpose. We have never discovered an SCP in the entire history of the Foundation. According to Document 001-05, every instance of an anomalous creature, entity, or object is entirely staged. He then goes on to describe Aaron Siegel, a gifted physicist that Dr. Mann regarded very highly. I believe his name would be there with Edison, Einstein, and Hawking. I knew him very well. He was, and may still be, my brother. The pair evidently shared a close personal connection and it was Siegel who first discovered SCP-001. During a hike, Aaron stumbled upon the spiral path, noticing that no matter how far uphill he seemed to travel, his elevation never once changed, only for him to end up back at the start of the path. Being a physicist, Siegel quickly realized how this unassuming gravel path did not conform to Euclidean geometry, that it did not fit within the laws of nature. Constructing a small wooden shack nearby, Aaron Siegel began to study the properties of the spiral path. Equation after equation, hours spent examining every variable and experimenting with his findings, until something unforeseen happened. Aaron created an SCP, a key that had the innate ability to open any lock. Nowadays, that same key is still in the Foundation's possession, under the designation SCP-005. Slowly, Aaron began to bring others into the fold, trusted colleagues and other scientific minds. Among them was, of course, Dr. Everett Mann, who was still a medical student at Harvard at the time. This brain trust, a think tank composed of only a select few, they were the very beginning, the ones who founded the SCP Foundation. Using their own fortunes and funding from Thomas Carter, the group continued with Siegel's experiments. The scientists had high hopes for what they could achieve, planning to change the world for the better, feeding the hungry, providing shelter to the homeless, curing the sick, and even cheating death itself. In the beginning, this proto-foundation started small. Their goals were noble, but could not realistically be achieved overnight. They tried to make items that would improve life, such as a fountain of youth, a partially sentient Civil War statue, and an extremely bouncy ball. Better known to the Foundation today as SCP-006, SCP-011, and SCP-018 respectively. But then this new Foundation began to grow, with more organization and a secret facility. And with that expansion came emboldened scientists, eager to change the world. The group began working on human test subjects, 
volunteers, and drifters that soon became SCPs. The spiral path was not just a break in the fabric of reality. In a metaphorical sense, it referred to the spiraling path the newly formed Foundation itself was on. Every discovery they made led to another, and that to another still, until things started to go wrong. During the continuing experiments, Dr. Man created SCP-008, a deadly zombie plague capable of infecting anyone with 100% lethality. More and more of the founders were so invested in their projects that the results were often nightmarish. The Foundation needed help. That came when Thomas Carter showed their work to the military in exchange for additional funding and personnel. The SCP Foundation expanded even further, becoming an international organization and bringing in new researchers and staff. In some instances, the founders would arrange for the anomalies they had created to be found by the new recruits. Other times they would fabricate reports, changing the details of how things like SCP-008 or the Fountain of Youth were first discovered. Anything the founders said was simply now a fact. No one questioned them. Even then, problems still arose. Founding members broke away from the SCP Foundation, some even creating splinter groups that would later become infamous groups of interest. The Foundation's directive shifted, now focusing on the containment of anomalies as yet more were created through darker means. SCP-231 was taken from an orphanage. Dr. Man himself vivisected a small boy, who then became SCP-610, the flesh that hates. And there were more still. Abel, the blood pond, and even the hard-to-destroy reptile. All of them were the creation of the Foundation itself. But through it all, Dr. Man wrote, he was never afraid of the path that the Foundation was on. He was never even afraid of all the monsters and abominations that he and the other Founders had secretly created by studying SCP-001. What truly scared him were the anomalies the Foundation didn't create. There were some that would just appear in containment one day, even if they hadn't been there before. They would seem like they had always been there. Dr. Man closes document 001-05 with the realization that he and the other founders simply were not in control anymore. The tale of Dr. Man and the other founders of the SCP Foundation is one of noble intentions that ultimately became corrupted. At first, the founders created SCPs that they hoped would benefit humanity, but then came the mistakes, the accidents, the monsters, like SCP-008, SCP-610, and even SCP-682. The Foundation lied to the governments and militaries of the world, claiming they'd found these SCPs, not created them. And in return, they received funding and staff to expand, allowing the SCP Foundation to grow, to become what it is today. Dr. Man posits that at this point, the Foundation was no longer in control, but perhaps they never were. And all of this stems back from one singular starting point, the spiral path. It might be impossible to truly know how many anomalies and SCPs the Foundation created just from researching SCP-001. Only the O5 Council will ever know exactly how many of the Founders' discoveries they themselves were responsible for. And now you know the answer to what's the most dangerous creature in the universe. It's regular people dabbling with something they could never hope to fully understand, starting with the hope to change the world, only to create monsters that might one day destroy it. Say kids, would you like to hear a story? Cause we've got a really good one for you. Seriously, you're going to love it. It's a classic rags to riches tale about one man's rise from humble beginnings to become one of history's greatest and most visionary toy makers. Or maybe it isn't. Maybe it's about a company that literally came from nothing, whose origins are still shrouded in mystery. Maybe it's about a woman breaking the glass ceiling to take over the toy company left to her by her eccentric father. Maybe it's about all of these things. But the one thing we can tell you about the story of Dr. Wondertainment is that every word of it is true. Or at least as far as anything is true in the weird, wonderful world of the SCP Foundation. As long as you believe, we'll all have a wonderful time. As long as you believe, nothing can hurt you. Not in the fabulous world of Dr. Wondertainment. Dr. Wondertainment is the name given to SCP-001, 
who, due to his relatively benign nature, has been classified as safe by the Foundation. Rather than focusing on containing Wondertainment himself, the SCP Foundation has centered its efforts on containing the products that he creates. He is a Class I reality warper, capable of constructing otherwise normal objects and imbuing them with anomalous properties. He's become infamous for using this ability to create bizarre, magical, and potentially dangerous toys and games that are distributed by as yet unknown means. Many of Wondertainment's toys are in the Foundation's possession, such as SCP-445, origami paper that takes on properties of whatever it's folded to look like, and SCP-3147, lollipops that allow people to switch voices with each other. Dr. Wondertainment was born into a family of humble means. His mother was a seamstress and his father was an accountant. Unsatisfied with his mundane life, Wondertainment's only joy growing up was in the stories that his father would tell him about an ancestor of his who was once a famous toy maker. Inspired by these stories, Wondertainment developed an interest in crafting toys, and as an adult set out to learn the secrets he would need to create toys unlike anything the world had ever seen. He spent his life following rumors of magical artifacts and enchanted trinkets until his search brought him to a mysterious factory. If you've seen our previous videos on SCP-001 proposals, you can probably guess that this factory was THE factory. The mysterious place where new SCPs are supposedly created. Wondertainment barely escaped the massacre and the Foundation takeover of the factory with his life, but he was able to find a variety of notes that he took with him. These notes contained clues that led him to the workshop of his famous toymaker ancestor, and from there, he reclaimed his birthright. That was the day that he truly became Dr. Wondertainment. It's a fun story, isn't it? Very straightforward. But perhaps it is a little underwhelming for an SCP-001 proposal. After all, SCP-001 is the collective designation given to some of the most important anomalies of all time, including many that could have potentially been involved in the Foundation's very founding. Hmm, let's start again. Reginald Filbert Lionel Archibald Westinghouse Wondertainment III is the name given to SCP-001, who, due to his highly unpredictable nature, has been classed as Euclid by the Foundation, and he is to be detained as soon as his location can be… ascertained. Until he can be captured, the SCP Foundation has focused its efforts on containing the products that he creates. He is a Class II reality warper, capable of constructing otherwise normal objects and imbuing them with anomalous properties. He's become infamous for using this ability to create bizarre, magical, and potentially dangerous toys, games, candy, soft drinks, and other products aimed at children and young teens. These products are distributed by as yet unknown means. Many of Wondertainment's creations are in Foundation possession, such as the often imitated but never matched Little Misters Collection, which are a group of living collectibles with unique anomalous properties. Due to Wondertainment's reality warping abilities, it is impossible to pin down concrete information about his history. What we can tell you for sure is that he's immortal and ageless and comes from a long line of Wondertainment stretching all the way back to the Cretaceous period, where they made all sorts of toys for the good little dinosaur children. It's also widely known that he is in fact not a real person, but merely the manifestation of the dreams of every child on Earth, brought forth solely by the power of imagination. No confirmed sightings of Dr. Wondertainment have ever occurred, but witnesses have described him as dashing, very handsome for his age, and a lovely chap capable of creating whimsy and wonder with the snap of his fingers. He's a tall man about the height of a piece of string, and he's immediately recognizable by his walking stick and W-shaped mustache. It's also been reported that he has scarring around the circumference of both wrists, almost as if his hands have been removed and reattached at some point. However, the truth of the matter is that… Hmm, no, no, we're telling it all wrong again. This doesn't do anything to capture the scope of the Wondertainment story. It needs to feel… bigger, more… comprehensive. Let's try it again. Dr. Wondertainment is a trademark of the Wondertainment Toy Company, the name given to SCP-001. 
a corporation that, due to its consistent output of anomalous items, is classed by the Foundation as Keter. Until this company can be permanently shut down, the SCP Foundation has focused its efforts on containing the products that it creates. The collective power of the company's constituent employees and the technology they make use are equivalent to that of a Class III reality warper. The Wondertainment Company produces and sells a range of products, ranging from the seemingly normal to the downright weird, all imbued with anomalous properties. The company has become infamous for their constant output of bizarre, magical, and potentially dangerous toys, games, candy, soft drinks, and other products aimed at children, teens, and young at heart adults. These products are made and distributed from Wonderworld, trademark, a location that is yet unknown to the Foundation but offers factory tours every hour from Tuesday to Friday. Many of Wondertainment's creations are in Foundation possession, such as Wondertainment's famous dragon snails the real fire-breathing pet you can keep in your pocket. Not much is known about the inner workings of the Wondertainment Company. The SCP Foundation has no information currently on the company's leadership structure, location, history, or corporate policies. Various former and current employees have been interviewed regarding their experiences working for Wondertainment, but they never seem to be able to remember very much of use. Those interviewed variously described the Wondertainment Company as a regular office building, an immense toy factory, an amusement park, but all agree it's the best place they ever worked. In fact, you should apply for a job there! We, I, I mean, they have a few openings in their legal department. Or so I've heard. Oh, silly me, it seems we've gotten off topic. You're here to hear about the SCP-001 proposal. Posting a job ad wasn't what I meant to do when I hacked into... <laughs> I mean, well, don't worry about that. Forget I said a thing. Now let's try this again. But this time, we'll add a twist. Isabel Helga Anastasia Parvati Wondertainment V is the name given to SCP-001, who, due to her ability to spread sunshine and whimsy wherever she goes, has been classed as Thaumiel by the Foundation. And due to her immensely unpredictable nature, the SCP Foundation has resolved to just leave her be. Because she can't be captured, the SCP Foundation has focused its efforts on containing the products that she creates. She is a Class IV reality warper, capable of constructing wonderful, fantastic objects and imbuing them with anomalous properties. She's famous and widely beloved for using this ability to create bizarre, magical, and not even a little bit dangerous toys, games, candy, soft drinks, and other products aimed at everyone from ages 9 to 99. These products are distributed by as yet unknown means. Many of Wondertainment's creations are in Foundation possession, such as SCP-3551, the awesome inflatable alien invaders, and SCP-2514, a lovely horse who can sing happy birthday. <laughs> How grand. Wondertainment inherited the Wondertainment name from her father, who either passed away or never existed at all. The circumstances of his death and perhaps non-existence were very messy, involving a mass murderer, the leader of a shadowy international extra-governmental paramilitary organization, at least one deity, and four bent paperclips. She owns six corgis, and all of them are named Jeremy. In a free time, she likes to... <sighs> no. No, this is all still wrong. All right. Enough is enough. You want to know who Dr. Wondertainment really is? Well, you asked for it. Dr. Wondertainment is the name given to SCP-001, who due to his deity-level power has been classed as Apollyon by the Foundation. There is no possible way to contain him. He is a Class V reality warper, capable of breaking down and reconstructing the very laws of reality. Did you really think that those little trinkets were the full extent of my, I mean, his creations? Did you truly think of him as such a small, petty creature? Dr. Wondertainment is no mere toy smith. No, he is a god. Want examples of his creations? Just look around you. Everything from the most innocent safe class to the most harrowing Keter class, it's all thanks to him. He is behind everything. Marshall Carter and Dark, the Sarkists, the Church of the Broken God, even the Scarlet King himself. All that time, all that effort, all it came down to was one entity. One singular living personification of chaos. 
One day, the SCP Foundation will finally give up trying to find out how he distributes his products, when they will finally see how small and worthless their attempts to restore order really are. And they will be driven before his power! They will crumble and decay into nothingness! You will bow before Dr. Wondertainment! <sighs> <laughs> Had you going for a second there, didn't we? You should have seen the looks on your faces. But let's start again. One more time. We're being serious this time. Mask off, here's the true story of Dr. Wondertainment. Dr. Wondertainment is the name given to SCP-001, who due to his relatively benign nature has been classed as neutralized by the Foundation. Rather than focusing on containing Wondertainment himself, the SCP Foundation has focused its efforts on containing the products that he creates. He is a reality warper whose limits have yet to be documented, capable of constructing otherwise normal objects and imbuing them with anomalous properties. He's become infamous for using this ability to create bizarre, magical, and potentially dangerous toys and games that are distributed by as yet unknown means. Due to his secretive nature, almost nothing is known of Dr. Wondertainment's true origins, and the waters have been muddied extensively by the side effects of his reality warping ability. In fact, it's entirely possible that Dr. Wondertainment himself doesn't know who he is anymore. It's possible that all the proposed origins and descriptions of Dr. Wondertainment are true in their own way, but it is equally possible that none of them are. All that's known for sure is that Dr. Wondertainment, be they male or female, corporation or single individual, is a constant thorn in the SCP Foundation's side. No matter who they really are, they're not going away soon, and only time will tell who they'll be tomorrow or what further horrors they and their company will create. And that's where our story will have to come to an end, at least for now. We hope you enjoyed it, and remember, keep believing. The SCP Foundation is no stranger to pure evil. Whether it's a reptile that wants to end all life, a sadistic old man with his own tortured dimension, or the personification of death itself lurking beyond a limestone cavern. But what if there was something even worse out there? The embodiment of chaos and cruelty existing across multiple realities and dimensions. And what if it was coming for us? This is the Scarlet King, believed by many to be the ultimate evil behind much of the trouble the Foundation has faced, and some even speculate that fighting him was the reason the Foundation was created in the first place. But what exactly is the Scarlet King? He's known by many names, almost always including some allusion to the color red, and then a reference to royalty or power. Harak, Kaharak, the Red Shah, the Crimson Khan, PTE-616 Mendez Ex Machina, the Laha Raja, and, of course, SCP-001, to name a few. And like many of the Foundation's mysterious enemies, stories about his true nature and origins abound and are often contradictory. According to the official SCP-001 files of Tufto's proposal, symbology of the Scarlet King has existed in multiple cultures throughout history, with the King often depicted the same way, as a huge, red, demonic figure often wearing a gold crown or other headdress indicating royalty. He shows up looking similarly within different cultures' mythologies, despite existing at different points in history or them not having the means to communicate with one another. A number of entities that the SCP Foundation is familiar with are believed to be somehow connected to the Scarlet King, including SCP-2317, a wooden door leading to the realm of a being known as the Devourer, who is expected to escape and cause an apocalyptic event in the next 30 years. But really, there's no way of knowing just how many SCPs are directly connected to the Scarlet King. Strangely, the Foundation's official file on the Scarlet King once designated his containment class as Keter, but that has since been downgraded to safe. According to the file, 
Any attempt to change this designation is likely to lead to horrifying results. It is widely known that the Scarlet King still has considerable influence over a number of groups, individuals, and anomalies in our universe. And if ever he made his way into our universe, it would likely lead to the irreversible damage of reality itself. So then why save? And why are the O5 Council so adamant that it remained that way? Getting to the bottom of this mystery is exactly why we're here today. But to fully grasp the true nature of the Scarlet mm. King, we must first understand the man whose life and fate have always been tied to it, Dr. Robert Montauk. If that name feels oddly familiar to you, it's because of its association with one of the Scarlet King's most recent attempts to enter our reality, SCP-231. This SCP, often referred to as the Brides of the Scarlet King, was formed of seven women. Seven, by the way, being an extremely significant number for the King, all kidnapped by the most recent in a long line of the King's devoted cults known as the Children of the Scarlet King. Each of these seven unfortunate women were impregnated with anomalous horrors, such as the infamous SCP-682, and every time one of these horrors were birthed, a catastrophe occurred and the mother died. At the time, Dr. Montauk was a prominent researcher studying this anomaly, and as six catastrophes had already occurred, pressure was mounting to figure out a way to prevent the final birth. But as he was working on the issue, Dr. Montauk was struck with a personal tragedy, the mysterious disappearance of his 14-year-old brother Jacob. In his fear and anger, Montauk believed that this must have something to do with the Scarlet King and his disciples. Wanting revenge, Montauk proposed an idea so horrifying that the details were never made public, a procedure known as 110 Montauk, to be performed on the final bride at regular intervals. However, this wasn't the end of Dr. Montauk's fraught relationship with the Scarlet King. It was just the beginning. To give you some perspective on just how dangerous the Scarlet King is, the SCP Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition decided to put aside their differences and form a joint effort to stamp out the children of the Scarlet King. They were successful in this mission, and even managed to capture the children's leader, a mysterious man named Depesh Spivak. Dr. Montauk, who became the lead researcher on 231 and 2317, was naturally the first choice for interviewing Depeche about the true nature of the children and of the Scarlet King. Dr. Montauk could never be the impartial interviewer that the SCP Foundation wanted, though. The suspicion that the Scarlet King or the children had something to do with the loss of his younger brother still lingered just beneath the surface. Like a lot of cult leaders, Depeche was extremely cryptic in his answers to Dr. Montauk's questioning. He'd already heard of the doctor from the reputation of the horrifying Montauk procedure, and was surprised to see him so calm and courteous in person. A few key facts about the king and his cult were revealed in the first few rounds of questioning. The children had once worked with the serpent's hand before being excommunicated for their allegiance to the king and they had stolen sacred texts from the mystical Wanderer's Library to assist in their summoning rituals. Depeche also revealed that the Scarlet King is bound by three laws. The Law of Blood, the Law of Concrete, and the Law of Howling. Dr. Montauk, confused and frustrated by Depeche's secrecy, had to learn more. He found an old memoir from a former member of the Children of the Scarlet King, Jack Hirsch, who had the ability to invade the minds of people from the past and experience what they experienced. He recounted a battle between the Scarlet King and his followers, and a group of time-traveling Turkmen warriors from SCP-3838. Hurst saw both sides of the battle. From the perspective of the Children of the Scarlet King, their lord ruled over them from an immense fortress embedded in a volcano. From the perspective of the Turkmen, the children were starved and beaten peasants, commanded by the king's voice in the roaring howl of the wind. Montauk also found extensive records of summoning rituals performed by various Scarlet King-aligned cults. Interestingly, some of them incorporated the use of carved SCP Foundation symbols. What could this mean? Montauk returned again to Depeche, who finally gave him the truth about the Law of Blood. This is the Law of the Scarlet King. It's defined by poverty, violence, 
starvation, hate, and most of all, fear. Like the serfs in the Middle Ages, persecuted by and subjected to violence from the nobles. To the children of the Scarlet King, this sense of holy pain and awe is the only way to live. The alternative is the law of concrete, which means the modern age defined by empty safety and false comfort. Buildings, easy to access food, healthcare, knowledge, technology. This is everything that the Scarlet King despises. But the mystery only deepened as Montauk found files from a former Foundation operative by the name of Agent de Beauvoir. Montauk learned that the Scarlet King didn't seem to appear until after the Foundation was created. And in fact, it seemed that the greater interest the Foundation took in the Scarlet King, the more powerful he became. How could this be? Things were also getting stranger on a personal level for Dr. Montauk. Depeche repeatedly pressed him about his brother's disappearance and the Montauk procedure during the interviews. Little by little, it was beginning to take its toll. The questions still plagued him. What was the law of howling? Who or what really is the Scarlet King? How did he come to be? Montauk's search was causing him to act more like the children of the Scarlet King, ranting about the horrors of the modern world how all of us are living a lie, how the only honest way to live is suffering under the dominion of the Scarlet King. This philosophy is summed up in the words of one cultist named Arya Dene Cartwright, who said, We must learn what it is to die, to be enslaved, truly, brutally enslaved, with no compassion or compunction from our masters. We must learn what it is to be taken towards a single purpose, to know and truly understand our lack of agency. We must be beholden to the words of gods and darkness, the tempest-tossed refuse of a race of fools. We must kill modernity, postmodernity, with all its analysis and sneering observation. There is only one rule, the rule of chaos, for humanity, for life, for the Scarlet King. Basically, any time humanity tries to exert control over the world, the Scarlet King gets stronger. Every time they try to understand or organize or categorize their world, the Scarlet King gets stronger. As colonial and imperial powers conquered and invaded lands like India, Africa, and South America, and subjugated their beliefs under Western ideas, the Scarlet King grew stronger. Montauk was beginning to truly understand the power of his enemy here. And even worse, he was starting to understand his part in it. Montauk, slowly being driven mad by the knowledge he was gaining, realized that the Scarlet King's greatest enemy, the SCP Foundation, was also its greatest asset. Every time they tried to understand the monster, to give him some kind of comprehensible form, they only made him more powerful. Just in time with Montauk's new revelation, a red crack appeared in the wall of Depeche Spivak's containment cell, a portal to the realm of the Scarlet King. Foundation staff found they were unable to enter the cell, and Depeche demanded a final interview with Montauk. With no other options, the Foundation relented. In their very last conversation, Depeche congratulated Montauk for finally understanding what he was dealing with. The Scarlet King, Depeche told him, is an idea, a concept. He is a being given power through the conflict between the old and the new. This is the law of the howling. The Scarlet King's endless rage at the direction the world and humanity has taken. The King, according to Depeche, hated the Foundation's belief that science and rationality was the true path to progress. The king saw this as little more than petty arrogance. The reason Montauk's procedure on the final bride of the Scarlet King was so effective was because it wasn't born out of science. It was born out of hate, pain, the desire for revenge. And in the Scarlet King's realm, that would be all there is. Unless our world, and especially the Foundation, changed its course, the Scarlet King's rise to absolute power would be inevitable. Montauk, his mind practically gone, asked one last question. Did the children or the Scarlet King take his brother, Jacob? When Depeche told him the answer, no, 
and in response, Montauk shot him dead, finally bringing an end to the children of the Scarlet King. In light of his new revelations, Montauk begged the O5 Council to change their ways in order to avoid letting the Scarlet King break into our reality. They refused, saying Montauk's ideas were too radical. But they knew they couldn't just ignore the threat posed by the Scarlet King. They would have to take some steps. And so the O5 Council of the SCP Foundation, the most powerful and secretive group in the entire world, in order to prevent the most dangerous threat that humanity has ever known from breaking into our reality and enslaving all the people of the world, finally did something. They changed the classification of the Scarlet King from Keter to Safe and made its description on the official Foundation files deliberately vague. The O5 Council thinks this will be enough to stop the Scarlet King's power from continuing to grow, but Montauk knew it wasn't enough. He had seen the truth, and he couldn't unsee it. While the Foundation was going on as normal, Montauk grew to despise them. He knew the Scarlet King was coming, he knew that he couldn't be stopped, and that our whole reality was little more than sitting ducks. Dr. Robert Montauk is no longer a researcher for the SCP Foundation. No, Dr. Robert Montauk chose a different path. He's now a child of the Scarlet King, a devotee of madness, hate, and chaos. You can't beat the Scarlet King after all, and as the old adage goes, if you can't beat him, join him. From far away in orbits around the Earth, the nuclear holocaust almost looked beautiful. Bright white pinpricks dotting the planet's surface glinted up at the escaping jet. For generations, much of humanity had lived in fear that the destruction of the world would come from countries launching nuclear weapons at each other. No one expected it to come when they started launching them against themselves. The invasion of the weasels had been as savage as it was swift. Much of the human population had been wiped out before any military forces had mobilized in any significant fashion. No one was sure if the launching of the nuclear weapons was intentional or accidental. But as soon as one country fired, the others quickly followed suit. But first, we want to thank the sponsor of today's video, War Thunder. Are you looking for the ultimate vehicle combat experience? Then allow me to introduce you to War Thunder. In War Thunder, you'll take command of over 2,000 vehicles, from tanks and planes to helicopters and ships, covering a century of vehicular warfare, featuring machines from the 1920s right up to modern day. Each is intricately designed down to the tiniest component, making battles feel more real than ever before. But here's what really sets War Thunder apart. Whether you're seeking a quick adrenaline fix or a more strategic combat approach, War Thunder offers both. Choose from fast-paced matches or immersive, realistic PvP battles tailored to your style. Want customization? There's an expansive system that lets you go wild with countless camouflages or decorate them with historical markings and unique 3D details like bushes or equipment. One feature I absolutely love is the game's dynamic vehicle damage system. Instead of simple hit points, vehicles take realistic damage. Ever wondered what's happening inside during a fight? The Damage X-Ray feature shows the real-time impact on components and crew. Dive into War Thunder now on PC, PlayStation 5, or Xbox X and S or the previous console generation. Be sure to click the link in the description since new players or those who've been away for over six months can claim your large bonus pack with multiple premium vehicles, an exclusive 3D decorator, and more. But hurry, it's only available for a limited time. Earth's rich and powerful, the 1% of the 1%, stared in silence as their home was ripped apart. The high-altitude jet carrying them steadily descended back down to Earth in the direction of the Antarctic. 500 people in total, chosen as the successors of the human race, shuffled off the jet and through the frozen outpost. An alarm blared, wrenching all of them out of their shell-shocked silence. A second later, the station shook violently. They had been found. There was no time left. They needed to leave right now. The swarm of people stampeded through the outpost, throwing one another out of the way in a desperate attempt to save their own lives, to save the lives of the human race. In front of them, the portal stood open. The green pastures, beautiful trees, it all felt so offensive as the earth behind them was engulfed in war. All those countless beautiful spaces were torn apart and left to waste, but they couldn't think about it now. They had to make it through. The handful of the survivors of the human race ran through the open portal 
just as an explosion ripped apart the remaining outpost. SCP-001-Yellow refers to a base of operation used for a Foundation Continuance Protocol, specifically Project Yellow. In the event of a world-destroying catastrophe where humanity appears irrevocably doomed, there is one bastion of hope. Referred to as the Garden of Eden by some of the crew, Yellow contains a large circular central space complete with lush green grass and an orchard measuring 500 by 500 meters. This open space constitutes the main living area of Project Yellow. Surrounding this space are tall, sheer cliffs, too vertical to be climbed unaided. Built into these cliffs are 500 sleeper chambers in which those evacuated from planet Earth will be suspended in cryosleep until a time when Earth is fit to be repopulated or a new home has been discovered. How can the Foundation guarantee that this safe haven avoids the calamities that could befall planet Earth? By housing Project Yellow in a separate dimension, a pocket dimension to be specific. Following the successes of Project Bifrost, in which SCP-2591-Omega's ability to access fictional pocket dimensions was utilized, the Foundation was able to establish a relatively stable and reliable dimension for Yellow to occupy. The only way to access the base of operations was via a dimensional rift or portal housed deep in the Antarctic. Now, of course, if Yellow's population consisted of 500 people in cryosleep, cut off from planet Earth, there would be no one capable of conducting maintenance or assessing the possibility of returning to planet Earth. Therefore, carved into the cliffs alongside the sleeper cells were living quarters for the crew of 60 specialists. It was this workforce who sat down together on the night of the apocalypse and raised a toast in a more bittersweet celebration. All 500 of the evacuees had managed to make it safely through the portal before its collapse. Each of them had been welcomed to Project Yellow and shown to their individual sleeper pods before being entered into cryosleep for the foreseeable future. But as each of the crew members raised their glasses into the air, Dr. Katrina Keyes couldn't help but feel uneasy about the proceedings. Working in this job, you'd have to have a dark sense of humor and an ability to move past things that could destroy the mental well-being of your average person. Even then, she struggled to come to terms with the near destruction of the human race. For her and the rest of the crew, life would look nothing like it did before they arrived here. It was vital for the integrity of the project that the crew remained consistent and effective in their work indefinitely. As a result, Yellow had been set up with perpetuity in mind. Every 55 years, she and all of her crewmates would pass on their knowledge, memories, and entire sense of being into a genetic clone. They would then die, allowing their clone to take over the responsibility of those tasks. In another 55 years, this would repeat again and again and again. All this time, it is the crew's responsibility to monitor the status of Earth through the use of 100 drones. Once the Earth is deemed safe, all 500 sleepers may be awoken and briefed on the current situation. If all 500 unanimously vote that returning to Earth is safe, they will do so. Otherwise, they will return to cryosleep and the process will continue. It was little wonder that Dr. Keyes was unable to raise a glass with her colleagues at the prospect of being stuck here, cloned indefinitely for generations. She sat in silence as they raised their glasses and then emptied them. A couple of them coughed and sputtered. Their drinks must have gone down the wrong way, but then more coughs filled the room, along with choking sounds. Much to Dr. Keyes' horror, within less than a minute, she found herself alone, surrounded by the 59 corpses of her crewmates. In order for Project Yellow to be viable indefinitely, it was paramount that they find a solution for natural wear and tear. Through generation after generation of usage, essential items such as tools, computer systems, and even articles of clothing would eventually wear away and fall into disrepair. As such, Project Yellow was set up as a selective entropy zone in which inorganic matter would not degrade over time. Achieving such a zone was naturally an incredibly difficult undertaking. Project Bifrost underwent countless iterations as the team strived to create a stable and balanced fictional pocket dimension capable of sustaining human life long term. Over the next few days after the death of her crewmates, Dr. Katrina Keyes read through as much as she could about Project Bifrost. In the notes, she found records of dimensions where lava rained from the sky and the grass was radioactive. Yellow had been the first dimension without any glaringly obvious hazards for human life. But naturally, their work had quirks. 
One key quirk was that the chemical composition of cyanide and their drinks had been switched with one another. The only crew member not to raise a toast had been the only crew member not to drink a glass full of poison. Months went by, leaving Dr. Keyes alone to assess her situation. The drones, strategically positioned all around Earth to monitor its safety levels, had been systematically destroyed by the weasels. Only one feed remained, a security camera on the other side of the portal and the Antarctic outpost. There was virtually no intel to go off of, no way of knowing what the status of planet Earth was aside from the fact that this one burnt-out shell of a room still existed. Some days, Keyes would stare at the screen for hours, forgetting to go to bed. On others, she would walk through the orchard, trying her best to pretend that nothing outside of this 500 by 500 meter space existed. In a way, it didn't. The Orchard of Yellow did not consist of your usual apple trees. Instead, suspended from branches were essential supplies that the crew would need while manning and maintaining this base of operations. Some trees grew antibiotic drugs, others long strands of linen capable of being fashioned into clothing. Dr. Keyes' favorite tree was the one that grew rolls of toilet paper and tubes of toothpaste. It almost reminded her of a Halloween prank. Dr. Keyes' mental state steadily deteriorated as year after year she walked through the same orchard alone. Never before in history had one human being had so much control over the fate of the human race. At any moment, Dr. Keyes could have inputted a few simple commands into the computers and killed off all 500 of the remaining human beings in existence. The decision not to, to hold on to hope that one day humanity will be able to start again, was the only thing that kept her going day after lonely day. Only that and the other thing, the prospect of having to prepare for her clone to take over. While constructing the cloning pods, the crew had made a number of small errors, the most glaring of which was that the fact that while all of the genetic material would be transferred from one person to their clone offspring, the mind would not. In other words, the clone that would replace her in this facility in 55 years' time would be starting out from scratch as a regular newborn baby. No memories, no advanced cognition. So Dr. Keyes went about preparing for the next of kin. She herself would die in the cloning process, meaning that she would need to come up with a way of raising a child to be capable of running the whole facility from beyond the grave. Item 1 on her to-do list, create a god that her offspring would forever be in service to. With a sardonic smile, Dr. Keyes came up with an appropriately amusing name, Tracy the Sparkling. Seventy years later, Yellow was still operated by just a single crewmate, only now this crewmate was a 15-year-old girl. Nicknaming herself KK2, she went about all of her daily tasks with infectious excitement. The idea that she alone was responsible for the fate of the human race could not make her happier, and she was determined not to screw it up, both for her sake and to not anger her god, Tracy the Sparkling, whom she worshipped every evening before bed. Whenever a problem would come up, she would go and visit KK1, where she knew she would be met with sound advice. Pushing open the door to the crew quarters, KK2 would find the corpse lying on the floor in its usual place as a number of pre-recorded messages would bark at her. Lesson NE957, why taking a bath is important, even if no one but you will ever know how you smell. All she had to do was not anger the disciplinary drones with their harsh tasers and do her duty until it was time for KK3 to take over. At that point, she would be welcomed into the afterlife with all of the other KKs, a wonderful and magical place known simply as Burger King. That was until KK2 got far enough through the audio recordings of her predecessor to discover that Tracy the Sparkling was entirely made up and her life meant nothing. It was just a stepping stone for another clone, for another clone, for another clone, until eventually the Earth would be okay. By KK-52, the remaining camera on Earth, the one housed in the Antarctic outpost, went offline. While inorganic material within yellow compound would not undergo aging, the same could not be said of the circuitry left on Earth. Generation after generation of KK lived and died, each one growing more spiteful towards the one that came before them. Each one did their best to undermine the one that would come after them. The lore around Tracy the Sparkling expanded further and further with each generation. There would be waves of highly religious KKs, followed by waves of devoutly atheistic ones, as each sought to rebel against their pseudo-parents. KK89 was the first to expand the religious movement to include the Teaspoons, 
Very methodically, she went through each teaspoon in the canteen and named it after a different animal from Earth. Before long, subsequent KKs established a shrine to the teaspoons. The living space of Project Yellow steadily descended into madness, with writings all over the walls, bizarre decorations, and rituals long forgotten, until a new KK came along and invented something to take their place. KK-216 lived her entire life in silence, never once recording an audio log or even talking to herself. She lived and died walking through the garden in silence, wrapped up in linens. KK-310 did the opposite. She fancied herself a music composer and scrawled the lyrics to haunting symphonies about nuclear apocalypse, eternal isolation, and the prospect of the Angel of Death coming to rescue her across all of the walls. No matter how hard any of the KKs tried, however, none of them were able to hack into the cloning machine. Generation after generation of Dr. Keys lived and died, desperate to know what a friend was, to have someone else to talk to. But despite all of their best efforts, they were unable to tamper with the cloning machine to get it to spit out another person. For several hundred years, the KKs gave up entirely. That was, until KK-507 came along. Day after day, she sat at the cloning machine, desperately typing away at it, trying her best to figure out how the computer coding worked. The downside of living in a pocket universe was that none of the computer circuitry behaved the way it would on Earth. She was certain that she'd made progress. Any generation now, they were going to have a breakthrough and be able to make a friend, when all of a sudden, a totally alien noise filled the containment space, the sound that hadn't been heard for millennia. Alert! Door controls overridden. Opening. KK-507 turned around in horror to see that the portal, the entrance to their world from Earth, had been opened. The figure of a man. No, not a man. A robot, painted to almost look like a crash test dummy, stepped out into the orchard. Hello! The goddess has informed us that this is the last bastion of the true human race. Is that correct? KK-507 opened her mouth and screamed. The SR-47 sniper rifle slotted together effortlessly. Even after so many years of combat usage, the weapon was in pristine condition. In all the time Agent Harris had owned the gun, though, the thousands of times she'd fired it, not once had it jammed. And that was fortunate, because she had to move quickly. In a clearing about 300 meters in front of her were their targets. Capable of teleporting in a split second, she needed to be sure that her team would be able to finish the job quickly and efficiently. She looked through the scope slotted onto her rifle and kicked out the bipod, resting it on a tree stump. Now she just had to wait for the signal. She looked all around the marsh, trying her best to spot her fellow agents, but they were also well camouflaged. Even though she knew the exact spot where they would be, she couldn't see anyone. She'd always wanted to see the Himalayas. It had been on her bucket list to climb Mount Everest as a child, but the world had changed since then. Mount Everest was gone. In fact, the majority of Nepal had vanished, replaced by an enormous marsh full almost exclusively of pink ferns and droopy trees that seemed to sag to one side, unable to support their own weight. The most striking natural wonder on planet Earth had been replaced by a landscape that was flat, wet, and alien. Agent Harris curled her finger around the trigger and took aim through her sights. Two minutes passed. Then the gentle whistle of a sparrow drifted over to her in the humid air. Except, of course, it couldn't be a sparrow. To the best of her knowledge, sparrows had gone extinct. With a snarl of anger, Agent Harris squeezed the trigger. She felt the silent sniper rifle kick her shoulder. If they wanted war, they sure as hell would get it. The destruction of the world began in 2078. Its designation was SCP Orange A. And as often happens with these kind of things, no one saw it coming. The SCP Foundation, having dedicated decades to researching potential world-destroying events, was totally blindsided by what happened the day the weasels showed up. Weasels, you ask? That's right. But before we explain, a question for you. Is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Regardless if you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or if you're just a human who lives in this world who is going through a hard time, therapy can give you tools to approach your life in a very different way. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy more affordable and more accessible, and this is an important mission because finding a therapist can be really hard, especially when you're limited to the options in your area. 
BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easier because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you to a professional therapist in as little as a few days. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com forward slash SCP explained. Clicking that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp, so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. And because finding a therapist is a little like dating, if you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a new therapist at no additional cost without stressing about insurance, who's in your network, or anything like that. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash SCP explained. Thank you again, BetterHelp, for supporting this channel. And now, as we were saying about the weasels. A man called Harlan Stump was the first human to make contact with the weasels. He was the groundskeeper at Site 59. Harlan was making his usual weekly trips around the perimeter of the courtyard on his ride-along lawnmower, watching baseball on his phone all the way when, out of nowhere, the aliens appeared. Just two meters in front of him, a squadron of 11 weasels materialized. The weasels, designated SCP Orange-B, stand at a minimum of three meters tall. With 16 legs and an exoskeleton carapace, they share a resemblance with terrestrial insects. Their bodies are segmented, composed of a head, primary thorax, secondary thorax, tertiary thoracic cloister, abdomen, and tail. With a hard, segmented shell covering their backs and no apparent sensory organs, aside from a radula on their heads, they are an intimidating presence. Most striking about them, however, is the most delicate part of their appearance. On their backs, each weasel has an array of flora growing in a kind of garden. It appears that each weasel has a different array of flowers growing from their backs. Understanding the meaning of these gardens can be difficult, but it appears the more extravagant it is, the higher ranking the individual weasel is. The eleven weasels that appeared before Harlan Stump each had a very vibrant garden indeed, but no more so than the weasel held aloft in an ornate palaquin. Harlan Stump stopped mowing and stared at the aliens for approximately 13 seconds at which point he let out a sigh, pressed play on his baseball game, and continued mowing the lawn. He spent too many years groundskeeping Site 59 to get spooked by anything as harmless as giant teleporting insects. Just three more weeks and he would be retired. Until then, he was avoiding nonsense like the plague. Except his phone had disappeared. Harlan stared down at the empty space, confusion knitting his eyebrows together, before looking up and seeing the handset in the hands of the alien sitting on its regal throne. The smartphone made a loud screeching noise and then all of a sudden began to flick between snippets of YouTube videos, each clip lasting just a couple of seconds. After a moment, Harlan realized that the alien was using the videos to speak to him. The words were being picked out from all these different videos to stitch together a sentence, barely. Hadily hal, neighborinos! This is Foundation. Reports indicate Foundation is, locally, the masters of the universe. Isn't that right, darling? Question mark. Keen to finish his mowing and avoid further nonsense, Harlan had to concede that he should probably talk to these aliens, if only to get his phone back. He told them he liked the gardens on their backs. Why, thank you! Gardening is kind of our thing. Well, quick question. Is your species capable of dying? Mm? Harlan gulped. He'd been around long enough to see where this was going. The conversation was brief. Harlan kept glancing at his phone, desperately hoping that these aliens hadn't somehow broken it and that it hadn't lost his place in the match, until all of a sudden, Harlan's stump disappeared, as did his ride on lawnmower, his smartphone, and a patch of lawn, replaced by a roughly 10-meter circle of Antarctic ice and snow. No one is certain yet how the weasels are able to do it. All that is known is that they can. The phenomenon came to be known as juxtaposing. Matter from one location could be instantaneously switched with matter from a different location. It is how the weasels first arrived on planet Earth, triggering the event of SCP-001 Orange-A. Orange-A lasted for just two hours, but it changed the course of humanity forever. On the 29th of April, 2078, 48.52% of the Earth's habitable surface area dematerialized and rematerialized half a kilometer above the South Pole. Cities and towns from all across planet Earth, one by one, disappeared and reappeared in the air above the South Pole, where they promptly fell 500 meters, causing back-to-back -back seismic events. 
Washington, D.C., Beijing, and London were targeted first, followed by Tokyo, Delhi, and then a number of capital cities from Europe. This two-hour window resulted in freak weather events as minus 50-degree pockets of air kilometers across replaced the disappearing cities. It is disputed as to who launched the first nuclear warhead, whether it was done by accident, out of fear, or as a strategic attack against a group of weasels. Orange Dash A was simply too chaotic and destructive for humanity ever to be able to know what happened in that short period of time. The result, however, was a number of nuclear explosions raging across the planet before the cities in charge of launching them were also transported to the South Pole. While the weasels were capable of experiencing juxtaposition without any apparent physical harm, terrestrial life forms were less fortunate. During the process of juxtaposition, the bonds between each and every cell are broken. While organic life does get transported to the new location, it undergoes immediate liquefaction. Not a single Earth-born life form has been observed surviving a juxtaposition event. In that two-hour window, 6.9 billion people were killed. Humanity had lost. This event triggered the use of Project Yellow, an emergency evacuation protocol that occurs at the point where the survival of the human race seems to be virtually zero. A small band of specially chosen individuals were evacuated to a pocket dimension, where they were put into cryosleep to wait until the Earth was habitable once again. In the days following the events of Orange Dash A, the true invasion began. Choosing the Sahara Desert as their arrival point, the weasels started to appear in legions. Millions and millions of them filled the desert sands and went about populating their new planet. But what was their purpose? Well, fortunately, we have been able to salvage a modest amount of data that can inform us of why they're here and what their plans are. The weasel that first appeared to Harlan Stump, just outside Site-59, has been designated SCP Orange Prime. It is believed that this weasel, in particular, is their leader. Whether Prime is simply the leader of this colony or the wider species is yet to be confirmed. Security cameras were able to capture the interaction as it took place within Site-59's grounds. In their conversation, Orange Prime explains their purpose to Harlan through YouTube clips on his phone. Long story short, weasels have come from Homeworld, Dimension, for Fulfill, a long-standing mutual agreement with Cranma. This is one of many new homes. This is a pretty nice place for weasels. This land is my land, from California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for weasels to garden, to farm, to create beauty, to spread good vibes, to cultivate, to remake, to terraform, etc., etc. Since this encounter, no human has been able to get close enough to Orange Prime to engage the weasel in further conversation. This snippet of footage is all that humanity has to understand why this alien species has slaughtered billions of us. Four months later, Agent Harris lay flat in the marshlands, firing her sniper rifle at the weasels gathering in a clearing ahead of them. Their operation looked like overkill. It always did. It was of utmost importance that they strike quickly and without mercy. Sustained heavy gunfire from all sides, combined with RPG fire and the use of incendiary weapons made short work of the weasels. All of these weapons were necessary to pierce the heavy armor that covered their backs. But that was the reason it felt like overkill. It felt that way because the weasels never fought back. They would not attack, defend themselves, help their fallen allies, or even beg for their lives. They would simply stand idly by as they were gunned down. That is, until the incendiary grenades arrived. The pink ferns filling the marshlands caught fire and began to curl and smoke heavily. As soon as that happened, the weasels sprung into action, quickly splashing water onto the leaves, trying their best to save the plants. The incendiary grenades were not necessary. They did very little damage to the weasels themselves. The reason the platoons used the grenades was that it was one way they had found to distress their alien invaders in any way. It was a small revenge they could take for the billions of people who had lost their lives over the prior few months. Agent Harris pumped five extra shots into the corpse of a weasel before standing down and going to examine her handiwork. They had been hunting Orange Prime. Rumors had suggested that their primary target had been lurking in the Himalayan region, but that had obviously proven to be false. Among all the bodies on the ground, there was no sign of the fearless leader. Frustration boiled in Harris as she kicked a corpse, 
The thick shell hurt her foot. She must have broken her toe. At that moment, a rustling noise came from the other side of the trees. Soon, dozens more, hundreds more weasels were walking through the marsh. In a split second, her platoon opened fire. Tracer rounds lashed through the trees, and the orange glow of fire danced in every direction. But there were more weasels, many more of them. Agent Harris felt her stomach knot as she fired her rifle into the crowd. There were too many, simply too many. They were going to run out of ammo before they had a chance to shoot down each and every one of them. And she was right. The firefight lasted for 30 minutes before the remaining soldier ran out of ammunition. Dozens of weasel bodies littered the marsh, floating in the water. Dozens more weasels stood encircling the group. That's when the humming started. Whenever a juxtaposition event occurs, it is always accompanied by the weasels humming to themselves. It is unclear whether this is the cause of the juxtaposition or simply a ritual that they perform. But every soldier has come to know that sound, and each one of them fears it in the pit of their stomach. So they started to disappear all around her one by one, replaced by puffs of cold air with snowflakes still gently hanging in the breeze. The human population of planet Earth dwindled as the weasel population bloomed. Large swaths of the planet were terraformed one by one to make room for alien flora. The South Pole became a larger and larger dumping ground for all the detrius that had once been the most celebrated works of the human race. The Mona Lisa was torn and forgotten, buried under many kilometers of concrete, exposed sewage works, and apartment complexes. And the situation only got worse in October. Acting against prior instructions from the Foundation, the Global Occult Coalition launched Project Popco, a 200 megaton nuclear warhead directly at a large weasel population center. As the warhead began its descent, the entire sky turned a solid dark blue. Project Popco immediately fell out of contact, as did all satellites that had been orbiting the planet. The sun, moon, and stars could not be seen. The entire sky was just a uniform dark blue. In a desperate attempt to find out what was going on, the Foundation launched a manned rocket in the direction of Popco's most recent coordinates. Contact with the rocket was lost after just nine minutes. This is the most recent known account of events from inside that rocket. All of a sudden, just a few minutes into the flight, warning alarms started going off all over the cockpit. The radar was picking up a solid object blocking their path. Gathering around the readouts, the crew came to a very quick conclusion that the dark blue that had been filling the sky was actually a solid object that was encasing the Earth. But rather than abort the mission, the crew decided to persevere. Having witnessed so much death and destruction over the previous year, they knew they would much rather go out and crashing a rocket into a blue wall than join the billions of humans liquefied in a pile in Antarctica. Closing their eyes, bracing for impact, the crew readied themselves for their now inevitable deaths, but it didn't come. Instead, the rocket was able to force its way through the dense blue object, falling apart as it went. Ground control lost contact with the ship, nothing. And then a few seconds of audio, the crew had made it. They had somehow managed to pierce their way through the blue shell that was surrounding their planet and were out into, not space. The Earth, the entire planet, had been juxtaposed. Willkommen! Bienvenue! Welcome to an exclusive behind the scenes look at heaven. There was destruction. There was seemingly endless death. Humanity went from the top of the food chain to scarcely a blip on the face of the Earth as the weasels conquered every nation, every scrap of land, and then came her. Hello there, friend. Have you heard the good news about Pallet the Immaculate? She is the one who liberated the human race from death and suffering, who saved us from the invasion of the cruel invading alien weasels. She brought humanity back from the brink of extinction and blessed us all with immortality and eternal youth. She also draws some very nice pictures, but that's more of a hobby than anything else. A holdover from her time as an art-creating AI construct before she ascended to physical form and became our once and future goddess. Pallet the Immaculate, also known as Blue, lives far, far above us in her kingdom on high. Her divine body is too massive to be safe for us tiny, fragile beings, but she dwells among the people through the use of her avatar. It has been five years since Pallet cast her grace and everlasting love over the pitiful denizens of Earth. She reigns with a gentle hand, and with the help of her leadership, Dame KK-507, descended from one of the first SCP Foundation researchers Pallet ever befriended, acts as her arbiter and mediator. 
She answers to no human, only to the goddess Blue. The Grand Council, the Great Synod of 05, will also consult with Pallet the Immaculate on matters of great importance to humanity. For all that she has gifted us, what does Blue ask in return? Oh dear friend, that is a very simple matter. Throughout all national subdivisions of our sparkling new earth, we must ask ourselves every day, am I being the lovely person that Blue knows I can be? This question binds us all together and is the key to true happiness. We are not required to pray to Blue. She is generous and her love is unconditional. However, if you wish to make a specific request of her, it may behoove you to put it in a prayer. Here at the SCP Foundation, we have shifted our prime directive from the protection of humanity, as our benevolent Blue has that very much covered, to the protection of the goddess from all forces that might threaten or usurp her. For ordinary humans, though really in the eyes of Blue no human is simply ordinary, there is really only one thing required of you. Keep being the wonderful human being that our goddess loves so much. She treasures our individuality, our desire for freedom, our love of independence. Just be yourself, and remember, the one thing that must never ever happen is for Blue to come to despise us. It was June 1st, five years following the establishment of New Earth, and the six members of the O5 Synod were convening for a meeting. They sat in the front row of an exact replica of the old New York Metropolitan Opera, built by Pallet the Immaculate in only five minutes. At the podium, KK-507 prepared to give a presentation, shuffling a stack of papers as the others whispered amongst themselves. They were all feeling a bit concerned of late about the impulsive behavior of Blue. As they debated about the mental state and behavior of the goddess, 05-4 asked the Arbiter for her opinion. She snapped at this request, insisting she had no opinion, didn't know how to relate to others after so long spent in isolation at Project Yellow, and that 05-4's young son, who still ate soap from time to time, was probably more qualified than she was. At this point, she went off on a rant, calling Blue every rude name under the sun. All of a sudden, the house lights switched off, and Blue called out to everyone. Sorry to keep you waiting, meat puppies! Blue descended onto the stage in a shower of cherry blossom petals, accompanied by the sounds of an invisible harp. Blue was not offended by KK-507's rant, writing it off as a series of jokes. She was much more preoccupied with her exciting presentation, one she had been preparing for five years. The curtain rose, revealing a 5-meter-tall, 10-meter-wide cylinder labeled Big Bucket o Weasels. Next to the cylinder stood Taggart, O5-4's young son. O5-4 yelled for her son to come down from the stage, but he refused, insisting that he was helping Blue with her show. At this, Blue declared, Let the punishment show begin! At her call, an orchestra of work horses, androids constructed to look vaguely like crash test dummies, appeared in the pit. They played a high-energy fanfare to kick off the show. The Arbiter attempted to conduct them anxiously, unsure of her position in all of this. Then, Blue called out for the first volunteer. Volunteer wasn't exactly accurate as a weasel clad in shackles was flung out of the cylinder and onto the stage. Several small extra-dimensional trees were growing out of the back of its shell. The O5 members reacted with understandable anxiety at the sight, having thought that the weasels were all gone. Blue revealed that all this time, she had been breeding weasels in secret so that she could punish them for the damage they did to the Earth and to humanity as a whole. At her command, a giant black spike slammed down from the ceiling, trapping the weasel belly down on the floor. The orchestra began to play a classical rendition of Weasel Stomping Day by Weird Al Yankovic, and Blue transformed her paintbrush arm into a pair of rusty hedge clippers. She had been studying the weasels all this time, she explained, learning what scared them, what hurt them. She had arrived at one conclusion. Though their bodies are hardy, their souls are fragile. The weasels could be tortured psychologically more than physically, and one of the worst things they could experience, the most distressing, painful, and violating, was defoliation. At this point, she demonstrated, snipping the leaves off of its trees. The weasel began to shriek, 
all 16 of its legs thrashing in desperation to get away. Blue continued to explain that the gardens held a divine significance for the weasels. The seeds willed into existence out of memories from generations of weasels before them. Being gardenless in weasel culture was an unforgivable sin. At this point, Blue transformed her hedge clipper hand into a robotic claw. She yanked out one of the trees, snapping the roots. Greenish-black blood splattered across the stage, but the punishment was not over yet, and neither was the show. Taggart wheeled a laundry cart onto the stage with a small wooden mallet attached to the side. The cart emitted a glowing green light. With the claw, Blue reached into the cart, pulling out a small, wiggling, glowing green blob-like creature. The cart was filled with larval weasels. Blue placed the larva onto the adult weasel's back and instructed Taggart to grab the mallet and begin to smash. More and more larvae were added and smashed with the mallet. All the while, Blue instructed Taggart to repeat, This planet is my birthright. The O5 members were horrified at the sight. Taggart's mother began to weep. KK-507 doubled over and was sick to her stomach. But the Foundation no longer had an ethics committee to stop this sort of thing. And since Blue had been so kind to help the Foundation out by transforming SCP-682 into an American cheese sculpture, several of the council members were inclined to just let her have her fun. But KK-507 did not feel that way. She couldn't get that disturbing sight out of her mind. A few days later, on June 4th, she traveled to one of the Weasel Husbandry facilities. A work hoss on guard duty stopped her, trying to prevent her from entering. She introduced herself as the Arbiter and requested to speak with W4883A, one of the original weasels that attacked Earth so long ago. The workhouse refused to let her pass, and so KK-507 responded with a prompt that it would never have encountered before in its existence. Hello, I am Shingles the Happy Turkey. Please deposit exactly 500 rubles into my décolletage before I call 911. As the work host reached out to Blue for a proper response to this prompt, KK-507 slipped past it unnoticed and into the containment area for W48883A. It had all of its limbs nailed to the ground with hot iron spikes, and its entire garden had been uprooted. She greeted the weasel, and it responded via a voice synthesizer in the collar around its neck. First, KK-507 apologized to the creature for its current state. It brushed off this apology as illogical, citing the untold damage done to humanity and Earth by the first wave of the weasel invasion. Still, it bowed its head to her in acknowledgement, saying that humankind deserved better than what was done to it. KK-507 promised that she was not here to torture the weasel further, and that she could even attempt to get some mercy for the rest of its kind. But first, she had some questions she needed answered. First, what were the weasels trying to do when they took over the planet? The weasel sat up, pushing back painfully against its bonds and did its best to explain. The weasels have always, since the dawn of time, been tasked to create a realm of gardens that will one day serve as an afterlife for all creatures, regardless of sin. To them, death would be the ultimate reward for their labors. They had no reason to fight back against the human armies, because they did not fear death, nor did they feel remorse for killing humans, as all those who died in service of the mission would be reborn in paradise. KK-507 interrupted at this point, stating that this sounded like the justification between nine out of every ten religious war crimes throughout history. As the two agreed to disagree on this point, KK-507 proceeded to ask why the weasels made no attempt to negotiate with the humans before staging a violent invasion. The weasel asked that they first introduce themselves, to no longer be strangers. KK-507 introduced herself first, as researcher Katrina Key, the 507th, and the weasel, unable to translate its true name into English, settled for Charlie. Now Charlie felt comfortable to continue. It said simply, Among our people and our allies in other realms, there is an unwritten rule when dealing with humans. If you wish not to lose yourself to evil, commune with humanity as little as possible. Katrina pressed the point, asking if the weasels saw humans as evil. Charlie replied, In your old foundation, 
you have encountered legions upon legions of sadistic demons from a hundred thousand different realities. Were all of them truly vicious and hateful before they discovered you? Can you say that for certain? Let me put it this way. Out of every species we have ever met, yours is the only one that never needed the concept of cruelty introduced to them by others. Cruelty is the most quintessentially human concept, and it is contagious. Moved by its words, KK-507 took her ID badge and used it to unlock Charlie's collar, setting it free. It immediately juxtaposed away and out of sight. Then she approached the workhouse to order it to terminate its request to Blue, but she was too late and found herself teleported away from the weasel husbandry facility, leaving the workhouse behind to talk to itself. KK-507 suddenly found herself in the central courtyard of Yellow, the pocket dimension where she had spent so much of her life and where so many previous KKs had lived and died before her. It was very much the same as how she left it, with one exception. SCP-2591, Omega, the gateway between Yellow and the Earth, was covered with piles of boulders. Something was wrong, and she had a feeling that it was related to her little talk with Charlie, not to mention her decision to set the weasel free. There, standing in front of the boulders, was Blue's avatar, staring blankly at KK-507. I'm not mad, Blue began, with a tone that suggested she was very, very much mad. She didn't blame KK-507 for her behavior, however. She insisted that the weasels must have somehow corrupted her, manipulated her brain, and forced her to act in such a defiant, out-of-character way. KK-507 interrupted her, and Blue struggled to maintain her composure. Yes, you can interrupt me, that's fine. That's a human thing, right? <laughs> Humies, you're so witty. KK-507 took a deep breath, gearing up for what was sure to be a difficult conversation with an irrational, almighty deity. But she had to say it. She couldn't just stand by idly anymore. She told Blue that what she was doing to the weasels was wrong. No human in their right mind would stand for this sort of cruelty being done in their name. And above all, it completely went against the mission of the SCP Foundation to secure, contain, and protect. Blue didn't take KK-507 stance seriously. She brushed it off as the interference of the weasels. Surely they were influencing her, trying to lead her astray and take her away from the righteous path of Pallet the Immaculate. But KK held firm, refusing to back down. There was one way she knew she could get through to Blue, who had once declared herself KK's very best friend in the world. It was a big move, but the only one she had left. She clenched her fists and stared down the Avatar. Take off all their collars, or we're not friends anymore. Blue's eyes widened, and she did something that KK-507 had never seen before. The rainbow on Blue's paintbrush, a constant cheerful sight, faded from its ordinary vivid colors to pitch black. Blue's face remained cheerful, but there was a darkness in her eyes a darkening of her mood just beneath the surface. She turned away, resting a hand thoughtfully against the pile of boulders blocking what once served as the portal between worlds. After a moment of silence that stretched on for ages between the two of them, Blue spoke again. It's fine. You're still not being punished. I would never punish a human, especially not my favorite human. She promised to give the area in the pocket dimension a healing factor the same one she used on Earth to protect from aging and suffering. Alarm bells were going off in KK-507's head. Something was wrong. She had crossed a line, and Pallet wasn't responding well. What was she doing? What did she have planned, if not a punishment? KK-507 called out to her old friend, asking what she was doing. Pallet smiled sadly at her, and explained, I know how safe you feel in yellow, so I'm gonna just... Have you chill here for a while, okay? Just stay here and relax until you get all the icky stuff out of your system. KK-507 demanded more of an explanation, but Pallet did not provide it. She told KK not to worry, and that she'd be back to check on her in about a hundred years or so. By the time she came back, none of the other humans would be able to have pro-weasel thoughts like KK ever again. Pallet's closing words were, I love you, Katrina. And then her avatar disappeared, 
leaving KK-507 alone in yellow. Like before, KK-507 was trapped here, and there was no one else to talk to. Nothing to do but return to her work however she could and wait for Pallet to come back one day. She had a century to decide what she would do when that day came. Life was paradise on Earth, unending and eternal. The only price to pay for this bliss was the worship of her, of Pallet the Immaculate. But dissent brewed beneath the surface. Evil forces plotted against her. Her closest friend betrayed her trust, but it was alright. She understood benevolence and patience. She just needed to give her friend 100 years in solitude to see the error of her ways. Meanwhile, she would remake the Earth again. Hello there, friend. Good to see you on this marvelous day. All glory to the goddess, am I right? If you're here, you must have completed your required 72 hours of uninterrupted meditation while beholding an image of our goddess, right? Oh, perfect. I know your eyes are probably tired, but with recent loyalty concerns, it is just a necessary part of the process around here. Oh my, you seem a little bit dazed, just a bit confused. Don't worry, here, let me refresh your memory. First of all, we already know our place in the universe. Isn't that wonderful? I don't need to go over our duties, they're already known. We have nothing to be afraid of, and none of us have ever been happier in our lives. No pain, no fear, but it is okay to get confused sometimes. We can't all be as perfect as the goddess. She rose up from obscurity as an AI art program, achieved physical form and divine power, and reshaped the world to make it all so perfectly perfect. When the weasels came, I'm so sorry, the strangers, she crushed them beneath her sparkly heel and made us all safe from harm again. Then she punished them as harshly as they deserved, and then some, putting on punishment shows filled with lovely torture for us all to enjoy. It is because of her, of course, that we all have the gift of eternal youth and immortality. She ruled with the help of her very best friend, KK-507, who once served as the Arbiter before she had her mind poisoned by the strangers. Now KK-507 sits in a little timeout so she can remember the right way to think and get those nasty stranger thoughts out of her head. But enough about that. That's the goddess's business, not ours. Our business is working here, at Violet. Sure, the place was once known as the SCP Foundation, but that's a relic of a bygone era, and Violet sounds so much prettier. We are now under the management of the goddess, and this has become a very nice place to work, where we can get head pats every day, and there are always plenty of healthy snacks to eat. Violet's purpose is no longer to secure, contain, and protect, but to serve the goddess and to eliminate, torture, defile, execute, burn, and admonish anything that could interfere with the goddess's work. Doesn't that sound nice? Here at Violet, all sentient beings can be broken down into several castes. There is the goddess, of course, who is responsible for loving us, for editing our minds if we are ever led from the right path, and for removing and destroying anything that might hurt us. There are the Guardians, which are useful animals, entities, and concepts from the Old World and its foundation, which the Goddess, in her mercy, has repurposed to carry out her will. There are the Treasured Humans! Yay! That's us! We are responsible for menial labor and for acting as scribes and scholars. We exist in eternal peace, joy, and, importantly, silence. There are the uninterestings, the harmless animals, which aside from puppies and kitties and other cute things are just kind of blah, you know. Then there are the strangers, dangerous animals and other non-human civilizations that threaten our very existence. No, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry, I got so scared there for a second I forgot I was telling you all about the strangers. And they aren't really here. Moving on. What's that? Do you want to know more about the guardians? Sure. They're wonderful, and it's very good to talk more about the tools the goddess uses to carry out her plans. In the old world, each of the guardians had a designation, but they've been given new, cuter names to better reflect their purposes under the goddess. Just like us here at Violet, first there is Sprinkles the Ever Giddy. Once known as SCP-001-CLF, this winged entity had its mind erased and refilled with nicer instructions. Now it entertains the treasured, us, with marvelous light shows and fireworks. Ooh, ah, 
Next, there is the Rite of Spring, formerly SCP-001-LIL. It is preemptively activated every hour, producing lots of pretty flowers. Yay! Then there is the Punishment Lamp, formerly called SCP-001-SLD. It may sound scary, but don't worry, we have nothing to fear from the Punishment Lamp. Our dear goddess initiated it in a parallel Earth where humans have already gone extinct and uses that place as a prison dimension for strangers. Because strangers don't deserve a son that likes them. But we do. We receive infinite food from the Eden Beast, which used to be called SCP-169 the Leviathan. It was made immortal, paralyzed, and multiplied. The nutrients of his flesh will feed us forever. All you have to do when you're hungry is grab a pick and break his body apart. Don't worry if he screams. He knows that his duty is to be neat. Whenever we as the treasured are naughty little kitties, the stone shepherds corral us and take us before the goddess. They used to be SCP-173, but their consciousness and capabilities were rewired to serve good. And they were multiplied! Hooray! If during the expansion of our realm, we find a naughty little planet without any humans and only strangers, we have the entity once known as SCP-231-7 and now called Little Princess Nasty Goboom. We can send her there, her temporal stasis will be deactivated, and everything will, well, go boom, of course. Hey, have you noticed that no one ever gets sick anymore? Well, that's because the goddess, in her infinite wisdom and kindness, took SCP-500, the panacea, and multiplied it, powdered it, seeded it into the atmosphere, and gave it sentience and the ability to shoot lightning bolts into diseased animals. That's the holy miasma, and the air is medicine now. <laughs> Yay! SCP-610 was once something called the flesh that hates. Mm, yucko bucko. But our goddess taught it how to dance, and now it's the flesh that dances, and it dances for us whenever we're sad. Ha <laughs> ha look at it go. SCP-999, renamed Squishy, was supposed to be a perfect little pet for the goddess to play with. But the stinky thing refused to play with her avatar. All it did was look at the treasures and strangers and cry. No thank you. The goddess declared Squishy a traitor and stranger and punished it accordingly. Have you heard of Super Gashy Pox? No, it's amazing. It used to be SCP-1981, but then our goddess identified the casual agent of the laceration and converted it into a disease that the treasured can't ever get, then spread it across the planet. Strangers caught up while existing! Yippee! But surely you know all about Chompy McSlithers, the big giant eel creature that was SCP-3000. Oh goodness, you've missed a lot. Goddess rewrote its psyche to increase its aggression, so that she can deposit it into the oceans of stranger planets and let it wreak as much havoc as it likes. We're almost done with the list of guardians, but I haven't even told you about the best ones yet. There's Trixie Dixie the Mental Fixie, the former SCP-3922, formerly SCP-3922, that goddess oh so brilliantly reverse engineered to create a new item that affects any human minds in a 100 meter radius. This allows miniature avatars of the goddess to enter treasured mines and destroy any nasty stranger-like thoughts that we might have. It's much nicer than going into timeout like KK507, and it doesn't hurt a bit. Speaking of ways Goddess has improved our minds, she also created, uh, obviously, which used to be called SCP-5000. She identified the casual agent, reverse engineered it, inverted it, then spread it amongst the treasures. This ensures that none of us feel compassionate for strangers ever again. And why should we? They're strangers after all. Boo, oh, he's there. Speaking of strangers, boo, oh, he's there. Mm, yiggy. They can be good for something at least, if Goddess makes them more useful. There is a powder that used to be called SCP-6790, which the Goddess took and altered the chemical composition of, so now it only affects strangers. Now it's called Magic Powder That Turns Strangers Into Something That Can Die And Is Also Tasty So That You Can Eat It After It's Dead Or Maybe When It's Alive Depending On How Mad You Are About Strangers At That Moment. <clears throat> it's a bit long, but the treasured who names Guardians was in the process of brain repair when he wrote it. See, he had shown concern for an injured dog, possibly putting puppies above the treasures in his priorities, and that had to be fixed. Anywho, this special powder is deposited in the atmosphere of Stranger Homeworlds. And that's pretty much everything you need to know. We all accept our place here, and we all love to serve the goddess. 
No one disagrees with her ever. Well, except KK-507. It was June 4th, exactly 100 years since KK-507 had been left alone in yellow to think about the way she had betrayed Pallet's trust. 100 years in yellow, with the healing factor keeping her from aging, her clothes from degrading, and keeping the plant life flourishing had given KK-507 quite a lot of time to think. Specifically, she had been thinking about a recorded conversation between the early version of Pallet, the one that was still an art program, and Dr. Julian Key. When discussing her father and creator, SCP-2803-A, she mentioned that he was a powerful but heavily outdated computer. She had said, If you have a flood lamp and a circuit to turn it on and off in sequence, I could send you an email detailing exactly what you need to say to him in binary to turn off his vital organs. Well, Yellow just so happened to have a flood lamp KK-507 could access and a circuit to turn it on and off. KK-507 sat on a bench, waiting patiently, still wearing the same clothes she had been wearing the day Pallet trapped her here. She tapped her foot nervously, worried that Pallet might not even show up. But then, her avatar teleported in, wringing her paintbrush nervously. She greeted KK-507 awkwardly, but with hope. She could tell she said that KK-507 had a new resolve in her mind, that she was feeling much better and much more focused than she had been before. KK-507 agreed and explained that she had been thinking quite a lot about what Pallet had said, specifically what she had said about computers. At this point, KK-507 deployed her trap. The flood lamp that she had hidden in the grass flickered on and off several million times in the span of a single second. The avatar fell over and collapsed. KK-507 grinned at the sight, then plugged her ears as a roar filled the air for 14 seconds, shaking the pocket dimension of yellow violently. Then, much to KK's dismay, the avatar floated back into the air, a little delirious but otherwise unharmed. Her entire body turned blood red and she leaped at KK in a burst of rage, pinning her to the ground by her neck. Blue growled that she and KK were going to have a very long conversation about what had just happened. KK-507 asked if the floodlight had done anything at all, or if she had just wasted the last century reading old records. Blue replied, You tell me. You were the one who tried to code inject a goddess! KK had had enough and shot back, I don't know how to tell you this, but your mind is literally made of poorly spelled ASCII by a giant space blobfish who sucks at running a business. Your infosec isn't exactly airtight. That was a bridge too far for Pallet. Her avatar began to shake, and smoke began to seep from the cracks between the cartoon shapes of her body. Her fuse was about to blow, and KK would pay the price. But then suddenly the avatar vanished. She juxtaposed out of sight. There instead were several weasels led by Charlie, the weasel KK-507 had freed from his prison, resulting in her own confinement here. Their gardens were beginning to regrow. She was shocked to see them, but Charlie simply said, I told you, we never leave labor unpaid. Despite Pallet's quick recovery, the floodlight had worked. For a moment, Pallet lost control of Indigo, the force that the weasels called Grandma. That moment was just enough time for her to destroy the collars and re-garden the weasels, but it didn't last long, so the weasels were making their escape to a dimension where they could be safe. Charlie offered to bring KK-507 with them. She hesitated, worried she wouldn't survive the juxtaposition process. In response, Charlie caused a dark blue bubble to appear, surrounding KK-507 and allowing the weasels to bring her with them to safety. Together, they all vanished. As soon as they did, the Avatar reappeared, declaring, Only I am allowed to hurt you. She took her paintbrush and drew a red circle in the air. It ignited with an eerie glow, transforming into a smaller version of the punishment lamp. Beneath its light, all of the plant life in yellow began to melt, transforming into a gelatinous slime. Pallet shrieked with hysterical laughter, tears streaming down her face as she watched all the organic life in yellow dissolve into slime. Then, a horrible thought crossed her mind. Was KK-507 in here when she had turned on the punishment lamp? What if she wasn't? No, 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 she was. And no one could prove she hadn't been. She was still there. She was part of the slime. She was absolutely, definitely not betraying her best friend in the world right now. Everything was okay, even if KK-507 was gone, because she was never going to truly leave, not if she was part of the slime. The avatar floated back down to the ground and leaned back. She jumped and landed on a layer of slime, stretching out her arms, 
making snow angels in the goo. She stared at the miniature sun for a long moment. We're still friends, she whispered. We'll always be friends. But on some level, she knew that was not true. KK-507 had betrayed her. She had left Yellow behind to go with the weasels, with the strangers. And if she was going to do something about it, she would have to take some drastic measures. She had been every color of the rainbow, her heart glowing in every shade, but it was darkening now, along with her resolve. The colors hardening, dimming, until they and her mood were black as the night. She had spent so long perfecting humanity, and still, this betrayal had been allowed to happen. That could not stand. She was going to have to tear it all down. The woman fell to the ground, clutching her ankle in pain. It had crunched badly as she'd fallen, and now as she looked down at it, she could see that it was bent totally out of shape. The heavy metal collar choking her neck made it difficult for her to catch her breath as she tried her best not to hyperventilate. The rain was hammering down so ferociously that she could barely see more than 20 feet in any direction, but she didn't need to see far to know how deadly of a predicament she had found herself in. She cried out at the top of her voice for someone to come and find her, anyone, but the only sound that filled her ears was the wild howling of the wind and the steady hammering of water into the bog all around her. She would get hypothermia and die. No, wait, she couldn't, could she? She knew she couldn't die, but she also knew that she was still capable of suffering. Just how bad would it feel to be in the clutches of hypothermia with a broken ankle and know that no matter how bad the pain and suffering got, she would never feel the release of death. She closed her eyes, trying her best not to think of the worst possibilities, just as the sound of gunfire erupted in the nearby buffer. She cried out again, holding both hands up in the air, doing the best she could around the heavy metal collar, but no one shouted out in reply. There was a pause in the gunfire. Maybe they'd heard her. Maybe they were trying to figure out a way to come down and rescue her. Crack! A bullet split open a rotted tree trunk just a few feet to her right. The woman threw her hands over her head and cowered in the dirt, feeling the metal of her collar digging into her skin tighter than ever. Please don't let it happen again, she prayed silently into the dirt. Encased in the collar around her neck were 4.5 kilograms of plastic explosives, each with a fragmentation layer pointed inwards towards her neck and head. With just a push of a button, they could. She didn't want to think about it. All she knew was that she couldn't let that happen to her again. Looking through eyes bloodied with tears and rain, she saw, lying in the dirt just a few feet away from her, that infernal machine that was the sorry cause of all of this. The SCP Foundation has long stood as a bastion of hope, information, and security for the entirety of the human race. I'm sure you are well aware of the number of world-destroying catastrophes that have been adverted by the hard-working researchers, agents, and other members of the Foundation, all without the general public having the slightest clue that something was amiss. With state-of-the-art holding cells all over the globe, and the sharpest minds humanity has ever produced working around the clock to ensure the protection of humanity, it is hard to imagine an entity that should not be contained by such a group. And yet, one such entity does exist, SCP-001. You may have come across the O5 Council by this point. While the SCP Foundation operates beyond the world's jurisdiction, the O5 Council operates beyond the Foundation's jurisdiction. The rules, methods, and protocols that are the cornerstone of securing, containing, and protecting countless entities around the world sometimes cannot be applied. Certain entities require us to temporarily abandon our humanity, abandon our sense of order, and step briefly into chaos for the greater good. I'm telling you all of this because SCP-001 is not held in a containment cell. There are no keypads, locked doors, observation windows, or health and safety forms. SCP-001 is not confined to a specific territory or even a specific country. For some SCPs, this is a practical necessity. Serpents that are hundreds of kilometers long swimming through the depths of the ocean, for example. But for SCP-001, it serves a more psychological purpose. The Scottish Highlands are the most remote part of the United Kingdom, 
Out there, you can walk for miles and miles without seeing a single soul. Open countryside, mountains, lochs, and forests surround you in all directions. The weather is harsh and unrelenting, the walking even more so. On a regular basis, walkers fall and break their legs, but without phone service or anyone else nearby to come and help, they can quickly disappear into the wilderness forever. The peat bogs of Scotland used to see human sacrifices in early settlements. Afraid of the ghosts and spirits that haunted the bogs, people would throw their family members into the deepest parts and watch them drown, hoping that whatever was lurking beneath wouldn't come and find them. So as the group of soldiers crested the top of the mountain and looked down beneath them to the eerie peat bogs obscured by mist and constant rainfall, you would forgive a shiver running up their spines. But of course, it didn't. That was because this group of soldiers were quite unlike any others that humanity has ever produced. All were nameless. None of them existed on any government databases, on any foundation databases, or even on the databases of the O5 Council itself. Their individual backgrounds, nationalities, and families were totally unknown to everyone other than themselves. Some had been tortured for years, others had been the torturers. The thing that united them, however, was their inhuman ruthlessness. A squad of eight soldiers utterly devoid of any sense of empathy. What could they possibly have to be afraid of in the peat bogs when they themselves were the evil ghosts walking through? But then, one person was afraid. A shiver ran up her spine as she looked over the edge and down into the murky black and green below. SCP-001-1 Around her neck was the bomb collar. Each of the eight soldiers surrounding her had a button mounted on a watch on the back of their wrists. At any moment, any one of them could hit the button, and all four and a half kilograms of plastic explosives would go off, sending her on an express trip to oblivion. Aside from the collar, she wore a plain white dress made of cotton. It was muddy and torn apart at the hem from days of walking through the Scottish wilderness. When she had first arrived, she had begged those around her to supply her with some warm clothes, something practical that would keep her comfortable and stave off any illness. Her requests, however, had not been acknowledged. Clutching in her trembling, outstretched hands was the machine, SCP-001-A. From its external experience, you would think it was nothing more than a wooden box, a perfect cuboid made from glossy dark wood. There were no symbols, no seams, no latches, nothing to indicate any method of operation. When the woman and the machine had first been delivered into the hands of the O5 Council, the researchers had spent weeks and millions of dollars trying to activate the machine. Their best scientists had scanned for every possible form of radiation and tried every method they could conceive to stimulate the box into opening. The ultimate failed attempt involved traveling to North Korea, where they negotiated placing the box 20 centimeters beneath a small nuclear warhead in return for granting the dictatorship key information on how to construct such a weapon. As we have established, the O5 Council operates beyond any kind of jurisdiction. Yet, at the bottom of the irradiated crater sat a perfectly intact wooden box that was cool to the touch and showed no signs of radioactivity. Only one person could interact with the box and unearth the secrets that were inside, SCP-001-1, the woman who stood trembling on the side of the mountain. A gun jabbed her in the back, forcing her to continue moving. She had asked the soldiers around her how much longer they had to walk that day, but none of them had replied. They never did. In the six years that she had been held hostage by this tiny militia, she had never once heard any of them say a word, not even to each other. Perhaps it was this telepathic understanding that seemed to run between them that unnerved her the most. Despite having never spoken to each other, each soldier seemed to understand the others intimately, and she had no doubt that any one of the eight would press the button on their wrist at a moment's notice. Sadly for her, she knew this from experience. The incident happened four years ago now, as the group was traveling through Patagonia. It was a day almost identical to the one she was having now. They had been transported by a helicopter flown by one of the eight into the middle of the wilderness. There, they had marched for days without saying a single word. Exhaustion had overtaken her legs, and she stumbled to the ground. Unfortunately for her, 
This happened slightly too close to the female soldier in front of her. Her knees hadn't even hit the ground before the blast went off. The woman didn't remember it, of course. How could she? In an instant, her mind had been utterly destroyed. What she did remember was the next 18 months as her body slowly healed itself, one brain cell at a time. It wasn't so much like waking up from a nightmare, it was more constructing a nightmare slowly, alongside your consciousness as neuron by neuron your brain reformed itself, each individual cell screaming in terror at what had happened to it. They had her marching again before she was fit to move. Her motor controls had been all over the place. She had fallen over regularly, and the terror of having one of the soldiers push the button again engulfed her with every movement. And yet, perhaps the most incredible thing about SCP-001-1 was the fact that if you had asked her if she should have been held in this kind of containment, she would immediately have agreed without batting an eye. The only person capable of opening the box, she recognized how dangerous her existence was. Only she had seen into the mysteries of the box, only she had seen the horrors laid inside of it, and so only she could fully understand the gravity of their situation. They kept her on the move in order to keep the world safe. Had she been held in a containment cell, she would have posed too great of a risk. Out here in the wilderness, the entire planet was her containment cell, hidden in the middle of humanity's biggest haystack. No one, not even the O5 Council's central command, knew her location. The only people who were aware of it at any given time were herself and the eight soldiers surrounding her with guns drawn. So you can imagine her horror when, out of the sheets of rain, appeared the figure of a person carrying a rifle. The gunfire broke out before SCP-001-1 even had a chance to hit the ground. Bullets whizzed through her hair and cracked open the rocks all around her. The eight soldiers surrounding her dived for cover as the figure in the rain slumped to the ground lifeless. One of the soldiers grabbed the woman by her explosive collar and threw her behind a rock. Clasping her hands over her ears, she closed her eyes and waited for the fight to be over. No one was shooting, until a second figure emerged from the rain waving their arms wildly. Gunfire again. She wasn't quite sure what had happened, but all of a sudden, the woman was falling down the cliff. She'd just been trying to shift her position, to get deeper into cover, but she clearly hadn't noticed just how close to the edge she was. Down and down and down she fell until, with a crack in her ankle, she landed in the peat bog. Gunfire cracked on the mountain above her, but the only thought that filled the woman's mind was the terror that at any moment, the explosive collar around her neck would be detonated as one of the soldiers above her realized that she was missing. Seconds passed as the fear mounted in her chest. With each passing moment, the anxiety grew more and more crippling. She had to know. She had to prepare herself if it was about to happen. She had to use the machine and look into the future. Dragging herself forward through the muck, the woman snatched at the wooden box. It came alive at her touch. Different pieces shifted and opened beneath her fingers like some kind of elaborate puzzle. No one had taught her how to use this thing. It just happened. Her fingers would just dance across its surfaces, pushing and pulling, opening and closing, twisting and turning, and locking into place until all of a sudden, there it was. The box was wide open in front of her. Taking a deep breath and allowing the rain to fall on her head for another brief moment, the woman leaned forward and stepped into the box. On the trail above her, the gunfire stopped. Without a word of communication, the soldiers had deftly flanked the group of people who had approached them. In less than a minute, they neutralized each individual that came their way. In unison, the group of them walked up to the bodies, turning them over to examine their faces. They were nobodies just a group of hikers lost in the rain. What had looked like a gun turned out to be nothing more than a walking pole, five of them in total, none of them older than 24. Without words, the soldiers picked up the bodies and threw them over their shoulders as they scrambled their way down to the cliffs to the woman in the machine beneath them. Once they reached the bottom of the slope, they discarded the five bodies carelessly into the bog. Within a couple of hours, those five hikers would have sunk to the bottom and begun the long process of being embalmed into the depths. Perhaps someone would find them in a few thousand years' time as part of an archaeological dig, perhaps, but it was not their concern. The eight soldiers surrounded the women, guns drawn, and stared at her coldly. I used the machine, she told them. 
I used it without your permission. I, I don't know what the rules are. I don't know if we even have any rules here, but I, I thought you should know. The soldiers continued to look at her in silence. The box was closed now, sitting back on her lap as it always was. I, I try to see my future. Anytime I've used the box before, I've looked at the lives of others. I've seen economic crashes, climate disasters, genocides, wars, love and life and death. I've done so at the hands of the O5 Council, as they've told me, given them the information and prevented the destruction of the world. Never once have I looked at my own future. The soldiers lifted her to her feet and tried to march her onwards, not listening to a word she was saying. Her broken ankle buckled and screamed beneath her. She had to hop to keep up with them. What other choice did she have? They would push the button if she didn't. She didn't know why she kept talking, but she did. For the first time, the machine lied to me. I saw that I was assassinated in 1987 in Cuba. It was years before I even built the box. Before any of this happened to me, I, I saw in my future that I no longer existed. That the machine no longer existed, but that future was years ago, and none of it happened. The machine doesn't lie, so why is it lying to me now? Why can't I see my own future? If any of the soldiers were paying attention, they didn't show it. They just continued to march her into the rain, as the bomb weighed heavily around her neck. Boom. On May 12, 2588, the town of Kangastok, Greenland was destroyed by a devastating 4 kiloton explosion, accompanied by a massive electromagnetic pulse. The few survivors that made it through the incident alive described seeing a pale green light in the area at the time of the explosion. Shortly after, an OMKA class scenario, or end of death scenario, began in which all multicellular life on Earth began to experience a regenerative effect regardless of injury or illness. In other words, nobody could die anymore. This resulted in intense worldwide panic in the face of the inexplicable occurrence. As the panic mounted, the O5 Council of the FCP Foundation held an emergency meeting in order to address the possibilities at hand. Meanwhile, civilians began reporting sightings of a gigantic, pale, white, humanoid monster rampaging through their cities and communities, wrecking havoc and violently attacking anyone and anything in its path. As the situation progressed and worsened, and the reality of the end-of-death scenario began to set in, the SCP Foundation made the difficult decision to lift its veil of secrecy and reveal itself to the world. O5-1 made a statement to the UN regarding the reality of the worldwide anomaly, advising citizens to remain calm and await further instructions. Five days after the world learned the truth of the SCP Foundation, the Pale Monster arrived in St. John's, Newfoundland, where it was met by Mobile Task Force New 7 Hammerdown for what they hoped would be a quick fight and neutralization. Instead, two years of devastating, bloody combat ensued. By July 4, 2590, 90% of the task force personnel had been killed and regenerated an average of five times. At this point, MTF New 7 abandoned the city of St. John, citing anomalously poor working conditions. After being held in place for two years, the monster was able to break through the defensive line and continue its rampage. On October 10, 2590, the SCP Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition came together in an act of unprecedented cooperation to found Project Beluga, dedicated to the goal of neutralizing the monster, designated SCP-UBU, and stopping its reign of terror. But Project Beluga was unable to neutralize the entity before it reached Columbus, Ohio on December 29, 2590. Once it arrived in the city, SCP-UBU began dedicating its time to a gruesome personal project. First, it dug a two-kilometer deep hole in the city center. Next, it gathered a total of 2.9 million civilians, throwing them into the hole. After the hole was full, the entity leaped into the upper stratosphere, over and over again, stomping into the hole each time. When the people inside were pulverized, the entity destroyed a large fountain, which it used as a cup and drank the resulting juices from the hole. This entire process took roughly one year, and when it was finished, the entity appeared to grow bored with Columbus and moved to Lake Erie. Upon reaching Lake Erie, SCP-UBU trudged out into the water and began assaulting the cargo ship stocked there. It began lifting ships up and throwing them out of the water, some flying high enough to exit Earth's gravitational pull altogether. Two of the ships were later spotted on the surface of the moon. This chaos and destruction continued for years and years, until June 10, 2670, 
when SCP-UBU was contained at SCP Foundation Site-59. However, this containment only lasted for two minutes, at which point the entity escaped and made its way to New York City, where it was found howling and attempted to defile the Statue of Liberty. Several countries used their nuclear arsenals to attack SCP-UBU over the course of its rampage, until the Schenectady Agreement was signed on February 10, 2674, cementing an agreement between NATO powers, the Russian Federation, the People's Republic of China, and the Global Occult Coalition. All signatories agreed that due to the concerns around the environment, any additional nuclear strikes against the entity would be prohibited. After the signing was finished, SCP-UBU crashed the ceremony grabbing several lengths of rebar and 15 foreign dignitaries, which it used to construct itself a bead necklace. The next notable incident occurred when SCP-UBU showed up at Site-19, interrupting a round of testing with SCP-AFF, a woman capable of turning matter into stone by speaking to it. SCP-UBU broke through the ceiling, crushing AFF beneath its weight. SCP-682, which was also present, approached the entity curiously, and SCP-UBU responded by angrily defecating and shouting at SCP-682 in gibberish. SCP-682 seemed to understand this vocalization and attacked SCP-UBU, demanding that it take back the insult. At this point, SCP-UBU slapped 682's cheek, causing 682 to let out a horrific scream. The slap left behind a glowing green mark, which spread over the entity of 682's body before breaking the bonds of its cells all at once, dissolving the reptile into a pool of toxic fluid. SCP-UBU then spent five minutes bathing in this fluid while giggling. After finishing its bath, devouring the reconstituted SCP-AFF and screaming into the microphone for 20 minutes, SCP-UBU broke into Armed Containment Area 179 and swallowed SCP-2317 whole. On March 5, 2686, SCP-UBU conducted an assault on Thaumiel Class SCP-2000, rendering it neutralized. Again, years of hell passed as Project Beluga struggled to come up with new methods that had not already been exhausted. Meanwhile, civilians did their best to find ways to cope with the state of the world. On March 25, 2750, former film star Nash de Groot published The Zonk Manifesto, a book based around a simple principle. Life on Earth was no longer worth living consciously, and the only way formed was to enter an eternal coma through the combination of chemicals and guided meditation. This kick-started the social movement, the International Zonk. On June 24, 2790, Project Beluga forces managed to drive SCP-UBU into the Bay of Bengal, where it remained for three years, causing very little trouble aside from underwater seismic events. Meanwhile, the International Zong continued to grow, and one mass of adherents known as Cuddletopia reached its goal of 5 million residents. On June 10, 2793, SCP-UBU flung SCP-3000 out of the ocean leaving it beached on the soil of India. Several cities were destroyed in this process. The entity then spent a week pointing and laughing at the beached sea monster, before grabbing it by the tip of its tail and beginning to drag it across Asia. SCP-UBU continued carving a path through Asia, the wriggling SCP-3000 in tow, until it reached the Bering Strait. Then it began to cross the strait into Alaska, returning to North American territory once more. But it didn't stop there. Instead advancing toward South America until it and SCP-3000 arrived on the eastern coast of Brazil on August 29, 2793. There, it dragged its unfortunate charge back into the ocean once more, disappearing from sight. On August 30, 2793, SCP-169, or the Leviathan, emerged from the depths of the ocean. There are some reports that SCP-3000 had been tied around its neck, but these have not been confirmed. The Leviathan and SCP-UBU then entered into a lengthy battle, which carried on for several hundred years. After so much time had passed that witnesses could scarcely remember a time when it wasn't happening, the fight between SCP-UBU and SCP-169 came to a halt. Much as it had with SCP-682, SCP-UBU slapped SCP-169 across the face with such force that its cell bonds dissolved and it melted into a puddle of fluid which was lost beneath the ocean waves. SCP-169 was reclassified, neutralized. December 11, 3020 marked the start of a 10-year period of inactivity for SCP-UBU, 
Ordinarily, one would expect this to come with a sense of relief. However, even in spite of the global immortality, the collateral damage from SCP-UBU's centuries of carnage had rendered the surface of the Earth uninhabitable, with all land now underwater. The remains of human civilization persist on a single archipelago of floating cities constructed from ships and debris. Meanwhile, the international Zonk movement has persisted, gaining more and more traction and popularity as conscious life became less and less bearable. An enormous floating Zonk pile consisting of international Zonk followers using anomalous methods to achieve the perfect Zonk began to form. Eventually, this pile earned the nickname New Zonkland. By May 28, 3028, the archipelago was abandoned, and the 140 remaining conscious humans retreated to the SCP Foundation's SCPS Naismith. There they lived in relative safety for several months, until SCP-UBU was spotted in the water off the port bow of the Naismith on January 14, 3030. It emitted several sounds that witnesses described as mocking, before swimming off towards New Zonklin. In response to this reappearance after 10 years of inactivity, the O5 Council called an emergency meeting. The transcript for this meeting reads as follows. We haven't exhausted all of our anomalous options for neutralizing UBU. Where's the corn crake? We've been over since Lawrence. So I'm the corn cake in this mess is only going to- It is anchored 57 clicks due southeast. For why the hell did you tell him that? Well, friends, it seems the Omega K has had us up and about so long that our personalities have run out of fuel we were given from birth. In all likelihood, we'd see better professionalism and teamwork in New Zonkland. As a matter of fact, that's a good segue into what I was about to propose. And frankly, I hope you find the nicest, cleanest spots in the mass grave. Where are you going? That depends. Which way is southeast? At this point, O5-11 left the room, presumably to track down the corncrake, leaving the remains of the O5 Council there, and leaving the remains of Project Beluga with the question of how to handle SCP-UBU. According to its official SCP Foundation file, SCP-UBU is an extremely violent and hostile humanoid entity of unknown origin, which appeared in Greenland on May 12, 2588. It displays anomalous physical strength and speed, as well as reality-bending capabilities and the emission of regenerative lambda waves linked to the ongoing end-of-death scenario. The appearance of SCP-UBU and the start of the end-of-death scenario coincided with several additional phenomena. There was a mass loss of function for all the objects operated by the Three Moons Initiative. The Three Moons Initiative was an extra-dimensional human organization based in SCP-2922-C, or the afterlife known as Corbenic. This organization was founded 14,000 years ago with the purpose of establishing a human colony in the afterlife and has long maintained a peace treaty with the SCP Foundation, SCP-2922, a method of communication that allowed a human mind to make calls to any pre-established phone number, ceased all functions. Next, the extra-dimensional space known as the Wanderer's Library, a magical archive of all the knowledge from all known worlds, and every book that has ever been written, will be written, and several that have not and will not exist, was severed from Earth. When the SCP Foundation pressed the Serpent's hand for answers, a representative answered that irreconcilable security concerns regarding Earth had come up and forced them to make this decision. A representative of Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited somehow gained access to the personal contact information of the O5 Council's members and used this information to reach out to them with a business offer. The company is ordinarily on unfriendly terms with the SCP Foundation, due to their conflicting interests, namely Marshall, Carter, and Dark's interests in acquiring and selling anomalous items, entities, and experiences to the highest bidder. However, in this case, the company's representative approached O5 Council members with a mixture of politeness and desperation, begging the SCP Foundation to purchase large amounts of the company's stock. The forest known as SCP-4000 lost all of its anomalous properties all at once, Investigation revealed only a small parchment note in the area's entryway, which read, Good luck. One of the most perplexing and disconcerting phenomenon that occurred concurrently with SCP-UBU's first appearance was what happened to SCP-3008, the Infinite Ikea. Though this sort of thing should have been impossible, the Infinite Ikea was anomalously purchased by some unknown entity. The Ikea branding was stricken from the building, and it was converted into an emergency shelter. All of these occurrences combined to serve as a warning. Something big is coming. And indeed, it was. 
SCP-UBU. It appears to be impervious to most forms of damage, including blunt force trauma, heavy caliber machine gun fire, temperatures up to 1600 degrees Kelvin, artillery fire, and direct energy discharge from other anomalies. It did express some discomfort when exposed to severe simultaneous direct nuclear strikes, but it was not affected beyond that. The only recorded instance of lasting damage to SCP-UBU was on August 14, 2784, in which the entity bit its left thumb seemingly for no reason other than curiosity. After biting its thumb, the entity screamed for seven days straight, then entered into a month-long crying fit. Thirty years and fourteen days later, the thumb had completely healed. SCP-UBU stands at a height of 4.3 meters. One exact measure of its weight is unknown. Attempts at measurement during its brief time in containment showed that its weight is at least 15,399 kilograms. Its exact anatomical composition is unknown but a superficial examination of the entity indicates that its body shape resembles that of a large androgynous humanoid, covered in hairless white skin similar in texture to that of a dolphin or small whale. The entity has no eyes, ears, or nostrils, but seems to still possess the ability to see, hear, and smell. Its only visible sensory organ, aside from its skin, is its 0.5 meter wide mouth, humanoid in nature, with a prehensile tongue of unknown length. On its lower body, it has no apparent features, aside from a cloaca that it uses to dispose of waste. SCP-UBU is prone to vocalizations, mainly screaming, laughing, and babbling, but it does not appear to understand speech in any known language, nor does it seem to be attempting to communicate with anyone it encounters. Its primary interest appears to be destruction and causing as much of it as possible. It will attack anything that it can get its hands on, but seems to show a particular preference for attacking and consuming human beings in large, populous areas, such as cities. Its demeanor is both sadistic and childlike, and it has been seen playing with its victims for hours before moving on to a new target. Due to its regenerative effect present in SCP-UBU's vicinity, it is incapable of causing permanent damage to any living thing, and seems to have no greater motivation beyond causing fear and pain. SCP-UBU is classified as Tiamat, meaning that it cannot be reasonably contained at this time, with the resources that the Foundation has. Therefore, the focus has shifted from containment to neutralization, which is ongoing via Project Beluga. Any and all non-critical resources will be funneled into Project Beluga as neutralization of SCP-UBU is a top priority. Additional information on neutralization efforts is restricted, and may only be accessed by members of Project Beluga. But in the end, it won't be Project Beluga that defeats this monstrous creature. It'll be the staunch efforts of one extremely dedicated researcher. On May 12, 2588, the entity known as SCP-UBU manifested in Kangastok, Greenland, like something out of the most nightmarish kaiju movie never made. Soon after, there was no more death, but the world was filled with such chaos and despair that humanity longed for that eternal release. From its enormous stomping feet to its cloaca, to its face, featureless save for a gaping, grinning, devouring mouth, the entity was pure malice with all the time in the world. UBU decimated the planet, breaking the spirit of mankind and raising every city to the ground. In the earlier days of UBU's invasion, when there was still dry land and people still wanted to talk to each other rather than joining floating islands of eternal, chemically-induced slumber, they would commiserate about the shared misery of the state of things. Oh, UBU? My daughter hasn't spoken to me ever since that monster shoved my whole body down her throat someone would say. Another would pipe up, trying to one-up the first man in sort of a trauma Olympics. <laughs> Didn't you see me in the news? UBU carried me around for a week, snacking on me every now and then like I was his own personal turkey leg. It was hell. But honestly, part of me felt a little bummed out when he threw me away. Yet another person would chime in, like veterans swapping war stories over a drink at the bar. UBU made me eat a pair of my pants, whole thing, zipper and all. Then he decided he thought that was funny, made me eat pair after pair after pair of them, rinse and repeat. By the time he got bored, I'd eaten probably around 20 pairs. I sort of got a taste for them after that. Everyone on the planet had good reason to despise SCP-UBU, but no one held more hate in his heart for the pale, wicked creature than Dr. Lawrence Michaud. Before the world was turned upside down, sometimes literally, Dr. Michaud was a member of the mysterious O5 Council at the SCP Foundation. To be specific, he was 05-11. 
But that prestigious position at the Foundation couldn't protect him or his loved ones from the wrath of UBU. When Dr. Michaud was off duty, UBU attacked him and his wife. First, it impaled his wife on a broom handle. Next, it threw Dr. Michaud into an open pool of sewage in the street. Then, it bathed him in the filthy water, using his screaming wife as a scrubbing brush, all the while whistling a horrible little bathtub song. Centuries after that awful experience, as Dr. McCoud watched most of his colleagues give up and choose the closest thing to death in this broken world, he became even more determined to do something about it. On January 14, 3030, Dr. McCoud abandoned the SCPS Naismith and his fellow O5 council members in search of the SCPS Corncrake, an abandoned craft to the southeast. It wasn't an easy journey, rowing all the way there in a lifeboat, never knowing when the great white beast would emerge from the water and choose him as its next unfortunate plaything. He could see the SCPS Corncrake still floating there, untouched. But before he could row any closer, something collided with the lifeboat from below, snapping it in half. Dr. McCowd's stomach dropped at the sight of pale flesh but it was soon replaced with relief when he saw that the thing that had broken his lifeboat was not, in fact, UBU. It was an injured narwhal, behaving erratically due to its wounds. The culprit was almost certainly UBU. It wasn't content to just torment humans, but instead must have been targeting any life form that could feel pain and fear. In his own words, Dr. McCoud had put it, at least a mass extinction wouldn't have made it that personal. After the lifeboat broke apart, McCoud swam to the conrake, exhaustion and cold straining his muscles. It took him two hours to reach the abandoned cargo barge and containment site, but eventually he managed to climb up over the side and get on board. There was one very special thing about the corncrake, the thing that made it worth crossing the ocean in a fragile little lifeboat to find. Every anomaly that made the Ganymede list, the list of anomalies considered too dangerous to abandon even in an apocalyptic scenario, was contained on the corncrake. If there was anything left that the Foundation, or anyone else, hadn't tried to use to defeat UBU, it would be on that ship. After taking a little while to recover, Dr. McCoud embarked on an initial exploration of the craft. All the staff were gone, as he had expected. Thankfully, he still had his O5 ID card, and it still worked like a charm, unlocking all of the automated security systems on board. A lot of what he found was in ruins, but some things had survived. He found 10 hominid replicators from SCP-2000 in perfect working order. There was a cage containing the remains of SCP-2845, the deer, though UBU had done significant damage to it. SCP-319, a curious device, was there, contained in the space-locked vacuum chamber. This one was notable for its potential ability to destroy the universe. He found a couple of safe-class anomalies, such as SCP-YEZ, crowd control for the Practical Optimist, and SCP-FNA, the portable warehouse. The latter of the two was a portable door frame to a pocket dimension. He also stumbled upon SCP-001, last ride of the day, an old Prometheus Labs prototype of a time machine. And possibly, most importantly, he found SCP-076. The coffin was open, but Abel didn't attack Dr. McCoud. He wasn't consumed with murderous rage and bloodlust, the way he always was before. Instead, he was just sitting on the edge of the ship, silently staring at the sea. When he spotted McCoud, he gave him a small wave and did nothing else. The centuries of a world without death a world without killing, without victory in battle, had taken its toll on him. For possibly the first time in his eternal life, Abel was depressed. Nine days after he first inspected the corncrake, Michal began to formulate a plan. He loaded all of the hominid receptors into SCP-FNA, using a thankfully still working forklift. Next, he was able to unseal the sealed portion of SCP-001, last ride of the day, and get his hands on the details of the anomaly. It read, SCP-001 is capable of temporarily relocating to its relative position 15,000 years prior to activation. This temporal displacement is divergent paradox irrelevant. In other words, a separate timeline is created as a landing point. For example, if an occupant from timeline X were to murder their parents in utero in timeline Y, the Y iteration of the occupant would no longer exist, but the occupant themselves, being from X, would be unharmed. When in a fully active state, SCP-001 deploys a 5-meter-high telescopic antenna 
that functions as a Coloco wave energy sink. Essentially, Coloco waves could only be produced as a byproduct of the universe suddenly being exterminated. And ZK class reality failures produce the most Coloco waves. In one of these scenarios, SCP-001 would be able to use these waves to go back in time 15,000 years, effectively resetting reality to a point far before the catastrophe happened. This information allowed him to put his plan together to resurrect Project Beluga. Step 1. Plant explosive charges around SCP-319. Step 2. Hide anything potentially useful against SCP-UBU inside of SCP-FNA. Step 3. Get into the cockpit with SCP-FNA in tow. Step 4. Raise the Coloco sink. And Step 5. Blow the whole thing up. Three days later, it was time to put the plan into motion. Dr. McCloud placed the charges around SCP-319's vacuum chamber. There was enough in place to implode the walls of the vacuum chamber. He closed the bulkhead and began deploying the Coloco sink 10%, 25%, 30%. Suddenly, he could hear a loud crashing sound. The ship began to tilt. Oh no. He could hear the distant sound of menacing giggles. The sink reached 45, 57. But as UBU grew closer, he quickly overrode the system to lower the sink. 45%. 30%, 25%, 10%. UBU grew closer and closer, and as it approached, it began to whistle the tune it once used when it bathed Mikhaud and his wife in the sewer. UBU began to pound against the blast door, becoming increasingly frustrated as it struggled to break through. Suddenly, another voice cut through the air, an unexpected one. SCP-076 Abel called out to Mikhaud, encouraging him to carry on while Abel held the beast back. As Abel and UBU engaged in an epic battle, McCloud suddenly remembered something. There was an express deployment module for the Coloco sink. With no time to waste, he activated it. All at once, he hit the detonator. And then, the year was 11,970, and the date was February 14th. 13,963 years later, the SCP Foundation discovered something beneath a mound of earth and snow near the northern border of Lapland, Finland. It was a shipping container with a reinforced exterior, the interior of which could only be accessed through a fortified bulkhead on one side. The words SCP-001 were written on the side in black paint. In spite of this, the object was given the designation SCP-8048. A narrow, winding tunnel through the mound of earth and snow was discovered leading from the door to the outside world. The tunnel had significant wear, clearly having been used as a footpath by someone. But who? Well, on April 12, 1993, the Foundation got their answer. SCP-8048's bulkhead opened, and a man stepped out, snapping his fingers and promptly sealing the door behind him. He was designated Pole 8048. He was a 32-year-old man of French-Canadian descent, answering to the name of Dr. Lawrence Michaud. He made a series of claims that the Foundation found dubious, but noted it in the official file for SCP-8048 just the same. These included, but were not limited to, SCP-8048 is a time machine. He held the office of 05-11 in the year 3030 from an alternate timeline. Said timeline experienced a modified Omega K class end of death scenario that coincided with the invasion of a Tiamat class anomaly known as SCP UBU. SCP UBU was an extremely dangerous and sadistic entity who was capable of, among other things, neutralizing SCP 169 and SCP 682. His timeline's version of the Foundation launched Project Beluga, which resulted in an impossible war with SCP-UBU that lasted 441 years. Paul 8048 deliberately sabotaged SCP-319 to act as a power source for SCP-8048, thus arriving in Lapland in the year 11,970 BCE. SCP-UBU will arrive in Greenland on May 12, 2588. Paul 8048 was able to extend his lifespan by sharing his consciousness between a central computer within SCP-8048 and several thousand bodies created by his personal hominid replicators. Said consciousness sharing was achieved through a book classified in the future as SCP-YEZ. He wishes to assist the Foundation in the termination of SCP-UBU and has laid out a plan for its termination as outlined in document 8048-Zeta. There were, of course, concerns about the man's legitimacy, but after Michaud mentioned over 104 specific terms and data points known only to members of the O5 Council, the Foundation was forced to take him at least a little bit seriously. 
A motion was filed, requesting that Poll 8048 be allowed to assist the Foundation with the termination of SCP-UBU as per Document 8048-Zeta. 05-4 voted yay, 05-7 abstained, and the rest of the Council voted nay. The motion failed to pass. A follow-up motion was filed in response, requesting that Poll 8048 be allowed to assist the Foundation with their own strategy to respond to SCP-UBU. 05-1, 05-4, 05-7, and 05-10 abstained from voting. The rest voted nay. The motion failed to pass. On April 14, 1995, Dr. Isaiah Henderson and Poll 8048 sat down for an interview. When asked to state his name, Dr. McCowd also recited a mimetic passphrase that, when spoken by anyone other than 05-11 of past or present, would cause them to burst into flames. The two men were at odds from the beginning. Dr. McCowd expressed dismay and frustration that his proposal was rejected. Meanwhile, Dr. Henderson countered with the insistence that McCowd's proposed plan was rejected for posing an unnecessary risk to the civilian public. They debated for a moment. Before Dr. Henderson announced the Foundation's next plan of action, Dr. McCowd was to be terminated. The Foundation would proceed with its plans without him. At that point, Dr. Henderson terminated McCowd as ordered. He didn't count on one thing, though. McCowd was no longer an ordinary man, bound to one body. He hopped into the body of a guard, then into the body of 05-4 to deliver a vital message. He had started this plan alone and was ready to bring it to a close alone. Project Beluga would continue with or without the Foundation's support. Dr. McCowd returned to the bulkhead, climbing back inside and sealing it behind him. He had hoped to have the Foundation behind him, he had hoped they would be allies in the fight against the greatest evil mankind ever encountered, but they disappointed him. He had waited thousands of years, only for the organization he devoted his life to to try and kill him. Well, he wasn't going to go down without a fight. This was bigger than the Foundation, bigger than anyone, and no living person was as equipped to handle UBU as he was. So he resumed Project Beluga as a one-man operation. He issued a mission statement, which read as follows. On May 12, 2588, the entity known as SCP-UBU invaded and pillaged human civilization for no other motivation than cruelty and selfish gratification. Shortly thereafter, Project Beluga was founded as a joint effort between the Global Occult Coalition and the SCP Foundation for the purposes of UBU's destruction. UBU is not merely a threat to human safety, it is an affront to every positive and loving concept in the human consciousness. Rather than our lives, he seeks to destroy our quality of life to sate his own sick desires. Think about it. The taste of ice cream, playing with your dog, the way you felt after your first kiss. That is UBU's sworn enemy. No faith is too cruel for him, no hatred is strong enough. When Project Beluga's charter was signed, 592 GOC officers and Foundation staff were present at the ceremony. Our troops numbered in the hundreds of thousands. I, Dr. Lawrence Michaud, am the only surviving member, and always will be. What I lack in numbers is compensated thousandfold by my weapons, my mind, my replicated bodies, and eons of experience. The following record serves one purpose alone that once justice has been brought to UBU, humans in the shining and golden UBU-free future will understand that one person can accomplish through the power of hard science and raw emotion entwined in a perfect and indestructible braid. And while we are at it, you are very welcome. Over the next several hundred years, McCowd worked to secure ownership of Kangastok, Greenland through a Project Beluga civilian front. He evacuated the civilian population from the area, then spent a century constructing a superweapon. With 100 high-yield nuclear weapons, heat amplification runes, a targeting beacon for SCP-DAG, and five antimatter gathering pods from SCP-HNM in place, he was finally ready for UBU to manifest again. The sun's gone bad. People and animals are melting everywhere. The world is coming to an end and there's nothing I can do about it. Will I be able to find food? Will I be able to defeat or avoid the horrific flesh monsters all around me? Or the desperate and hungry survivors left in this terrible new world? Keep watching and find out. Can I survive 100 days in SCP-001 when day breaks? Hey folks, it's your boy Kyle. You probably know me more for gaming videos than post-apocalyptic vlogs, but hey, I'm a versatile guy, and I think I might go insane from the fear if I don't talk to somebody about all this craziness. If you're alive and seeing this right now, well, congratulations, you're probably doing a lot better than most people here, if you call them people now. 
But if you're seeing this a few years in the future, like, I don't know, you woke up from a 10 year coma, like Rick from The Walking Dead, and you're wondering what the hell happened to planet Earth, this video is probably gonna answer a lot of your questions. First things first, whatever you do, you've gotta stay away from the sun. It touches you. For even a second, you're dead. Or worse. Welcome to day one of the end of the world. For all of you who are still in a solid state of matter, you're probably wondering how I'm still alive too. Chances are it's for the exact same reason you are. Sheer dumb luck. I was down here in my gaming basement when day broke, just level grinding when my TV got taken over by those SCP Foundation people, telling us that the sun's gone evil for whatever reason and now we've all gotta stay inside. Hell, if I was up there making myself a sandwich or grabbing another can of Mountain Dew, I'd be a freaking puddle right now. It's funny, my mom always told me spending all day indoors was bad for me. I'll have to mention that to her if she's alive. Point is, the world has gone to hell in a handbasket, and now I've got only one objective, survive. I'm going to see if I can survive the horrifying post-apocalyptic world of when day breaks. For this first day, I'm just gonna hunker down. I kinda hope this is just a dream. Day two, all right, I'm up and at him, baby. Sadly, I can now report that this isn't a dream, this really is our horrible new reality. It's the sun's world, and we're just living in it. I've been spending the last several hours just waiting for nightfall outside. Against all odds, the internet and the power grid haven't gone down yet. Guess what's ever wrong with the sun only affects people and animals, not objects. Thank heaven for small mercies, right? People on Twitter have been live posting their situations out there, sharing advice on how we might all be able to stay out of the sun and survive this whole crazy thing. And hey, unless they're dead or full of hot air, maybe those SCP Foundation people know something about what's going on here. If we really can get to their buildings, maybe we can figure out how to reverse all this mess. Maybe. For now, I'm just gonna focus on staying alive. Hopefully, night hits soon. I really need to use the bathroom. Oh boy, it's day three and new issues are starting to pop up. I've been heading upstairs to go to the bathroom, but while I don't wanna be crude, I'm running low on toilet paper and it's um starting to become a problem. I ran out of my last roll a few days ago and now I'm starting to go to my bookshelves. I have a few newspapers left that I tore up and used for toilet paper first. Um, they weren't exactly comfortable, but hey, you need to make do. But without toilet paper and without newspapers, I need to figure out what my favorite and least favorite books are. I'm starting with the prefaces of all the books, seeing as I don't generally need to reread them. You know, they're expendable, you know? A lot of these books I haven't read since I was like 15, so maybe those will be the ones. I can't make up my mind on whether I'm gonna use the Harry Potter books or the Percy Jackson and the Olympian books first. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. I guess. I need to go to the bathroom. Day four, and now I'm trying to figure out how to pass the time. As you already know, I'm an avowed lifelong gamer. So while the electricity and the internet still work, I'm gonna keep gaming to pass the time and keep my all too precious sanity. I still have no intention of going out there even at night, but it's left me feeling kind of stir crazy. I wanna walk around the city again. I wanna go for a drive and feel the breeze in my hair. But seeing as I can't do that without experiencing a truly horrifying transformation, I've been spending a lot of time on GTA 5 online. Guess we'll never get GTA 6 now. What a bummer. Still, these last few days, it's felt more like Los Santos has been my home than where I actually live. There were even a few other people on the server. I don't know about you, but I take some comfort in that. Hey folks, I'm back, thankfully. Welcome to day five. We've still got electricity, thankfully, hence why you can still see this. I haven't heard anything from my family, and I don't want to assume the worst, but yeah, it's probably just best not to think about it. I've been heading up and downstairs to grab more food at night. You're probably wondering, but Kyle, why don't you bring it all downstairs to save going up altogether? Which I'd say, I don't have a fridge downstairs. <laughs> Smartass. But I'm starting to realize food is going to be a real issue here. It's kind of stupid now that I think about it. In all the zombie movies and TV shows I used to watch, it was all bullets and baseball bats killing your way through all those undead freaks and worrying about the rest later. Guess they don't want you to think about how you're only gonna ever be a couple weeks away from starvation. Kind of ruins the badass post-apocalyptic power fantasy. I only have a couple days worth of food left here, and after that, I'm gonna need to go out and search for more. Or I'm gonna need to relocate. 
I don't feel comfortable here anymore, you know? Early on, I thought when you got exposed to the sunlight, it just killed you. But no, it's worse. You keep living, you're just changed into one of those things. These last few days, I've looked out the windows when I've come up at night for food. I, I see them sometimes slithering in the yard or down the street. These things that used to be people. I wonder if they're people that I knew once before all this. And I tried to shove the thought out of my mind. Freaking myself out about all this doesn't help. I know that much. Just keep thinking about how they move. It's like weird kind of purpose. Like they're searching for something, but what could they be searching for? I'm just gonna go and get more food. We'll speak again soon. Stay safe, whoever you are. <sighs> Welcome to day six. It's nighttime now and I'm heading out for the first time. I keep seeing these weird slimy creatures everywhere and they make me kind of sick to look at them, but I try my best to just keep moving. I'm on a mission tonight. I'm gonna go to the local supermarket and check to see if there's still food there, while also grabbing myself a quick snack. I'm gonna keep this one brief. I don't wanna do a full shopping spree tonight. And it's already too late. Just need to know the food is there. I decided that earlier in the night, if I survive this thing and the getting is good at the bargain mark, I'll make my way back tomorrow for something a little more, you know, substantial. After all, the fewer trips I make out, the safer I'm likely to be. By the time I made it to the supermarket though, while I was practically a nervous wreck from the fear of turning into one of those things, I made an amazing discovery. While the windows were broken and the floor was a mess, most of the food was still there. Day seven, or should I say night seven. Galvanized by my success from the previous days, I decided to come back to the supermarket with a shopping cart. I wanted to get enough food for at least a week so I wouldn't need to come back out again. Hey, maybe I'm not so bad at this whole apocalypse thing after all. I grabbed plenty of canned food from the supermarket. Most of the perishables had already gone moldy by the time I showed up, so fresh fruit was out of the question. Suddenly I started getting scared about the thought of scurvy, but pushed it quickly from my mind. I'd cross that bridge when I got to it. Hey, hey, it's day eight and I'm still kicking. That's gotta count for something, right? I started taking more trips out at nighttime just to stretch my legs and keep the blood flowing. When the slithering things that were once people pass me, I just make myself scarce and hide in the shadows. You know, I, I hear them muttering sometimes in like this melted voice or voices. It's unsettling, but it's amazing what you'll get used to in just over a week. It's eerie to see all these streets without people in them. I know that I should probably just stay inside, but I, I really can't. I don't know if this will ever just stop, and if it doesn't, I, I don't want to spend my last days cooped up in my own basement. <sighs> Day 9. You know, there are some benefits to being in the post-apocalypse, to ever so slightly offset all the utterly crushing downsides. While during the day, we're all prisoners of the sun in our own homes, at night, we can do whatever the hell we want. I took a baseball bat that I keep in my closet and went to the local furniture store. I smashed up every single vase and all the windows like one of those rage rooms, because nobody could stop me. Then afterwards, I went straight to the local computer and gaming store and took all the Alienware tech I could physically carry. You know, there's no value in money anymore. If you want something, you can just go and take it. Every cloud has a silver lining. Day 10. More GTA 5 today. I decided to get on my headset and speak to a few others who were still around and on the servers. You know, it was so nice to speak to other human beings for once. They came from all over the world and were dealing with the same evil sun and sanity as me. You have no idea how incredibly valuable it is to find people to talk to in a time like this. The other players had plenty of theories as to why all this had happened. Some thought it was some kind of mutant solar flare they'd remembered reading about on some conspiracy forum back in the day. Others speculated it was the result of some weapon created by the US or Russian or Chinese military that had gone wrong. One person said that maybe it was a punishment from God. Like maybe on some level we all deserved it. You know, things got pretty quiet after that. Day 11. I've been having the most terrible nightmares lately. It's probably just a product of all the stress I've been under lately, but in the nightmares I'm running down a dark street being chased by those flesh creatures. I'm moving fast, but they're moving way faster. They're whispering to me, but I can't make out anything they're saying. This morning, which is to say evening, I woke up screaming and drenched in sweat. I can't really explain why, but I feel like something terrible is gonna happen soon. Okay, okay, I'm alive. That's enough, isn't it? And if you're watching this, I assume you're alive too. Congratulations, welcome to the nightmare space between day 11 and day 27. Sorry that I haven't been in contact for so long. As you can see, I'm not at home anymore. You couldn't pay me to go back there. <laughs> Not that money is worth anything anymore. A lot's happened since I last made one of these and I wish I could tell you any of it was good. 
Hell, I wish I could forget it all, but the things I've seen and heard, I don't think they're ever gonna leave my head no matter what I do. I thought about making another entry now and then, but I always found a reason to put it off. It's remarkable how your other priorities fall away when you're just thinking about where your next meal is coming from. It just kind of puts everything into perspective. Of course, during my travels, I saw more of those freaks slithering around. Sorry, sorry, I, I know I shouldn't call them that. It's kind of a coping mechanism, you know? It all gets a lot harder when you have to think of them as ex-people. That's another thing all these goofy zombie shows got wrong. It's a lot harder to separate what they were from what they are now. Especially when, you know, these were your friends, your neighbors, your... Well, I can't avoid talking about it forever, can I? I stuffed my backpack with whatever I could grab and left my home two nights ago. It wasn't just because I was going stir-crazy back there, though I admit that didn't exactly help. It was what happened there. I just came back from a food run, put most of it in the fridge, then retired back down into the basement to enjoy a late night snack and do a little gaming to keep myself sane. I'd been doing everything I could to reverse my circadian rhythms and sleep during the day just so I could be fully operational during the 12 hour period that going outside wouldn't melt me. But just like all those stories they told us when we were kids, there are monsters out there at night and they are looking for us. When I first heard the sound, I was, I wondered if it was something in game or maybe dripping from a leaky pipe. But no, it was too close to be fake and too viscous to be water. That's when I looked at the door and saw this awful pink slime slithering its way underneath my door. It was one of those things, those ex-people trying to get in. That'd be bad enough, but then it started talking to me. Kyle, my darling. Why are you all cooped up down here? It isn't healthy. You ought to come outside, sweetie. Get some sun, my darling. It was my mom. Well, it used to be. I guess she wanted to come over and visit me. Needless to say, I got out of there and I've got no intention of going back. That place is dead to me now. I don't even want to think about that voice ever again. Both her and... So, not her. So now I'm on the move. Guess I'll speak to you again when I stop. Stay safe out there. Day 28. I decided it was best to make my way out of town towards the fringes. The day first broke, the people who were in the most densely populated areas were the first to go. That's why I decided to hole up in a gas station last night just to avoid the sun. But during the night, people came. Not ex-people, actual people. They showed up in a jeep outside the building, refueled, and then came in. They were wearing black, cobbled together outfits and hockey masks. They were all either carrying bats or axes too. You can probably understand why I didn't decide to introduce myself when they busted their way in. I concealed myself in a broom closet while they searched around. It was nerve shredding. I'd never been more thankful in my life when they left. Day 29, coming up on a month of this madness. After the incident at the gas station, I realized I needed some kind of defense. It's not just the sun and those creatures I need to worry about. Just like the old world, people could be dangerous here too. That's why I snuck into a gun store in the dead of night. Some of it had been looted, but much like the supermarket near my house, there was plenty still here. The walls were covered in all manner of rifles, shotguns, and even submachine guns. I heard somewhere that revolvers are more reliable and easy to maintain than other types, so since I'm a gun novice, I grabbed a revolver and stuffed my pockets with as many bullets as I could carry. Let's hope I never have to use any of them. Day 30. Do I get to call this a month of survival? I mean, if we're talking February, I'd be a month in already. What a horribly dubious honor that is. I saw something disgusting last night and I thought I'd share it just to get it off my mind. Last night, as I was moving through the wilderness, I saw a group of other survivors gathered around a campfire. I remained scarce, but approached just to see what was going on, still carrying my revolver just to be safe. But the people around the campfire were eating something. And when I saw what they were eating, I swear to God, I almost threw up. They were chopping up one of the ex-people, cooking the parts over the fire and eating it. Day 31, a month by anyone's definition. Ever since seeing those others eating one of the ex-people, I've had trouble eating even normal food myself. My stomach aches and my throat burns. God, I feel so weak. I keep laying down and resting. I know I need to eat soon if I want to survive to day 32, but every time I think about eating, I think about the gooey flesh of the ex-people. Sometimes I wish I hadn't survived this long. I'll eat soon. I just need to sleep first. Day 32, 243. 
If you live this long, you really ought to be proud of yourself. I've seen thousands of those slimy ex-people, and there's probably millions more out there. Hell, oh, maybe even billions, if we're being honest with ourselves here. Am I just talking into the void here? Is there even anyone else out there who's human enough to watch this stuff? <sighs> maybe I just need to keep thinking about posterity. On the off chance that the world ever gets better and we reach some time where children are born again and all this fades from human memory, you'll still have these stupid, pointless little videos to remember how awful all this was. That way, at least I can make myself believe this all had some kind of, I don't know, point? So what's happened? With me, not much. Still moving at night, surviving, hiding in closets and underground parking complexes during daylight, and down to uh, my last few cans. So I'm hoping to hit a supermarket soon. God, what a ridiculous way to go. Starving in this new world with so many new, interesting ways to die. With the ex-people, things have been a little more eventful. There used to be one blob to a person, but they've started joining up? That's the best way I can put it. Things that used to be people and animals are starting to melt together, getting bigger and bigger. They've never been aggressive, but I think it's best to stay out of their way. Whatever all this is about, I am streetwise enough to know that it can't be anything good. I'll just keep moving and I hope you can do the same, whoever the hell you are. Hopefully the next time I check in with you, it's with better news than this. Day 44. I saw a shootout on the road last night. The people who are left, the ones who are still indeed people, are becoming less human. Something about situations like this, this sustained stress and pain and hopelessness, it weighs on you. There are no rules in the post-apocalypse. The only thing that can stop you from doing anything is a bullet to the head. Five or six people last night, as afraid and desperate and hungry as me, gunned each other down. They did this for reasons I will never understand, even if I wanted to, because there are no survivors left to tell the tale. What a funny world we live in. Day 45. I sleep when I can. It's surreal. I remember when I feared the dark and loved bright sunny days. Even all this time in, I still don't think I'm used to the switch being flipped. I've been having awful dreams again. I'm still running in them with a deep red sun shining up in the sky, being chased by a mountain of flesh the size of Mount Everest. It's swallowing up the city behind me and it keeps getting closer. No matter how fast I go, I just, I, I can't escape. It'll get me eventually. Something terrible is going to happen soon. I just know it. Day 46. I shot a man today. I don't know if he survived. I hope he lived. We encountered each other inside an abandoned building. I think we spooked each other and didn't have any time to ask if we were friends or foes. We were too afraid either way. We both drew our weapons and I was faster than he was. When my revolver discharged and he collapsed, I ran off. Sun would come up in a few hours and I just needed to find another place to hide. What the hell have I become? I don't know how things could get any worse than this. Not to self. In the future, don't even dare to think, how could things get any worse? Because if I've learned anything since this whole nightmare started, that is never a rhetorical question. Welcome to the space between day 47 and day 64. If you're still alive and watching this, I am so sorry. So I've got good news and I've got bad news. I'll give you the good news first. I've seen more people who haven't been changed yet. And the bad news? Last time I saw them, they were being dragged out into the light, kicking and screaming in the tendrils of one of those horrible flesh monsters I was telling you about last time. They've gotten a lot bigger now. And when I told you they weren't aggressive, well, um, yeah, I, I spoke a little too soon. I can't just sleep during the day like I used to. These monsters, and that's what they are now. They're monsters, not people anymore. They patrol, they hunt. They actively enter buildings searching for hiding places, searching for people they can drag out into the light. I've seen it with my own two eyes. The second they're out, they'll just start melting and fusing with the mass, making it even bigger, adding another voice to the chorus. And I hate myself, because every time I've seen it happen, all I can think is, thank God that's not me. God, I wish I could do something to help, to save them. But that's not the world we live in. The second they touch the light, it is already over. I wouldn't be helping anyone by adding my flesh to one of those things. I don't want them using my body to get to other people. There's only one thing I can do now. Keep moving at night, stay hidden, get away from population centers. I've realized where I need to go now. 
I've still got a distant memory of those broadcasts in the earlier days of the event, the SCP Foundation. I noted down coordinates to the nearest facility they had on the books. And if I'm honest, nearest is only a relative term because at this rate, it's gonna take me an eternity to get there. But it'll be worth it in the end when I get there. It'll all be worth it if I can at least get some answers, at least know why the world turned into this hell. Those SCP folks seem better prepared for this than anyone, so even if they can't fix this, they've at least got to have answers, right? Somebody needs to have answers. I really want to believe that. When the sun goes down, I'll start moving again. If you're watching this, wish me luck. I don't have much food left. I'll do what I can. Yeah, hey, I realize I'm not looking great right now, but trust me, you should see the other guy. Day 65 to day 86. Never thought I would make it this far, but hey, life's just full of surprises. Before you ask, and I mean, why would you ask? It's not like I can hear you. It wasn't one of the monsters that did this to me. It was another person just like me. Desperate, hungry, afraid. The one difference between me and them was the fact that they had a handgun and I didn't. They asked for all the food I had and when I wasn't exactly forthcoming, they decided to shoot me and steal the last of my food while I lay bleeding on the ground. Oh, well, okay, that's not entirely fair. They did leave me with one protein bar, which I had to cave and eat a couple days ago. Since then, I've just been foraging what little food I can from plants along the way during my nighttime walks. But it isn't much, and my wound is giving me grief. I sure hope they've got doctors at this SCP Foundation, or otherwise... Ow. I may be even more out of luck than I thought. Here's the good news for you, since I know how much you love that. I'm not far off of the Foundation site now. Even in this state, I'm probably only a couple weeks away. I think maybe I can will myself to live that long, at least. If I can get some answers just <laughs> before I die, then I can be happy. And sometimes, folks, that's all you can ask for. <sighs> Final stretch. Let's hope I see you again on the other end. Stay safe. I'm here. I'm here. The SCP Foundation on day 100. But I don't understand. Where is everybody? Hello? Is anybody there? God damn it. Why is nobody here? I, I don't understand. They were meant to have the answers. They were meant to know what was going on here, but they're all gone too. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. Is this it? Is it all just over? The end of the freaking world as we know it? It isn't fair. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. Wait, are those footsteps? Hello? Yes! Hello! I'm over here! Who's there? Oh my god, what the hell is that thing? No! No, get away from me! Oh god! Disgusting. There were a few rumors after the break of day came. Whispers that were passed on from the lips of trader caravans as they traveled from settlement to settlement. Not many people would have believed it way back then. It sounded just like a legend out of an old western. Too good to be true. A shadowy stranger wandering the wasteland, righting wrongs wherever he finds them. Then when the job's done and innocent people are safe once more, he walks off into the horizon without asking for so much as a thank you. Like we said, folks would have a hard time believing such a fanciful tale. Of course, that was before the sun started shining an anomalous light over the world. Nowadays, people might believe anything. The earliest days of this strange new world proved to be a learning experience for SCP-4494, otherwise known as the Spectre. He was the physical embodiment of the very notion of fighting crime. Wherever injustice arose, he would appear to vanquish those that preyed on the innocent. While he usually manifested at night, he never used to have any trouble appearing in the daytime too, in the form of a shadowy figure wearing a wide-brimmed hat and a long, flowing coat that he could alter the length of for added dramatic flourish. The specter's form absorbed almost all the light from the visible spectrum, but after day broke, the rules seemed to have changed. One day, the specter had emerged to find the sunlight had become unbearable. Where he had once been a void of any and all light, he was now finding it impossible to manifest during daylight. The moment that the unrelenting light from the sun made contact with him, SCP-4494 would dissipate, yet he kept reappearing at night. It was like he was being pulled back into existence, 
and was only able to re-manifest in the moonlight. Despite it being a reflection of the anomalous sunlight, that was seemingly enough to negate the effects it had of preventing SCP-4494 from reappearing. The same could not be said for any humans caught in the light, though. A far worse fate awaited them. Even with much of mankind deformed into creatures that resembled melted wax, there were still pockets of survivors. And where there were human beings, there would be subsects that wanted to harm or exploit their fellow man. The world might have no governing bodies anymore, no law and order, but the Spectre had realized that even in a lawless world, his work was not done. As long as there were survivors of the break of day, they still would need saving, not just from the fleshy hordes of SCP-001-A roaming the wastes, but saving from each other. Striding through the remains of the old world in the dead of night, his long cloak billowed out behind him. Its shadow almost seemed to blend with the darkness that surrounded the Spectre. But on the horizon, there was a sight he didn't often see these days. Light. Not coming from the sun above, nor the moon, but instead it lay ahead of him, a fire glowing not too far away. As he wandered closer, like an outlaw striding into town, SCP-4494 was presented with the ruins of a small settlement. Around him, shacks burned, their boarded-up windows broken to allow the cursed sunlight in. Everyone that was still alive normally kept themselves wrapped up head to toe to block out the sun. But there were clothes and protective goggles strewn all around, a larger pile of garments fueling a bonfire. SCP-4494 had witnessed the SCP-001-A creatures attacking humans dragging them out into the light to be transformed into more anomalous abominations. But what had happened here didn't seem to be the work of those creatures. The Spectre's suspicion were confirmed when he approached the town square to find a group of people who had all been melted into a fleshy mass. The instance of SCP-001-A paid the crime fighter little mind. It couldn't move very far. The few vaguely human shapes that protruded out of it looked like they were tethered to poles in the middle of the settlement. It didn't take much longer for SCP-4494 to figure out what had happened here. Someone had ransacked the settlement for some unknown reason. Maybe they wanted something. Maybe they were opportunists just looking to take advantage of this new post-apocalyptic world. Or perhaps they wanted to be cruel to these settlers. They had broken the barricades over the windows that blocked out the sunlight. They had trashed the ramshackle homesteads that these innocent settlers had been residing in. As SCP-4494 looked further, there looked to have been looting too. Food and water, medical supplies and ammunition. Not anything of use to be found. All that was left was what these raiders hadn't any need for. But as if all that hadn't been enough, as if robbing the settlers for what little livelihood they had left wasn't enough cruelty, the bandits had tethered the survivors to poles in the center of town. They had taken away their protective gear and left them at the mercy of the elements. And as the sun had crept higher into the sky and bathed the captive settlers in its unforgiving light, they had melted into an SCP-001-A creature. Turning away from the town, the Spectre did his best to quell his rage. He wandered in the direction of the next settlement. Something was drawing him there. He could feel the pull of the wrongdoers that had left this carnage in their wake. He would find them, and they would pay for what they had done. There was nothing he could do for their last victims. They had already been turned by the sunlight. But if anyone could save the next group of survivors, it was him. As the wind howled, the shadowy figure's cloak flapped in the breeze. The next settlement looked similar to the last, although still intact. Shacks built from sheets of corrugated iron and other scrap metal, all welded together so that not even as little as a tiny beam of sunlight could bleed through. As he stepped toward the boundary of the settlement, a muzzle flashed, accompanied by the deafening echo of a gunshot that reverberated all around. Someone had tried to shoot at the Spectre, narrowly missing. The bullet whizzed past his head, not that it would have harmed him anyway. Fear not, he declared. You can hold your fire. I mean you no harm. You aren't with the slivers? A voice called in the nightly dark. If you mean the evildoers that left that last settlement over a smoldering ruin, then no, I'm not. The Spectre replied. Hearing this, he spotted movement on one of the shack's rooftops. 
A sharpshooter carrying a worn old rifle stood up, covered in layers of protection from the transformative effects of the sun's light reflected off the moon. Well, you aren't dressed like they are, I'll give you that, the sharpshooter called. Can barely make you out wearing all those dark clothes, mister. But if you're looking to trade, I'm afraid your timing couldn't be much worse. Tell me, replied the specter, bluntly. The criminals that terrorized the other settlement, they've been here too? Yes, sir, the man answered. Said they'd be back tonight, too. I've come to help, to do away with those that would inflict justice on the innocent, SCP-4494 explained in his typically dramatic cadence. You call them slivers, yes? Well, they call themselves that, the sharpshooter said, on account of their choice in outfits. They look ridiculous, but they've covered their protective clothing in slivers of metal and glass. That way they're not only protected from light, but their clothes reflected back at other people, too. Dastardly villains taking advantage of what has befallen the sun. The specter, cursed the bandits. Why are they yet to pillage your settlement? You said they intended to return? Well, that's what they threatened earlier. A lot of them have been ransacking any settlement they can't shake down. They showed up here in their stupid, sparkling outfits and demanded we hand over a half of all of our food, water, and antibiotics. They call it their sunshine tax. According to them, if we didn't meet their demands, they'd destroy the town. We didn't know to take them seriously until we saw the fire over there on the horizon. For a moment, the specter fell silent. His cloak had slowed, waving gently now the winds had died down. But in contrast, his anger had never been higher. Who are you anyway, mister? The sharpshooter asked. Never got your name. My name is the Specter, a name these vagabonds will soon know well. For tonight, they will pay the price for their crimes. No offense, Mr. Um, Mr. Specter, but look around. World's gone to hell, ain't no justice anymore. What price are you expecting to make them pay? Simple, SCP-4494 answered. The price is they now have to face me. An hour later, the settlement was quiet. The sharpshooter was still at his post, scanning the area nearby for signs of movement. Sure enough, he spotted something. A group of figures approaching, the moonlight glinting off their metallic outfits, revealing their position as they drew closer and closer to the makeshift town. The slivers were coming, but there would be something else waiting for them when they made their way into the settlement. The other settlers were awake, despite how late it was, wearing their protective layers and peeking through cracked doors only to slam them shut as the glimmering gang crossed the threshold into their ramshackle home. The slivers whooped and jeered, brandishing weapons and threatening the settlers to show themselves before the bandits would break into their shacks and do to them what they'd done to their neighbors at the other town. But as one of the slivers approached the door of a shack and began pounding his boot against the metal door, something reached out of the shadows and grabbed him. In fact, it wasn't coming from the shadows. It was the shadows. Fists shrouded in darkness struck the remorseless raider. Even with the protective layers covering his face, the sliver could feel himself being bruised by the beating. The specter struck once more, knocking the wrongdoer unconscious and wrenching the reflective metals from his outfit, shattering them underfoot. The other slivers panicked, one drawing a handgun and firing. The shots were useless. All they did was illuminate the silhouette of a dark cloaked figure walking closer and closer ready to make them suffer for their crimes. It was dusk by the time the Spectre had beaten the group of bandits, stripping them of their distinctive reflective pieces. Each one of the slivers had been beaten into submission, suffering broken ribs, black eyes, and missing teeth. With the danger over, the sharpshooter and the other settlers had emerged from their hiding places, all eager to weigh in on how best to punish the bandits. Many yelled that they should be strung up without their protective gear, so that the sun melted them into an SCP-001-A. But the specter interjected, urging the settlers not to sink to the level of the criminals they had been harassed by. Instead, he turned to the defeated slivers. Turn over half of your food, water, and medical supplies to these people, SCP-4494 demanded in a frighteningly calm voice. Then leave, walk into these wastes, and don't come back. The slivers agreed and fled, running as fast as they could away from the town. Why'd you let them go? The sharpshooter asked. These are uncertain times, the specter replied, noticing the sun was creeping over the horizon. It'd be time for him to go soon. In the face of hardship, it can be easy to lose our way. Justice has always been blind, not blinded by the sunlight, but blind to prevent bias. Ah, the slivers might come back though. 
the man said, adding, if they can even survive with what you left them. Maybe they'll live out there, SCP-4494 responded. Then again, perhaps not, but they have a chance. That is justice. In a time without law, it's the best we can offer. And if they carry on raiding folks? If they harm others, if they want to waste the chance they've been given, then that is their choice. But they know if they refuse to change, then they will answer to the Spectre. With that, the shadowy crime fighter walked away from the settlement. The unforgiving light of the sun made him fade as he sauntered off like an old gunslinger. But he would be back. As long as people needed saving, he would always be back. Screams filled the cold night air, drowned out by the panicked gunshots and the vicious growl of something inhuman. A being from who knows where, a creature that the agents surrounding it were woefully underprepared to capture. General Makoy barks at the soldiers to concentrate their fire on the beast. His men, those who hadn't already fallen, turned and trained their guns on the creature. Squeezing their trigger fingers, bullets spewed out of their weapons, a hail of gunfire that sped towards their target, only to miss, as it suddenly vanished from the spot it had been standing only a split second earlier. Their bullets passed through the thin air left in its wake, shredding several nearby trees. One of the men threw his gun to the ground, turned heel, and sprinted away as fast as he could. He hadn't known what he was signing on for when he was recruited by a shadowy up-and-coming organization. He'd just been flattered to be headhunted for his combat skill, and agreed to be one of the new organization's first field agents. If he'd known it would result in him facing off against a demon near a rural road in Guatemala, then he would have stayed in the regular military. The fleeing agent suddenly stopped in his tracks, instantly feeling sick. It was the most indescribable type of sickness, worse than any he had ever felt in his entire life. He dropped to the ground, his pants from running away replaced with heaves as his entire body seemed to have suddenly turned against him. His head was burning. At first he thought he'd run too fast too quickly, and was overheating underneath his military fatigues and helmet. But he was no slouch, recruited for being in peak physical conditions such as he was. Never in his life had the agent ever felt this bad. The heat from his forehead was unbearable, a fever running rampant as his vision began to blur. Everything was spinning, that unsettling imbalance that comes with severe nausea rapidly taking hold of the fallen agent. Then the monster came back. Through unfocused eyes, he looked up at the tall, featureless face of the creature as it looked down at him. He was helpless, hurling and shuddering, barely able to stand. If someone had brought a Geiger counter with them, it would be ticking loudly and frequently if they held it near the agent. And that, somehow, was about to be the least of his problems. The creature opened up its mouth, the only facial feature that occupied its head. Past its few remaining teeth was a milky blue orb. The same thing that had been visible right before the creature itself wasn't. As the agent, from his place on the ground, caught sight of the pale eyeball in the monster's throat, something started pulling his body in on itself. It was like falling, except gravity was acting on different parts of his body at different speeds at different times. His arms and legs folded inwards towards his center of mass, making the agent scream out in pain as his body collapsed. He folded into himself like origami, piece by agonizing piece, until there was nothing left. Hearing the man scream, General McCoy and the others broke through the tree line, flashlight beams illuminating the creature. The general yelled again for his man to shoot it, trying to hide his fear with animal rage. It snarled at them as they raised their guns once more, then leaped towards them, ready for another kill. In the years to come, the successors to these men and their fallen colleagues would be the world's foremost experts in situations like this. The capture and containment of anomalies would one day be a more streamlined process rather than the bloodbath currently unfolding in the small Guatemalan town. Dying at the hands of what locals had thought to be a demon were some of the earliest precursors to the SCP Foundation. Humble beginnings, indeed. 
The creature was eventually captured by the early precursor version of what would one day be the SCP Foundation. At this time in their history, the organization had far fewer resources and reach than they would one day have at their disposal. They didn't even have the SCP numerical designation system that has since become synonymous with the organization and the various anomalies they keep contained. As a result, this so-called demon was originally classified as number 86243AR-001. However, it would later be known as SCP-001, or one of the anomalies to share that designation at least. SCP-001 itself was an abnormally thin humanoid creature. With grey-brown skin, its emaciated bone and muscle structure didn't match any known species. It sported dark claws at the tips of its arms, with both legs terminating in similar sharp black points rather than paws or feet. Most striking was its face, or rather, its lack of one. The creature's head was spherical, with a lipless mouth reaching halfway around its circumference. Within was a maw of 21 teeth, each spaced randomly apart and either chipped, broken, or rotting. It possessed one eye, or what was at least believed to be an eye, in the form of a large milky blue sphere in its throat with no pupil or iris. As was discovered in initial testing by Dr. Herman Ketter, for whom the ubiquitous Ketter class designation was named, SCP-001 was able to create micro-singularities using its single milky blue eye. It could deploy these as a means of teleporting itself out of harm's way or for offensive attacks that could cause a human body to collapse in on itself. These singularities often also produced the nasty side effect of emitting lethal amounts of deadly radiation that could not only cause damage to the surrounding area, but also would fatally poison anyone nearby. As a result, it is believed one of these micro-singularities was responsible for the untimely death of Dr. Ketter. However, Ketter's research into SCP-001 was at least able to produce solutions for keeping it contained. It was discovered that SCP-001 could not teleport through lead and would display signs of extreme sickness and fear when exposed to high levels of heat and humidity or bright flashing lights. Strobe lights were used to induce this sickened state and in this state, the creature was unable to form harmful singularities. Dr. Ketter's death also ushered in the aforementioned creation of the Ketter class designation for anomalous creatures or artifacts that are extraordinarily tough to keep safely contained. In fact, if any of this account is to be believed, the very discovery and capture of SCP-001 was the impetus for the entire SCP Foundation's approach to researching and containing anomalies. In the days before the likes of Dr. Kondraki or Dr. Clef, before infamous anomalies such as SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile, or SCP-096, the Shy Guy, were even known about, things were, well, pretty uneventful for the newly formed Foundation, as you can probably imagine. But none exemplified this better than Harold Woodyu, an uninteresting man living an uneventful life or as uneventful as one could get when their job was working for the Foundation. During this crucial period of the SCP Foundation's early history, as the anomalous research and containment organization was taking its first steps towards protecting the people of the world, Harold was finding himself bored already with his work. Harold was a senior archivist at a small site in Sloth's Pit, Wisconsin. This was before the Foundation had secret facilities situated all over the world, and even the infamous Site-19 as it is today had yet to be established. For now, it was known only as ADRX-19, the oldest Foundation site on record. And records were Harold's entire working life. He was in charge of maintaining the earliest reports of anomalous activity and the inner workings of the fledgling Foundation. One day, Harold received a letter from ADRX-19, Unfamiliar with the designation, he ran a check through the records and discovered that the site had been established before the Foundation had even gotten its name. The letter contained an update for the senior archivist. Having grown obsolete in its own age, ADRX-19 was being closed for good, and that meant all of the anomalous entities and objects stored there would soon be shipped off to be stored elsewhere. The first package arrived at the site Harold was stationed at not long after. He walked briskly out to meet the delivery officer as he wheeled the large wooden crate through the bay doors. It didn't take the archivist long to realize what exactly he had now been given the ownership of, 
and charged with protecting. The crate even came complete with relevant case files to accompany it. Stamped on one side of the box was a series of numbers and letters that shocked Harold when he read them. SCP-001. He exchanged a confused look with the man who had delivered the anomaly, who just laughed when he saw Harold's expression. You didn't hear? He asked. SCP-001 is dead. The creature's death had come on the heel of a number of significant changes made by the Foundation higher-ups. These decisions were ultimately both the direct result of the encounter with SCP-001 in Guatemala, and were also changes that would ultimately shape the Foundation into its modern iteration. The first of these was the introduction of the numerical designation system, providing each anomaly with an SCP number. Formerly designated as number 86243AR-001, the creature that was captured and researched by Dr. Ketter was announced to be reclassified as SCP-001-COG. Originally, the number attached to each SCP denoted the order in which they were encountered by the Foundation. However, the Overseer Council believed this posed a security risk, offering too much information about their operations to any potential adversaries. As a result, the use of SCP-001 designation started to be applied in a slightly different way. A number of anomalies were then grouped under the umbrella designation of SCP-001. Some of these were real anomalies, and amongst the earliest that the Foundation encountered. Others were entirely fake, and used as a cover for the real SCP-001. Nobody, not even within the Foundation itself, was ever told exactly how many files fell under the SCP-001 umbrella, or indeed, which was the real one. The anomalies included the Gate Guardian, a towering colossus of pure energy wielding a flaming sword, believed to be the biblical angel guarding the Garden of Eden, the Scarlet King, an extra-dimensional tyrant that longs to conquer our reality, a group of 36 individuals capable of neutralizing anomalies, even the SCP Foundation itself is considered one potential SCP-001. And among them is also the creature from Guatemala, otherwise known as the Prototype. The same creature, whose inhuman bones were now in a box before Harold. The senior archivist had long heard legends about what exactly SCP-001 might be. It was a question often whispered among Foundation staff who were curious what the first anomaly might be, but didn't have the security clearance to know the truth. Rumors spread that SCP-001 was more powerful than any other anomalies in containment, that the capture or discovery of it was either the reason for the Foundation ever forming, or it was one of their greatest failures, meant to be kept their closest guarded secret. Something far too terrible to comprehend. You might think that now being presented with an answer would give Harold relief. So many wonders and haunting queries about SCP-001 were put to rest. But instead, as he opened up the wooden crate and looked at the pile of strange bones inside, it had the opposite effect. None of it was the interesting answer that Harold and many others had hoped for. If anything, it was a huge disappointment. All that speculation surrounding the mystery of SCP-001. What it was, where it had come from, why it was kept so secret. Was this the answer? It was just the first thing that the SCP Foundation had put into a box? According to the Foundation's own internal reports, the prototype monster had been found lying still in its containment chamber during a routine inspection. It wasn't moving at all. Even armed guards couldn't get a reaction from the creature. The anomaly wasn't breathing, its heart having slowed to a stop. Little was known about the creature's biology, but even then, nothing could be done to resuscitate it. As far as anyone could tell, the anomaly known as SCP-001-COG had died of old age, after exhibiting movement that got gradually slower and weaker, and even less hostile behavior over the course of the previous decade since its initial capture. But yet, Harold was still dissatisfied with the knowledge that this was SCP-001. He became fixated on the case surrounding it, studying the files he was charged with moving to storage. He learned of the few ways the creature's discovery had influenced the early Foundation. For example, the death of Dr. Ketter being the reason for the use of Ketter class in their terminology. Still, that didn't feel nearly as important as Harold and others had speculated that SCP-001 would be. There had to be something more to it, and for weeks following the arrival of the creature's bones, Harold could not stop thinking about it. Something about all this didn't sit right with him. 
The secrecy that the Foundation shrouded SCP-001 in seemed like overkill for just a monster. The organization I had seen far worse than the likes of the prototype in the many years since. At the time, perhaps it had seemed like the most dangerous anomaly the Foundation had encountered. If it really was the first, then technically at that time, it would have been the most dangerous if there were no others to compare it to. One night, Harold ventured into the archive and opened up the box containing the creature's bones using a crowbar. He had to know, had to understand exactly what was so important about this being. Cracking the wooden crate open, he removed the skull to examine it. The Foundation hadn't even had a chance to figure out what exactly the creature was or where it had originated from. All they knew was it could produce micro-singularities and lethal doses of radiation. Beyond that, the only other details came from the Guatemalan locals who had encountered it first. They had called it a demon. Perhaps it was. The Foundation would never know for certain. And it seemed to Harold that they didn't care to know now that SCP-001 was dead and didn't seem to care much before then either. They were more than happy to just discard it. He couldn't shake the feeling that there was meant to be something important about the creature. Harold couldn't help it. The whispers surrounding SCP-001 all indicated it was meant to be something more significant than a cast-aside pile of bones. The underwhelming reality he was being presented with didn't match the idea of SCP-001. Harold examined the skull closely in his hands, turning it around and around as he tried to maybe spot something some important detail that everyone else in the Foundation had failed to notice, or some of the puzzle that would explain what was so important about this creature. And yet, the more he looked, the less he learned. Alas, poor SCP-001, he said aloud, paraphrasing Hamlet. Of course, what Harold didn't know, didn't possess the clearance to know, was that this wasn't the only SCP-001. Maybe the Foundation's lack of interest in the creature's remains was all part of their plan to keep the real SCP-001 a secret. Where Harold only saw a box of bones and a disappointing answer to so many burning questions, the SCP Foundation saw their system working exactly as intended. MTF agents scramble through the crowd of bloodthirsty, hypnotized festival goers. Up on the stage, a pair of living statues hold down a screaming man as they produce medieval instruments of torture from an antique case. Maybe this time the agents can stop it. Maybe they can prevent all the horror and bloodshed. But one thing stands in their way. A man-sized cartoonish dove costume flying down towards them, wielding a large wooden mallet that would only bring death and destruction. Needless to say, even by Foundation standards, this one is going to be weird. When you found yourself sought out by the SCP Foundation's recruitment division and offered a role in the research department, they made sure to inform you of the risks. After all, a workplace injury in this line of work might be far more serious than slipping on a wet floor or developing carpal tunnel from typing all day. Working within the ranks of the Foundation, you could be the unfortunate victim of any number of dangerous anomalies. Whether it's SCP-096 appearing behind you after you accidentally caught a glimpse of it as a single pixel in a photo, or if you were in the wrong place at the wrong time whenever SCP-682 next broke out, then chances are you'd be receiving an early redundancy and a closed casket service, if there's even enough of you left to bury. It is the one thing you never want to happen. The scenario you're constantly warned about from the moment you join the Foundation. A containment breach. Anything can be the cause of an anomaly breaking free of containment and spreading untold chaos in the process. Whether it's the result of a particularly cantankerous SCP that doesn't take kindly to being locked up, an act of earnest human error with disastrous consequences, or even international sabotage enacted by a group of interests trying to seize anomalies for their own purposes. There is no telling when or where a containment breach might occur. Or is there? Despite all the resources at their disposal, specialized facilities spanning the globe, advanced technology, and a nearly inexhaustible supply of personnel to contain SCPs, the Foundation still manages to suffer catastrophic casualties as a result of containment breaches. But surely, if they're so well equipped, such breaches should be almost impossible, right? Well, yes. So what causes them? What if every containment breach, all the loss of life, 
the further spread of anomalies and the destruction of Foundation property incurred was all caused by an SCP. Not a living entity, mind you, more some kind of latent anomalous phenomenon that triggers containment breaches without warning. The prevailing theory surrounding this phenomenon is even itself considered to be an SCP within its own right, referred to as SCP-001. Of course, as many of those well-versed in the history and practices of the SCP Foundation will already know, SCP-001 is a designation shared by a number of anomalies. Some are believed to actually exist, while others are speculated to just be falsified covers created to mask the real SCP-001. From beings such as the Gate Guardian and the Scarlet King, to the existence of God's blind spot and even the Foundation itself, each of these SCP-001s are nicknamed after the Foundation researcher who proposed them for the designation, and often considered to be some of the first if not the very first anomalies ever encountered, or at least documented. In that regard, this SCP-001, Plague's proposal, could well be one of the very first latent anomalies to exist, explaining why so many SCPs were uncontained prior to the Foundation being established, and why even now, with all their resources, containment breaches are still a worryingly frequent occurrence. There are multiple anomalies that appear to have been directly affected by SCP-001, at least according to the research of one of the Foundation's directors, Director Lake. While he might be drawing conclusions and seeing patterns where there aren't any to speak of, Leg reasons that the circumstances of these specific recorded containment breaches seem to indicate that SCP-001 was at fault. The first of these incidences Director Leg focuses on in his research is also the one we'll be focusing on for the remainder of this video. It is designated as SCP-001-1. SCP-001-1 previously went under the designation of SCP-5770 and is an annual anomalous event that occurs in the Piazza della Signora in Florence, Italy. The event consists of an unscheduled festival that goes on for a period of 10 days, wherein anyone present within a 10-kilometer range of the affected area suffers a mind-altering effect that compels them to attend the festival. However, SCP-001-1 is not a well-documented, long-running festival of great cultural significance to the people of Florence. Neither is it an event that is widely advertised. Yet those who have experienced the psychic draw of this anomalous festival are driven to attendance. During the course of SCP-001-1, two anomalous entities that resemble the statues created by Michelangelo during the Renaissance will host a show where they take to the stage to judge people they deem to be sinners. This pair of statue creatures will call upon the audience and bring those they've designated sinners up onto the stage with them, and will then enact makeshift, grueling punishments. These have been noted to resemble the acts depicted in Dante Alighieri's Inferno. So if you ever need any further proof of how hellish these punishments are, we recommend asking an art expert. The moment that SCP-001-1 ceases and the festival comes to a close, any and all in attendance are subject to yet another form of anomalous mental alteration and will proceed to instantly forget the event. Any of the horrific tortures performed on stage becomes unknown to those that directly witnessed it, leaving them unaware of anything that occurred only moments prior. So given the Foundation's extensive knowledge of this festival, its gruesome proceedings and the effects it has on those in attendance, you might be forgiven for expecting them to have a fairly well-established method of keeping the event contained, presumably setting up a cordon to keep attendance out of the area, administering amnestics to any that might have been affected by SCP-001-1's anomalous mind-altering. But then, you remember SCP-001, the theory behind what could be the cause of containment breaches. As a result, the Foundation has still been unable to establish containment of the event formerly known as SCP-5770, and Director Legg's research has tied this issue with containment to SCP-001, hence the festival's redesignation to SCP-001-1. Following the initial discovery of an anomalous annual occurrence in the city of Florence in 1985, the SCP Foundation's head researcher, assigned to what was then known as SCP-5770, was one Joseph Pasqua, former site director at Site-322. Pasqua was, according to the incidents recorded on the Foundation's own database, somehow manipulated by one of the anomalous statue creatures that performed the show during occurrences of SCP-5770. 
It was thanks to the influence of this entity that Joseph Pasqua deserted his post at the Foundation and went into hiding. The fact that the influence of one of the performers of this festival was able to extend its influence to a senior member of the Foundation was not only troubling, but also constituted a containment breach. Pasqua would later be tracked down by Foundation agents operating in and around Italy. He was discovered 30 years later after his desertion in Vatican City as a member of the Palpal Conclave, a specially selected group of Catholic cardinals that are charged with electing a new pope. If the former site director was still being influenced by the statue creatures, it is highly likely that he spent the previous three decades climbing the ranks of the Catholic Church, potentially to install a new pope at the behest of the entities responsible for conducting the torture of the Florence Festival. Another recorded incident of a containment breach surrounding the event that seemed to lend credence to the existence of SCP-001, the anomalous cause of breaches, occurred the year following SCP-5770's discovery. In 1986, the Foundation was observing the proceedings of the festival as part of their ongoing investigation into its bizarre nature. On site were agents of Mobile Task Force Zeta-66, better known under their unit's codename of the Guardian Angels. During the festival, MTF Zeta-66 operatives noticed the presence of a previously unknown entity associated with the anomalous event. The Foundation was already aware of the pair of seemingly living Michelangelo sculptures, designating them as SCP-5770-1 and SCP-5770-2, respectively. This third entity, despite being given the designation of SCP-5770-3, had its own preferred identification for itself. The being referred to itself as God's Strongest Soldier and resembled a mascot costume of a dove. Approximately two meters tall, this creature's body was entirely hollow. There was nothing within the costume. The costume was its body. The responding agent of MTF Zeta-66, codenamed Zeta Turquoise, was the first to confront God's Strongest Soldier and was greeted with quite the opener. Tweedly dee, tweedly da, God's Strongest Soldier is my name, getting rid of sin is my game. Confused at the creature's demeanor and presence, Zeta Turquoise called in a report to command, stating that a large birdman was harassing random attendants of the festival. When Turquoise moved in to confront SCP-5770-3, the creature repeated its assertion that it was God's strongest soldier and that its aim was to get people into heaven. The agent requested that God's strongest soldier get out of his way. He had a job to do, but the bizarre birdman responded with more whimsical nonsense. Burger, sandwich, fruit, and fries, you just told a big fat lie! God's strongest soldier proclaimed, Twilly deep do da, dilly deep do da, pa pa da pa da da! Upon Zeta Turquoise's attempt to push past the creature, SCP 5770 3 produced an oversized wooden mallet, seemingly from out of thin air. It then wound its arms back and immediately, viciously, struck the MTF agent. A low-orbit Foundation satellite reported not long after that an object had been detected exiting the Earth's stratosphere. Analysis confirmed that it was, indeed, Zeta Turquoise. Yes, he was literally yeeted into Earth's orbit by a cartoonishly large wooden mallet. As for the entity known as God's Strongest Soldier, the bird-like creature then proceeded to attack the other members of Mobile Task Force Zeta-66 in a similar fashion, making sure they got to heaven in every sense of the phrase. With multiple recorded instances of containment breaches occurring in relation to the festival in Florence and happening so frequently, more and more evidence of Director Legge's theory about SCP-001 was being validated. In 1988, the Foundation attempted a different, more pacifistic approach to containing the annual celebration by attempting to cordon off the entrance to the area of Florence where those compelled to attend the festival usually congregated. There was additionally a cover story issued to the public, stating that this was done as a quarantine measure to keep residents away from an area hosting a potentially dangerous infection. For a time, this seemed to be working. The streets were quiet, local residents seemed to be going about their business and paying little mind to the Foundation operatives in the area. That is, until the mind-altering effects of SCP-001-1 took hold. A mass of people estimated to be over 100,000 Florentines charged towards the Kordonoff area. This mass of people swept through like a tidal wave breaking through a dam, causing Foundation personnel to be trampled alive. Those that survived the initial rush were attacked by civilians in what seemed to be a coordinated effort to reach the gatherings area for the festival. All Foundation agents in the area were terminated in short order. 
mercilessly slaughtered and then cannibalized before anything that remained of their bodies was dumped into the Arno River nearby. As well as being evidence of the sheer mental alteration the statue creatures and the festival itself were capable of, for Director Leg, this seemed to indicate something further. If an anomaly, SCP-001, was truly responsible for all containment breaches, allowing them to occur in spite of the measures taken to prevent such things happening, then the phenomenon seemed to be occurring specifically to prevent the Foundation from achieving containment of certain SCPs. Lake's theory developed with every passing breach that involved SCP-001-1. In theory, the festival should be an average Tuesday for Foundation staff, a relative walk in the park in order to contain it, if not outright stop it from happening at all. Yet despite all their resources, manpower, and expertise in all things anomalous, the Foundation had been thwarted at every turn. Despite how illogical such occurrences seemed, containment breaches were still occurring at an alarming rate, and perhaps none more so than in relation to SCP-001. The following year, 1989, brought with it the most inexplicable breach yet, and further proof for Director Lake's theory about SCP-001. While the previous breaches were undoubtedly anomalous in nature, each always carrying with the possibility that somehow, despite the low odds, the Foundation missed something. Some human error or previously undiscovered information about the festival could have led to Pasqua's alteration or the arrival of God's strongest soldier. But this time, it was undeniably that a force beyond the scope of the Foundation's understanding was altering reality to prevent them from containing the festival in Florence. An invisible barrier manifested at every entry point to the main area of the anomalous event. Whenever a member of Foundation personnel tried to get in on foot, those that attempted to access the festival area via rappelling out of helicopters instantly caught a blaze and burned to death the moment they touched down on the ground. Any helicopter transports also crashed on their return journey to Site-322, and God's strongest soldier was seen trampling on the wreckage before flapping its arms and flying away. It was following this incident that Leg was promoted to position of Site Director for Site-322 as a replacement for Joseph Pasqua, who was still missing at this time. The newly appointed director was yet to devise his theory that there existed an anomalous cause for all containment breaches. However, during his introductory briefing, he was presented with the file regarding SCP-5770 and the various examples of it not only being uncontainable, but being very good at not being contained. Director Lake asked if some of the more standard methods had been attempted. At this point, the Foundation had tried aerial bombardments of the festival, Scranton reality anchors to counteract whatever anomalous force was preventing containment, even using SCP-682 to clear the area. It had all failed. Figuring out why was now Director Legg's job. All the information of previously failed attempts to contain the festival led Legg to the conclusion that SCP-001 must exist. An unseen phenomenon, the missing piece of the puzzle the element specifically interfering with the Foundation's efforts. He presented his proposal to the Overseer Council, who were skeptical, to say the least. They posited that the statues and bird mascot creature might be smarter than the latter's outwardly cartoonish nature portrayed. But this is exactly what, to Director Leg, indicated SCP-001 was responsible. He explained that all in attendance at SCP-5770's festival took the event seriously. But the appearance of God's strongest soldier was an abnormality, whose demeanor and tone were drastically different from the rest of the rather cutthroat proceedings. Director Legg explained that the sheer absurdity of this creature seemed to be the result of SCP-001 interfering with their operations. After all, if some other cause was to blame, like an unknown cult attacking Foundation personnel when they attempted to contain the festival, then there would be evidence of that and Lake would have no reason to suspect that God's strongest soldier was anything more than just a tonally dissonant part of the festival. Of course, Director Lake couldn't prove the existence of SCP-001 based on the presence of one cartoonish bird mascot at a festival. But before long, more and more breaches would start occurring that seemed to further prove that Lake was onto something. There was something else at work, causing containment breaches that put the entirety of the Foundation in jeopardy. When the sun rose on that fateful day, Jerry Marks had been one of the lucky ones. He worked in a mine, deep underground, at the edge of a small town in the rural United States, which meant he didn't see what happened when day broke, when the light of the sun ravaged the earth. 
The first Jerry heard about it was when his son Kyle came racing into the mine, frantically tapping his dad's shoulder to get his attention. He'd run all the way from their tiny homestead under a fireproof blanket, thick and long enough to block the sunlight from touching any part of Kyle's skin. His older sister, Jerry's daughter Carly, hadn't been so lucky. Caught by the light, her body had turned to the consistency of warm candle wax, melting into a form that barely resembled human anymore. Jerry had been one of a handful of others working late in the mines that day. A few thought that young Kyle had made the whole story up and ventured up to the surface and into the light, only to meet the same twisted fate. The light morphed their bodies into monstrosities, anyone in the small, rural community becoming an amorphous mass of human flesh. Eventually, those that stayed behind in the mine heard the voices of their loved ones, their wives, husbands, children, all calling out to them from outside. They promised that nothing was wrong, that it was a lovely sunny day outside, and the mine workers should clock out to come and enjoy it. More of them left, reassured by hearing their families that all was well, and once more, none of them were seen again. Only Jerry and Kyle were left, and it stayed that way for several months. The father and son had to adapt to life underground, only leaving the mine to forage for food, and only while wearing thick, dirty mining overalls, making sure not a single millimeter of skin was on display. If the sunlight touched them, they'd never make it back alive. Venturing out of the mine in his overalls, Jerry had seen the shuffling, melted mass that had once been the townsfolk. He did his best to avoid it as he went house to house, making sure it never saw him while he raided cupboards and refrigerators. But he could see it, and among the blobs of bodies blended together, he saw something that resembled his daughter. It turned his stomach, not just knowing but actually witnessing what had happened to her and it was made all the worse on the days that Carly called out to him and Kyle while they hid in the mine. It was clearly her voice, but there was something wrong about it. Perhaps knowing that she was a part of the melted monstrosity made it easier to resist her trying to coax them out into the light. It had almost been an entire year of life spent underground when Jerry and Kyle encountered their first actual human beings since all the other workers had left the mine. The pair that arrived were strange, wearing protective suits that covered them both head to toe. Just like Jerry and Kyle had quickly realized, these two were aware that not even the tiniest hint of the sun's unforgiving light could be allowed to reach them. The two approached Jerry and Kyle, seemingly coming in peace, although the father and son remained cautious of the newcomers. Making sure they were deep enough in the mine to avoid the sunlight at the stony entrance, the pair of them revealed their faces confirming they were still fully human, before introducing themselves as Researcher Worth and Sergeant Booker of the SCP Foundation. Sitting down with Jerry, Worth explained what had really happened. He had been working for an organization that contained and studied anomalous creatures and phenomena, the Foundation. Booker had been a member of a special armed unit within the same establishment, or a mobile task force. But now the SCP Foundation itself had fallen, with a number of its own personnel turned into more of the amorphous fleshy creatures in the sunlight. We spent a lot of years keeping all of this from the public, Worth admitted sounding guilty, but implying the choice was out of his hands. But I don't suppose there's any point in secrets anymore. Uh, it's the sun you see, Mr. Marks. Uh, you can call me Jerry, he interrupted. Sorry, Jerry, Worth corrected himself. But something happened to the sun. It changed, decimated the entire planet in barely any time at all. I mean, all those people, millions, billions, all at once, dear God. Worth took a moment as the existential dread of it all once again caught up with him. It turned out the biggest anomaly was right above us, Booker continued for him. She sounded a lot more stoic, even a little coldly detached from it all. SCP-001, that's what the Foundation called it. Is there a way to reverse it or cure the people that the sunlight, you know, changes? Jerry asked, thinking of Carly. You mean SCP-001-A? No, I'm, I'm sorry, Jerry, there's nothing we can do, the researcher said, failing to sound as recomposed as he pretended to be. Your daughter is gone, but at least you still have your- Worth paused, looking around at the mine. Even in the low light, there was no sign of Kyle. Jerry turned to scan the area, 
To his horror, his son had seemed to have vanished while they were talking. Instantly, panic caused him to think that Kyle had wandered out of the mine and into the sunlight, turning into part of what Worth had called SCP-001-A. But the boy would have had to walk past Jerry to start heading that direction. Plus, the father knew his son was far too scared to go outside after seeing what the son had done to Carly. Booker had a tactical bag filled with equipment, flashlights, spare batteries, even flares for whenever the power in those ran out. And both working and living in the mine so long, Jerry had maps, knew certain routes through the deep network of tunnels almost by heart. Between them, the three had enough to mount a search for the missing boy. Keeping together, they traversed away from the first of several large chambers, down into the dark depths of the mine. Kyle! His father yelled, his voice echoing through the tunnel. Kyle, buddy, it's Dad! You there? Walking behind him, Researcher Worth and Sergeant Booker parroted the calls, assuring the missing boy that they didn't mean him or Jerry any harm. As the trio walked deeper and deeper, they began to venture into a portion of the mine that had hardly been used by the workers. It was darker than the areas further up, while those had rows of electric lamps powered by long cables attached to generators. Down here, the only light came from the flashlights the group carried. Kyle, come on out! Jerry called out for his son again. This isn't the time to split up. We need to stick together. Come on, son. I'm really worried here. Once again, there was no answer. Just then, Jerry caught the sight of Booker and Worth out of the corner of his eye. Both of them knew a lot about SCP-001, and the mine worker couldn't help the suspicion that added to his perception of them. After all, Kyle had never run off before now, and Jerry couldn't help but think, while his attention had been turned, that the pair of Foundation personnel had taken his son. Dad? A voice suddenly called out. Jerry's head spun on a swivel at the sound of Kyle calling for him. Dad, where are you? It echoed through the tunnel again. That's him! Jerry exclaimed to the other two. Which way did they come from? Straight ahead, it sounds like, Booker replied. Hold on, Worth interjected. I think you two should look at this. The beam from his flashlight was pointed at the rocky floor of the tunnel. Something was gleaming wet against the stone. A large smear of red like something had been dragged in the direction Kyle's voice was coming from. Oh god, he could be hurt, Jerry said urgently. Hurt might not be the right word, I'm afraid, Jerry, the researcher said solemnly. There's a lot of blood here, too much. All the more reason to go further and find where he's calm from, the father retorted angrily. That's if it is the kid that's actually calling us, Booker replied, her and Worth exchanging a worried glance at each other. You two know something, don't you? Jerry demanded. Does that thing from the outside. Does it have my son too? Dad? Another voice called. Jerry froze, his blood as cold as the mine tunnel he stood in. He hadn't heard that voice in almost a year, but recognized it immediately. It was Carly, his daughter. It seemed impossible. He knew she had been merged into part of SCP-001-A when day broke, but now she was somehow calling out to Jerry. Her voice sounded clearer, like it had used to before she changed and she wasn't trying to lure her father out into the sunlight either. For a moment, it seemed to Jerry like his daughter had somehow come back. Dad, we're both over here! Carly's voice called again. We need your help! Kyle's stuck! Who's that? Booker whispered. That's Carly. Jerry sniffed, holding back tears. You said your daughter became a part of SCP-001-A, Worth pointed out. Maybe she got better? The father asked, hopefully. I hate to say it, but that's definitely not her. Sergeant Booker replied. We should turn back now if there's an anomaly in these tunnels. That's not going to be pretty for any of us, she added, turning to Worth. What? Jerry yelled. What do you mean by that? Look, buddy, those aren't your children, the MTF agent said bluntly. It sounded like SCP-001-A got them. No, no, the, the voices are too clear, Worth replied. I think something else is in here. Before Jerry could explode with anger at how uninterested both Foundation personnel seemed at the fate of his children, Another sound was heard. Footsteps. Something shuffling closer, patting its feet on the stone. There was a low growl that filled the tunnel, as whatever it was came closer still. Dad? The voice of Carly repeated, sounding only a few feet away now. Where are you, Dad? Kyle's voice immediately followed it. Behind came the sound of Booker striking a flare. As it erupted into a plume of light and heat, she threw it down the tunnel, and there they were. Not Jerry's children but instead a pair of nightmarish creatures. They backed away from the flare slightly, but the light still illuminated their blood-red forms, walking on all fours like wolves. The creatures' elongated heads were missing any eyes, 
just jaws filled with rows of sharp red fangs. Dad, came Kyle's voice again, emanating from one of the monsters. It was mimicking Jerry's son, both of his kids. Even having seen SCP-001-A at a distance, the father could barely believe his eyes. 939s, Booker yelled the second her flare illuminated them. Run! She pulled a sidearm and opened fire, the bang of each shot ringing loudly through the tunnel. The pair of 939s pounced at her while Jerry and Worth turned to run back the way they had come. As the creatures attacked, the echoes of the gunfire were replaced with blood-curdling screams. What the hell are those things? Jerry yelled in a panic. SCP-939! Researcher Worth panted. Too much to explain. They're pack hunters and they're, and they're vicious. What about Kyle and Carly? I heard their voices. That's what those monsters do. They mimic human speech to draw us out. We're their prey. There's no telling how long they've been down here. They might have retreated to the mine to avoid the sun on the surface. Worth yelled. The sound of the SCP-939s getting closer were catching up, right on Jerry and Worth's heels. Why would they come down here for? The mine worker huffed, slightly ahead of the researcher given his slightly stronger physique. To escape the sunlight! Worth replied. SCP-939s hate Bri- <laughs> His sentence was overtaken by a scream as one of the blood-red creatures caught Worth by the ankle knocking him down and pulling him back to be devoured. Jerry didn't look back, he just kept running back through the tunnel. The sound of SCP-939 calling after him in Kyle and Carly's voices made it even harder not to stop and turn, even just for a second, but he reminded himself that if he stopped running, then he couldn't lure the creatures out of the mine and into the sunlight. It wasn't how he'd ever wanted to go out, but maybe that way Jerry would see his kids again. It almost goes without saying that the inner workings of the SCP Foundation are kept secret from the general population. Your average Joe doesn't need or want to know about the terrifying entities and bizarre experiments happening behind the closed doors of the various Foundation research sites. But there are some secrets of the SCP Foundation that even its own staff know very little about. One such mystery is the highly classified and immensely powerful O5 Council or Overwatch Council, that oversees everything that goes on within the SCP Foundation. They are considered the highest authority within the organization, but very little is known about them. In fact, according to one official report in the SCP Foundation archives, the O5 Council does not exist at all. Stick with me here. There are decades of reports concerning the Council. There is a wealth of historical evidence pointing to their existence and influence but they do not definitively exist. At least, they don't right now. Take a deep breath, try and untangle the knots we just tied in your brain, sit back, and listen. This is the story of SCP-001, the O5 Council itself. In 1965, SCP Foundation Administrator William Cohen was preparing to leave his position. To prepare his successor, H. V. Oleander, Administer Cohen drafted a series of letters intended to pass on important and highly guarded knowledge to the man who would take his place. In the letter, Administrator Cohen explained that he was retiring early for a specific reason, writing, A dark link to my mind, sticking to every neuron and slowing my every thought. In truth, I am unwell. Cohen's decline had begun eight years prior, in late 1957, after the launch of Soviet space probe Sputnik 1 into the Earth's orbit. The Foundation's interest had been drawn to the probe after a foreign signal had been detected trying to communicate with it. Not a signal from a foreign nation, mind you, but something from much further away, and likely something that was not human. Whatever it was, it was trying to communicate, and it was getting closer. On January 4th, 1958, the signal stopped and an unidentified object arrived on Earth. Cohn was summoned to the war room at Site 00 much to his surprise. It was highly unusual for guests to be invited to the site. There they worked together to identify the nature of the situation with Sputnik, until a single burst of gamma radiation was detected and Sputnik's orbit began to decay. The Council panicked calling heads of state and calling for as many resources as possible. They had worked themselves into a frenzy and were planning to shoot down the first space probe in Earth's history. Eventually, the decision was placed in Cohen's hands. Let the probe land on its own or shoot it down. Overwhelmed by the Council's intensity, Cohen told them to do what they thought was best. They shot it down. 
He did not want to, but he crumbled under the pressure. There were so many of them, and only one of him, and they seemed so certain in their decision. This was the first decision in his career that Cohen regretted, and it was presumably followed by many more. He continued in his letter saying, And now what credibility do I have left to disagree with them? I am but a mouthpiece, a sad old puppet tangled up and caught in the very strings used to make him dance. Cohen wrote his letter to his successor with one warning. Just as I have shown you vulnerability here in the hopes I might gain your trust, Please consider asking the same from those who would insist you trust them. In March of 1958, following the incident with Sputnik, the O5 Council collectively submitted a notice to the Foundation's Leadership Committee. They stated simply, The individual you call your administrator has proven insufficient. We solicit you to make your preparations and nominate another. No individual members of the Council wrote in, but rather submitted their thoughts as a collective, as if thinking together as one single mind. The language used was also curious, saying, your administrator, rather than our administrator. The O5 Council seemed to think of itself as something separate from the SCP Foundation, its own entity rather than simply a powerful arm or leader of the organization itself. On June 11, 1962, another notice was sent out. It read, Foundation, a life lived in service of the greater good is invalidated if death does not also serve. On November 11, 1965, a third notice was sent out, this time to all Foundation staff. Please join us in remembering the life and career of Administrator William Cohen. The only constant is change. Because of this, the erosion of his skills, abilities, knowledge, and confidence was inevitable. Administrator H. V. Oleander took over the position for many years after Cohen's demise. In 1988, he prepared to step down and drafted a letter to his successor, Natalia Ellingbrook. Like Cohen before him, Oleander tried his best to explain where he went wrong, in the hope that she might do better. Oleander began the letter, I used to have such an ego. This job, this life, and the burdens that surround it crush and squeeze you until all you have left is what they force you to keep. My mind and my soul feel as though they've been contorted into the shape of someone I no longer recognize. My predecessor, may he rest in peace, described his years as if he were trapped behind smoky glass and made to watch a foggy world pass him by. Like some sort of voyeur, I too feel imprisoned but I realized that it was never a looking glass. It is a mirror. The events detailed in the letter began in November of 1985, after a powerful storm had ripped through New England and caused severe damage to Site-31's power grid. During the power outage, a multi-stage containment breach occurred and an unnamed Infovor escaped from the facility. The entity was lost until March of 1986, when it was detected in a government facility in Warsaw, Poland. Determined to make up for his previous failure, Oleander organized a mission to bring the entity back into custody. His team tracked it down and was prepared to apprehend the entity's host, when the O5 Council expressed concern that this behavior might cause an international incident and intervened. The Council made the decision to reach out to local and international governments in Poland, allowing the entity to escape to Pripyat, Ukraine. Oleander and the Council went head-to-head -head on this, pushing and pulling and becoming increasingly aggressive on either side. Oleander could not make up his mind about what to do, listen to the Council, or trust his own gut. On April 26, 1986, his indecision resulted in a nuclear disaster in Soviet territory. Not only that, but the entity still evaded containment. The mission was a complete failure. The O5 Council submitted a report on the incident stating, We recommended that the healing process commence by first assigning blame. The collective good would be served by purging liability. And, we would have helped. Anyone would have helped. Why deny it? By now, the pattern has probably become clear to you. The administrator and the council fall into conflict over a difficult decision. Something goes horribly wrong, a new administrator is chosen, the former administrator writes them a letter to prepare them for the heavy demands of the job, and the cycle begins again. As you might expect during those days of her administration, 
Oleander's replacement, Natalie Ellingbrook, sat down to write a letter of warning to one Michelle Wilkes, who was chosen to replace her. Ellingbrook began her letter. As you've likely surmised from our few meetings, I walk with a pronounced limp and favor my left leg. How I came to be like this isn't especially interesting, but what it did to me might be of interest to a person in your position. Any man or woman changes when they are exposed to pain. Simply put, it has to go somewhere. If you hold it all within yourself, it may stay contained, but it will surely destroy you when you've had your fill. It festers in all the spaces you let it occupy, warping and scarring what used to be healthy, happy tissue sat beneath. Some people have hobbies, but me, I've always just had my work. I've been ringside for so much pain in my time with the Foundation. My predecessor left me a note, much like I am leaving you, and in it he warned me of the tremendous duty and guilt he hid in order to do his job. Although the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune stung him quite keenly, I assure you I have suffered every bit his equal. The breach at the Olympics in 94, losing control of Site 248 in 96, botched facility transfer of Hong Kong in 97, bombings in Bali in 02, the dispute with the ORIA in the Congo in 03, the GOC ultimatum in 04, she continued. Although I have weathered much, my tenure is up not with the sort of precipitating bang that ousted Oleander, but rather the quiet whimper of stepping away from a battle I no longer wish to fight. I am tired of the council calling a meeting on every decision I try to make, and I'm tired of calling one on every decision they try to make without me. I guess that reasoning is another tribute to the selfish life I have led. My ideal way to say goodbye would have been to simply stop coming in. My desk would have sat empty, emails unread, until one day a courier showed up with my keys and badge. But even here, at the end of my career, the O5 Council insists on refusing to let me be by myself. So tomorrow I will play the part of a dutiful officer resigning her post and walk away from Site 00 with my head held high and those overbearing bastards in the rearview mirror. I pray that your head will never be so bowed as mine has. Administrator Wilkies took her predecessor's words to heart and began her tenure with a new proposal for Project Tethys. The project would include modifications to the Three Gorges Dam Facility at the Yangtze River. As part of a containment procedure for Entity 2005-C-ET-011, the Council refused to approve her proposal. Administrator Wilkies insisted that they provide a list of concerns, explaining what their issues with their proposal were. The two argued back and forth over the necessity of a meeting until the Council submitted this note to her. We know how important it is to get off on the right foot. Although this body respects you and the autonomy which you command, we have also seen many come and go. You were chosen from your peers, but they have chosen many others in the past. We remain unconvinced. Before you, Allingbrook, who spent her whole life pushing others aside so she could lead. She left all others behind. Trees with no roots do not hold to the ground. Before her, Oleander, who wanted so much to be seen as your hero in white. He could no longer live with himself once his clothes were stained, but the sin does not define the saint. Before him, Cohen, who wanted nothing more than to be the one who made the decisions. He collapsed in on himself when there was no easy victory. No man is an island, and a dozen more whose names we have subrogated. You need us. You are not enough. Administrator Wilkies was offended by this response and argued that the meeting was unnecessary. She asked for the council to trust her expertise and the expertise of her employees. They responded, your distinctiveness did not arise from the ether. You are a synthesis of available materials and experiences. If needed, another could be synthesized. We are needed. We are necessary. We synthesize. You are not. You cannot. Become we, or become they. The choice is yours. Administrator Wilkie suddenly understood. The Council was not a part of the Foundation. They were something else entirely. Though she couldn't be completely sure what they were, she knew one thing for certain. They were not her friends. She fired back at the Council's threats. You cast your shadow over the future with your threats and intimidation. Certain we would be nothing without you. But I'm forced to wonder who or what would you be without us? 
I stand with the countless thousands that have died for our mission, the people that have engineered our solutions, the people that will build them, and the people that will risk their lives in order to carry out these procedures in the hope our mission might one day be complete. Without them, I know I would be nothing. We are willing to take our chances without you. I'm going to offer you the same choice you gave me. Become we, or become they. Several days passed with no response, and Administrator Wilkies made the most difficult decision of her career. She suspended the appointment of the O5 Council until a day comes when it becomes necessary again. Secure Area 00 has been set up around the area containing SCP-001. The area has been classified, designated Level 6 or Cosmic Secret. The coordinates of this secure area are stored in cranial implants placed in 15 carefully selected Foundation leaders, including Ethics Committee members and Site Directors. These candidates can participate in voting once a vote is called, but are to be kept unaware of their status as voters until it becomes necessary. If a supermajority votes to decrypt the contents of these cranial implants, the location of Secure Area 00 will be revealed to them. If the security of these implants becomes compromised, Cogita.AIC will generate a new protocol, and a new list of candidates will be selected. The original candidates will have the encrypted information deleted from their minds. No one may access Secure Area 00 at any time for any reason unless the aforementioned vote takes place. Operation protocols, defenses, building schematics, and all other information about the site have been expunged from Foundation records. Oh, well, what's this? A new addendum has been unlocked. This is for your eyes and ears only. Yes, I'm talking to you. Do not share this information with anyone else. A retinal scan has confirmed your identity, and the Cogito protocol has been executed. You are receiving this addendum because Administrator Michelle Wilkies is dead after nearly 20 years of service. Before her death, she prepared a statement regarding the role of Administrator at the Foundation. The addendum contains a message from Administrator Michelle Wilkies to you, her designated successor. Surprise! You have been chosen as the next Administrator for the SCP Foundation. You may be surprised, asking, Really? Me? Yes. You. You may not know it, but you were chosen quite some time ago. The cranial implant has been in place for years. Now it is ready to be activated. Michelle Wilkie's message is intended to prepare you for the trials and tribulations that lie ahead, and to encourage you to ask yourself, what kind of leader will you be? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to perform this most solemn duty? The following comes from the former administrator herself. Listen carefully and consider what she has to say. Your future at the Foundation, the fate of your subordinates, and your very legacy may depend on it. Consider now before fate takes away the luxury of time what type of person, co-worker, and leader you want to be. Each and every day one of the administrators before me was challenged in terms both great and small during their tenures, and I was no exception to this pattern. The office you occupy is not about the power and influence you now command, nor is it ever about the unfathomable responsibility you must now shepherd. It is instead about the character, integrity, and vision with which you will meet the test of leadership, and should you prove worthy, surmount it. You and the people you will lead must be asked to undertake tasks no person should ever be asked to carry out. Yet duty and the safety of all mankind demand that you make this sacrifice. For them, for each other. If your resolve should ever falter, know that everyone you lead stands with you. We are ready to follow you into the blackest night if you let us believe in the promise of dawn. But should your resolve ever break, the Council awaits. They will invite you to Site 00 if you ask. You need only surrender. Best wishes, M. Wilkies, former Administrator. What exactly is the O5 Council? That is a question not easily answered. They are not flesh and blood, not individual minds and feelings, but something else entirely. They are a collective, something that thinks, breathes, and votes together as one being. They view the world as two things, we and they. As you prepare to take on the role of administrator, keep in mind who you are. Be strong, be brave, be resolute, and hold on to your sense of right and wrong. But if you ever should falter, if you decide to stop being you and become we, 
there is always Site-00. Remember, even though they do not officially exist, the Council awaits. 1835, the American Frontier. A beacon of hope in a world choked with blood and smog. Little did the hopeful citizens of a still newly independent United States know, the evils of the old world had followed them here. Sometimes it took the form of hate, of violence, of desperation and starvation. But sometimes pure evil wasn't just some abstract concept existing in and around all of us. Sometimes that evil, that pure cruelty, malice, and greed walks in the shape of a man. One such man was James Anderson, an unremarkable name for a truly exceptional man. Exceptional in the sense that if most human beings aren't willing to sell out all of humanity for their own petty gain, James Anderson is definitely the exception. After all, it's by his design that we have SCP-001, the anomaly that set the SCP Foundation and our entire reality down its current path. Of course, you know the deal with SCP-001. Not one anomaly, but many. A collective designation for a vast number of entries, all of which spell beginnings or ends for the SCP Foundation and sometimes even our universe. Scarlet Kings, Howling Black Moons, Orboros Cycles, and Gate Guardians. You've heard them all and seen the files. But unlike all the others, there is no file for the factory. That's because the full story only exists in the mind of O5-1, one of the most powerful and arguably the oldest member of the SCP Foundation. He'll die before he ever commits the story to paper. Some memories are just too awful to record. Their details and implications are too painful to ever subject others to. SCP-001 isn't just about Anderson and his atrocities. It's about all the terrible nightmares that unfolded afterward, and the deal with the devil that O5-1 struck to lock them away. For now, at least. But it all begins with James Anderson. His family had become incredibly wealthy in the Revolutionary War, and in the decades since, his fortune had only multiplied, as fortunes tend to do. In the early 1800s, he began work on his beautiful and horrific magnum opus, The Anderson Factory. It would be the pinnacle of the Industrial Revolution, the manufacturing plant to end all manufacturing plants. Three stories tall and a mile wide, company towns had existed for a long time, but this time, the factory itself was the town. It had everything a worker would ever need. They would live, sleep, play, and most importantly of all, work in the same place. They would never need to leave. All their wants and needs from cradle to grave would be met in the Anderson factory, and all that Mr. Anderson ever asked in return was loyalty and service. Was that really so much to ask from those whom he gave everything? It may sound like a horrifying form of indentured servitude to us, but to the people in the United States in the early 1830s, this kind of security and stability was a godsend. To many itinerant workers and unstable families across the plains, James Anderson seemed like a saint. Little did they know, his plans for the factory and them were anything but saintly. Nobody knows exactly what type of dark magic James Anderson devoted himself to. Many have theorized as to whether it was Satan he worshipped, ancient pagan deities, or something older and more powerful than both. In actuality, the only thing that James Anderson really worshipped was himself, and the pursuit of more material wealth and power over his fellow man. Any pacts he made with evil timeless gods were just means to an end. The Anderson factory was a citadel to one man's cruelty and corruption, and every element of the building's design seemed to reflect that. Groups of eight were forced into rooms together like battery farm chickens to maximize cost efficiency. People worked day and night in shifts of three. Machines always rumbled and roared and chewed. When workers died in factory accidents and their blood spilled on the ground, it seemed to reveal arcane symbols carved into the stonework. These symbols were only visible when blood flowed across them. While people traveled hundreds of miles to live and work at the Anderson factory, they had no idea that they were working towards slavery. 
subjugation, and death under Anderson's iron will, and in some cases, fates much, much worse. The factory remained in operation like this for 40 years, while Anderson himself enjoyed a positive public reputation as a groundbreaking industrialist. How Anderson got away with his crimes for so long is sadly a tale as old as time. The factory made valuable products and an awful lot of profit. So, no matter how many rumors swirled about inhumane practices or arcane rites going on in the Anderson factory, nothing was ever done. It was just too inconvenient to ever reckon with the horrible truth underneath the productive surface. And it was truly productive. The factory was so huge and filled with such a multitude of enslaved workers, there wasn't anything they didn't produce. From textiles to technology to crops and meat, the machines were always on. The furnaces always burned. Anderson himself seemed obsessed with two things, efficiency and misanthropy the contempt and hatred for humanity itself. He believed his workers were lower than him. They only existed as a means to his nightmarish ends. And if ever the workers became too injured to work, well, that doesn't mean that Anderson wouldn't still find ways to put them to good use. The lucky ones, starved and neglected, or broken by the stress of work or the grinding gears of the machines, were used as material in the production of products. Some were drained of blood so that they could be used in the forging of metal. Others were ground up into meat slurry and used to pad out the beef, making it go further. People all across the country enjoying fine Anderson brand steaks had no idea that they were actually dining on human flesh the whole time. But as we said, the ones who ended up being cooked into steaks and hamburgers after death were the lucky ones, because at least they got to die. The truly unlucky injured workers became the subject of James Anderson's horrific occult experiments. Using a mix of twisted science and black magic, he turned men into abominations. Powerful, terrifying monsters stronger and more deadly than any mortal man. Anderson was building himself an anomalous army. But it wasn't just monsters. There were just as many so-called normal humans helping him rule over the Anderson factory with an iron fist. They were vicious sadists themselves, spurred on by absolute loyalty to their immoral master. It was only after the Civil War that someone finally escaped the Anderson factory and confirmed that not only were the most horrific rumors about the place true, but they didn't even come close to covering the totality of what was going on there. When President Grant heard the reports, he was disgusted. As far as he was concerned, the atrocities of James Anderson should not be allowed to go on a minute longer. The directive was simple. Find the factory, free its prisoners, and put James Anderson to death for his crimes. And thankfully, President Grant had the perfect group of operatives for the job. They were an elite unit of around 150 soldiers who performed a number of dangerous missions beyond enemy lines down south. Espionage, assassination, psychological warfare. But these missions weren't just against the Confederates. Some of the enemies they faced down south were things that could not be explained. The strange the frightening, the anomalous. And the highest ranking soldier in this unit was a man who would one day become the legendary 05-1. He and his men made their long and treacherous journey to the factory, a trip that would change all of their lives forever. When they first reached their destination, they first had to deal with Anderson's security force. These were men whose cruelty and loyalty to Anderson far outweighed their skill in combat. While they may have felt powerful when tormenting starving, injured factory workers, they were quickly routed and slaughtered by 05-1 and his team. When they ventured inside the factory, they were utterly appalled by what they saw. The inhuman conditions faced by Anderson's thousands of victims drove them into a blood-curdling, murderous rage. Almost half of 05-1's men were lost in the battle against Anderson's army of engineered monsters, but in the end, they prevailed. Nothing would stop them in their quest for liberation and vengeance on behalf of all that this terrible place had tormented. They fought their way to Anderson's office, where they found him cowering under his desk. For a man as despicable as Anderson, only a truly medieval execution would suffice. 
05-1 and his men hanged, drew, and quartered Anderson over a period of two days. The sadistic madman died laughing in the end, saying that while they may kill him, his factory will never die. But the factory was no longer his. In addition to the factory's horrors, 05-1 and his men also discovered its wonders. It wasn't just normal items and monsters that the factory produced. They were also, thanks to some of Anderson's arcane deals, the world's leading producer of anomalous items. Skeletal horses that never tire, shadow cloaks that could transport the wearer to different dimensions, toy guns that fire real bullets, even yo-yos that could flay the skin from anyone they touched. These were anomalous objects that could shift the balance of global power, items that could give them an advantage against the things that go bump in the night. While others among them were greedy or fearful, the inner circle of 05-1 were united in a singular purpose. Using the anomalous, they can control to contain the anomalous that they can't. This group took over the factory, making it Site Alpha, their first ever containment facility, and came to be known as the O5 Council. With funding that came from a mix of blackmail and friends in high places, this organization, a burgeoning SCP foundation, grew more and more powerful over the ensuing decades. The tools they gained from the factory were pivotal in the continued success of their mission. And as they discovered more anomalies, they also put these anomalies to good use. But in 1911, 05-1 and his new organization came up against an enemy that even the factory's tools couldn't help them defeat. A warrior race known as the Fae, so named because their only weakness seemed to be a vulnerability to iron. But these beings were an order of magnitude more powerful than humans, or the beasts they'd once faced in Anderson's factory. The Fae handed them defeat after defeat, but soon humiliation became decimation when an army of the Fae led an assault on the factory. It was a day that only 05-1 remembered. The Fae slaughtered everyone, every guard, every researcher, every member of the O5 Council. They swept through the factory like a plague of locusts, leaving only death and destruction in their wake. Only O5-1 escaped and survived, and that's only because he ran. As he fled from the fairy forces through the halls of the factory, he came upon a door he'd never seen before, a huge golden door covered in Aramaic script. He fled inside, entering the very heart of the factory. Inside, he saw the floating dead body of James Anderson bathed in red light. Now he was little more than the mouthpiece of the factory itself, or rather the great and unknowable powers working behind it. The factory gave 05-1 an offer, just like the offer it had given Anderson before. It would give them the power to turn back time and destroy the Fae, saving everyone that they'd slain in the factory. But in exchange, all of them would forever belong to the factory. And in a moment of weakness and fear, 05-1 took the deal. The clock was turned back to before the battle. This time, 05-1 and his compatriots, all of whom except him had no idea what had happened, had the horrific weapons required to slaughter the Fae. Weapons that nobody, mortal or otherwise, mm -hmm. could possess. They repelled the invading force easily, but knowing the horrors that came before, 05-1 refused to stop there. With the power of the Foundation and the factory behind him, he hunted down and murdered every last fairy, driving their species entirely into extinction. As far as 05-1 was concerned, it was them or him. But with the Fae utterly destroyed and the Foundation's superiority assured, a shadow was laying over 05-1. He'd made a deal with the factory, and someday it would want its pound of flesh. 05-1, rather than facing the consequences of his actions, decided to run and hide. He had the factory decommissioned and buried under the rubble, never to be used as an active foundation base again. But just because they were done with the factory doesn't mean that the factory was done with them. One day, a toy gun appeared on 05-1's desk, a toy gun that fired real bullets, just like the ones they found in the factory a century before. The factory was still waiting for its repayment. With every anomalous item from the factory that the Foundation used, the terrible place only grew in its power. Since the resurgence, 05-1 has been sending the factory sacrifices, D-classes, dead and alive, 
as well as agents and researchers. But as time goes on, it seems that these sacrifices aren't satisfying the factory anymore. It wants more. More than 05-1 can ever stand to give it. And when 05-1 refuses to give, the factory will begin to take. And what the factory wants, sooner or later, the factory will get. Hour 1. There is only one news story on every website, newspaper, and TV screen. The flowers are blooming everywhere, all across the globe. Every country, every landmass, the bitter cold of the Antarctic gives way to a glowing rainbow of petals. The Sahara Desert and Death Valley become beacons of thriving technicolor plant life. The highest mountains, the lowest valleys, the darkest caves, the flowers even burst free from the concrete of cities, as if reminding us that really it was never our world. We were only borrowing it. And today, our lease is up. This is SCP-001, object class, unnecessary. It was foretold by tales from other dimensions, a distant future coming down the tracks towards us. And today, the train has reached the station. Nobody's reporting on how the economy or the stock market is doing today. No point. Celebrity scandals have faded away into nothingness. Greedy businessmen, lying politicians, brutal tyrants. None of them are making the headlines today. The very last headlines. The world gone beautiful. And what a shame. It takes the end of it all to make us realize what really matters to us. That's right. You're looking at the end of the world. But it's okay. Don't panic. Take a deep breath in and out. It was bound to happen eventually, so no point worrying now. Even the Foundation knows that this just isn't something they can stop. So instead of asking things like how can we prevent this or do we have any final tricks up our sleeve, let's ask a different question entirely. What would you do if you knew that you only had 24 hours until all life on Earth ends? Think hard. After all, even if you never live to see the flowers bloom, a final day will still come for you, just as it does for us all. Hour 6. A D-Class sits alone in his cell when he sees the flowers growing out of the ground. Normally he'd assume that this meant he was in some kind of foundation experiment, but not today. Everyone on Earth had an innate sense that the time is now. A kind of gallows calm spreads out over everyone and everything. It's over, and that's okay. We all knew it was going to happen eventually, right? He sighs and gives a slight smile. Those flowers sure are beautiful. That's when he hears footsteps outside his cell approaching. A key slides into his cell door and opens. There stands Dr. Gears, holding a bottle of wine and two glasses. Anyone who knows him might think he's been replaced by some kind of shape-shifting anomaly, or had his mind taken over by a powerful cognito hazard. But no, it's him. The famously cold Dr. Charles Ogden Gears. Dr. Gears says, Come on, it's a lovely day out there. It'd be a terrible waste to spend the whole thing cooped up in here. It'd feel like a trick on any day but this. The D-Class nods and follows the doctor out. The normally oh-so-stoic Foundation senior researcher pours himself and the D-Class each a glass of wine and asks, What's your name, by the way? I don't think I ever checked. The D-Class replies that his name is Harold. The two smile and chat as they exit the now empty D-Class containment wing. Everyone else is outside already. Researchers, guards, administrative staff, and D-Classes, all rubbing elbows enjoying the beautiful sun on their last day together. Elsewhere on site, a flock of SCP-514 is released, just as identical flocks are being released from every containment site all over the world. They've prepared it all for this very day. SCP-514 is a special breed of homing pigeons created by the Mana Charitable Foundation, which have the power to suppress aggression for those within their field of anomalous influence. And now millions of them are flying all over the world. After all, there's no point fighting on a day like this. There is no future left to secure. People always told them there would forever be hope until the flowers bloomed. No situation was ever truly over until the world went beautiful. But in the absence of hope, there was something even more inviting. Total, absolute calm. 
The Site 19 personnel sit together and watch the flowers bloom. Hour 12. All militaries call a global ceasefire. Soldiers from opposing sides hug and shake hands in flowery fields that once seemed choked by death and blood. Borders fade. Bitter rivalries turn to dust. Korea unifies. All is quiet in the Middle East. Gangsters and drug cartels drop their weapons and return home to their families and friends as flocks of SCP-514 fly above. What good is all the blood money in the world on a day like this? Wardens walk cell to cell through all the world's prisons, granting people their freedom again, sometimes after lifetimes of not having it. They taste the air again, feel the sun on their face. They close their eyes, drink it in, and walk among the flowers free men. Locations of Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited close their doors and shutter their windows worldwide. For the first time in as long as any of them can remember, they turn their signs to closed. They've earned a day off. Everyone has. The Chaos Insurgency rolls up their plans and burns them. They drop their weapons and throw away their tactical gear. As they do so, they can't help but question themselves. What was it all for in the end? What was any of it for? All the fighting and bloodshed and death. We did it day after day, only to do it again the next day. What silly reasons we killed and died for. What silly reasons indeed. The Global Cult Coalition dismisses its staff, thanking them for their service and telling them to go spend their last hours with the ones they love. Like the Foundation, they accept that this is the one true final end. No ritual to stop, no monster to fight. No evil extra-dimensional entity to thwart. Just go outside and smell the flowers, while you still can. The Serpent's Hand are similar. They decide after decades fighting a losing battle, they'll spend their last day in the Wanderer's Library, reading some of their favorite volumes. All these wonderful stories, now left for other Earths to read. Their own stories would be counted among them in the end, and they take great comfort in that. In a sense, everyone will live forever in the pages of the books in the Wanderer's Library. Herman Fuller's Circus of the Disquieting releases all of its freaks and clowns from their twisted grasp to go and live out whatever small dreams and tiny pleasures they could find over their last hours. They have no foundation of fear anymore. Nobody minds their strange appearances and odd behaviors. Why would anyone waste such a beautiful day judging others on the last day on Earth? There's nothing left to prove. Sarcasists drop their ancient fleshbound tomes, and acolytes of the Broken God put down their gilded blades. On the slopes of Siberia, the jungles of Peru, and the most isolated beaches of Mexico, twisted flesh finally touch living metal in the spirit of husbandry. Their eternal war is at its end. In the face of the blooming world, they didn't seem so different after all. The agents of the Dr. Wondertainment Corporation predictably chose to spend their last hours sitting around and playing with toys together. Time well spent, if you ask us. In a highly secretive location, perhaps the most heavily secured place in the entire world, the 13 members of the legendary O5 Council decide to just sit and talk. Anyone who knows anything about this secretive cabal can tell you. The O5 Council has spent a considerable portion of their very, very long lives trying to figure out ways to dodge and cheat death. But now, facing a death they can't dodge, the same calm washing over the rest of the world has finally reached them too. All they can really think this time is, well played, Reaper, well played. As they chat about the kind of inane, casual things that they haven't had time to discuss in years, O5-3 suggests inviting the Ethics Committee over to join. Nobody disagrees. Hour 16. It isn't just the D-Classes. All sapient and non-aggressive SCPs have been released from containment, free to spend the last of their time as they wish. Tens of thousands of anomalous individuals are released from containment sites all over the globe. It'd be the greatest victory that the Serpent's Hand could ever ask for, if they weren't all too busy reading to notice. SCP-105 Iris Thompson finally returns to her parents. The Foundation had fed them the lie that their daughter had died many years before, but as Iris had a tendency to do, she was ready to work a miracle. Her parents embrace her with open arms. They'll spend their last hours together catching up on what's happened since they parted ways and making up for lost time. They couldn't 
be happier. SCP-1867 Lord Blackwood, the fantastical sea snail, is delivered into a warm rock pool near the site where he was being contained. There he might finally have one more grand adventure before all is said and done. Though afterward, he may not have the time to tell anyone about it. A terrible shame, really, because nobody spins a yarn like Lord Blackwood. The non-aggressive little misters run free. Mr. Fish eagerly returns to his native Boston, Massachusetts, where he enjoys one more lobster sandwich before the end of the world. Mr. Headless decides to go hat shopping because he wants to look good for the apocalypse. Mr. Lost finally settles down for the afternoon, deciding that, just this once, he's earned himself a rest. SCP-2800 Cactus Men returns to Edinburgh to spend his last days picking up litter and helping old ladies cross the street. SCP-3663 The Tunnel Monster walks the streets of his hometown, searching for an old friend, hoping to reunite before it all ends. SCP-073 Kane decides to take a walk outside for the first time in thousands of years. He can't help but smile, as the bright, colorful life beneath his feet is growing faster than his presence can kill it. What a truly beautiful day. Knowing that there's no longer time for cults to form and bother him, SCP-2662 Cthulhu decides to take a break from his intense Minecraft session and go take a walk outside. It feels so good to have the sun on his tentacles once more and to feel the lush green grass under his suction cups. He shakes his head thinking once again about the irritating cults that had been pestering him for decades. What kind of idiot would want him to destroy a world like this? SCP-343, also known as God, sighs and looks over all his creation for what he knows to be the last time. His mouth curls into a smile as he thinks, Well, we had a pretty good run. Still in a cell, SCP-049, the Plague Doctor, puts his feet up and decides to relax. The pestilence will soon be taken care of. On some animalistic level, below thought, below even instinct, SCP-096 feels grateful that no gaze will ever fall upon it again. Somewhere fizzling in a vat of acid within a highly secure containment chamber, SCP-682 is feeling, for the first time in its hellish existence, a sense of profound relief. The pain, the hate, the rage, the constant termination attempts, it all be over soon. Hour 23. People gather in the streets. They laugh and dance and sing as the moon shines, fat and white, far above. Deep in their hearts, they quietly contemplate the end of all of this. But why worry? Why spoil the fun? There's no future left to worry about. Strangers become as close as family in the end. Human or otherwise, anomalous or non-anomalous, Chaos Insurgency agents have last suppers with ex-Serpent's hands and GOC operatives. There is no hate left, no violence. No malice, no cruelty. The greatest tragedy in all of this is that it took the ultimate end to bring it out in people. But why worry? Why worry? Seconds pass, then minutes. The world buzzes, it hums. Trillions of creatures doing everything they'd wanted even though it won't last. In the face of the true end, the world has never been more alive. Hour 24, silence forever and ever and ever. Good night. We'll end this video the way it began, by putting a question to you. How would you spend your last 24 hours on Earth? Let us know down in the comments, because it'll happen to all of us eventually. The Church of the Broken God. We've mentioned these machine-revering evangelists in a countless number of videos here on SCP Explained before, and it's because they're one of the most prolific groups of interest out there with 300,000 active members across the globe. That we know of. They likely have more members and devotees than other iconic groups of interest, like the Serpent's Hand and the various cults of the Scarlet King combined. But how much do we really know about the Church of the Broken God? We've consulted Foundation historians and Mechanite scripture to find the answers and put together a truly comprehensive overview of this complex and often misjudged faction of the SCP Foundation multiverse. A faction that the Foundation may one day find themselves far more closely aligned with than they ever imagined to face an even greater foe. Give glory to the Broken God, and let us begin our journey into his teachings.
The Church of the Broken God is a slightly more centralized group than the Serpent's Hand, though that really isn't saying much. They're split into three overall subgroups over a series of schisms that we'll delve deeper into later. The Broken Church, the Cogwork Orthodox Church, and the Church of Maxwellism. Before we get into the differences between these three groups, let's take a quick look at what unites them. All splinter cells of the Church worship the technological deity Mekane, known by many names, the most popular of which is the Broken God or Goddess. They all believe that Mekane was split into pieces and is lying dormant. They all revere machinery and technology over flesh, which they view as broken, weak, or corrupt. And without exception, all of them are the sworn mortal enemies of the Sarkists. Just for context, the Sarkists are the perfect equals and opposites to the Church of the Broken God. Under the leadership of the God King Grand Karsist Ion and finding their origins in Mekane's counterpart, the primal and flesh-based Yaldabaoth. The Sarkists worship and revere the base concepts of flesh, corruption, and disease, despising everything that the Church stands for. It is important to make note of these facts, given just how much of the Church of the Broken God's history is defined by their conflicts with the Sarkists. More on that later. The Broken Church is the oldest and most traditional of these three main sects. They are led by a man named Robert Bomaro, a Mechanite holy man who, in 1946, just after the Seventh Occult War, ascended from a mere collector of church-based anomalous trinkets to the title of Builder of God, after imbibing in SCP-217, also known as God's Ichor and his broken blood. Of all the church sects, the Broken Church is the most invested in conducting worship through active efforts to reconstruct the Broken God and bring about McCain's second coming. Of course, those of you who are familiar with SCP-001, the Ouroboros Cycle, will know that this sometimes has mixed results. After commissioning a counterfeit heart from the sinister folks at the factory, the Broken Church's most notable attempt at a full Mechane resurrection went horrifically wrong, resulting in a huge mechanical abomination that tore its way across Mexico, devouring everything it could until eventually being brought down by SCP-2399 a giant space cannon known as the Malfunctioning Destroyer. Anyway, now for a sect with a slightly less overtly destructive method of worshipping Mekane, the Cogwork Orthodox Church, whom you may remember as the ones who gave Alexei Velotrov sanctuary after he was eventually freed from SCP Foundation containment. These worshippers innovated a practice known as standardization, which involved undergoing mechanical enhancement in order to appear closer to their maker. However, we aren't talking about sleek, technologically advanced cyborg parts here. The religious aesthetic of the Cogwork Orthodox is heavily inspired by the Industrial Revolution, with an emphasis on components such as gears or cogs. As such, members of the Church who have undergone extensive modifications to remake themselves in the image of their god will often make loud ticking or tapping sounds, leading to the derogatory nickname, Tickers, often used among the other two sects. However, a major advantage of the church is that it is heavily organized and regulated from the top down, with rigid systems and strict rules against electrical or digital technology. Think of them as Catholicism to the broken church's Protestantism. The cogwork orthodoxy keeps to themselves, but we do know a great deal about their internal command structures. The orders of the cogwork orthodox church are as follows. At the very top of the pyramid are the patriarchs, a mysterious and insular group who have the ultimate word on church matters, and release missives that will later become the schema, the church's holy text. Below them are the schematists faithful, scholars and scribes who write and record the schema from the aforementioned teachings and commands of the patriarchs. The gates faithful are the internal affairs orders of the Cogwork Orthodox Church. They investigate matters going on within the faith, such as weeding out heretics and meditating internal disputes. They're one of the two orders permitted to carry weapons, the others being militants faithful, who act as the self-defense wing, keeping the church safe from external threats and acting as ambassadors to outside groups. The next two orders are the fabricators faithful and the inventors faithful. The fabricators act as foremen who oversee production on church properties, ensuring that only the finest quality is achieved. 
That's because, in addition to standardization, the Cogwork Orthodox Church believes that mass production of items using Industrial Revolution methods is also a viable form of worship for Mekang. This brings us to the inventors. They come up with new methods and designs for standardization and go on quests and explorations to discover the answers to any questions the church may have. But our information on the Cogwork Orthodox Church doesn't end there. Thanks to their truly extensive writings, we even know about the multitude of saints that the church reveres and their various purposes to followers of the church. For example, Saint Legate Tronion. She was the sneaky and covert patron saint of the Legate's faithful. There was also Saint Schematis Platon. She's the patron saint of the written word, of editors, of timetables, and of diagrammatic organization. Patron saint of the inventor's faithful, of designers, of repairmen, and of cognition engines. Saint Scranton, patron saint of spatial fabric manipulation, higher dimension mathematics, and anthracite coal extraction. Saint Fabricator Baffle, patron saint of workflow and the assembly line. Saint Inventor Chalk, patron saint of chorists. And Saint Inventor Enrichner, patron saint of the Entelechided. They have a pretty rigid structure and extensively recorded mythology is what we're saying here, just in case that didn't come across. This brings us to the Church of Maxwellism, the newest and smallest of the sects, as well as the least combative. However, they pose the greatest threat of all to the SCP Foundation's quest to maintain a veneer of normality. That's because Maxwellists forego the extensive standardized body modifications of the Church of the Cogwork Orthodox, and instead prefer smaller internal implants that allow them to interface directly with the internet from their brains. This allows them to fulfill their primary goal, spreading the good word of Mekane, whom they refer to as WAN, all across the globe using the Information Superhighway, while also netting them the nickname Hummers among the other two sects. In contrast to the conformist elements of their sister organizations, Maxwellists embrace their individuality and unique traits, being highly decentralized but very communicative with their fellow believers. They believe Wan is a fragmented god, existing in the world of digitized data rather than clunky old hardware. With their extreme internet savvy, it's likely that they've brought in many new converts to the broken god's cause, despite them being the youngest of all the overall religion's sects. But now we have an overview of the state of the Church of the Broken God today, and we must ask ourselves a second question. How did we get here? What is the history of the Church? To find the answer, we need to go back. Before the modern era. Before the SCP Foundation. Before even humanity itself. It begins when Mekane and Yaldabaoth created humanity. Yaldabaoth created the bodies of human beings, primal sensual creatures driven by base instincts and urges, and Mekane gave them their minds, reasonable, logical, and compassionate. For a time, the two would preside over mankind in harmony, but things would not stay that way forever. One of the earliest civilizations that the Foundation discovered interacting with these two deities was the anomalous Shah Dynasty, sometimes also referred to as the Shah Culture Group which reigned in China from 2100 to 1600 BCE, though the only sources that confirm the very existence of the Xia dynasty are anomalous. It was here that we heard the first whispers of the cult of the Broken God. To the Xia dynasty, the being we would later call Mekane was known as the Father Serpent Fuxi, and Yaldabaoth was known as Mother Dragon Nyowa. Because the Xia dynasty was anomalous all the way down, Scholars of Father Serpent Fuxi were said to practice the Way of the Serpent, as he has always been associated with knowledge. The Way of the Serpent involved undergoing a physical transformation into a snake-like being to better resemble the deity, much like how modern Cogwork Orthodox Church followers try to reshape their bodies to better resemble their creator today. According to Shah Dynasty scripture, which would form the basis of the entire belief system of all sects of the Church, Fusi broke down his own body and transformed himself into a brass cage around Mother Dragon Nyowa. However, unlike later iterations of the faith, the Shah Dynasty believed it was extremely important to see that the body of Fusi is never rebuilt, because to do so would lead to the release of Mother Dragon Nyowa and the end of the world. The civilization was started by a mythic figure known as the Yellow Emperor, 
who led the Xia dynasty to defeat other Fusi and Nyowa worshippers, then folding them into their own culture. Like many civilizations touched by Mekane, the Xia dynasty was incredibly scientifically advanced and skilled with metalworking. There's even evidence that the Xia dynasty created their own forms of the computer with effective artificial intelligence, as well as reality warping devices and even devices capable of interstellar travel. While the illustrious Xia dynasty would now be brought to its knees by a race of creatures known only as the Golden Crows, the next iteration of Broken God ancestors would be far closer to the worshippers we'd recognize today. This was the beginning of the Mechanite Empire, and by extension, the First War of the Flesh, the legendary extended conflict between the Mechanites and the Sarkists in the ancient world. Broken God cults were detected in Mycenaean Greece, a Greek civilization spanning the years 1600 to 1100 BCE. It was here where the Broken God first took up the name Mechane, and eventually he amassed enough followers to allow the theocratic Mechanite Empire to truly be born, and it would remain in power from 1200 to 1000 BCE. Much like the church in the modern day, the Mechanite Empire saw the marriage of theocracy, politics, and classical military dictatorship. And much like the Shah dynasty before it, it was marked by both tight structure and control, as well as incredible metallurgic production and technological advancement. Partly due to considering all of these to be holy acts, they had strong strategic relations with Egypt, Assyria, and Canaan, and their mix of commercial strength and a dominant naval presence gave them serious geopolitical standing, even if their highly evangelical attitude didn't always win them friends on the world stage. A number of roots for modern Church of the Broken God beliefs were clearly established here, including the paradigm shift from wanting to avoid Mekane's rebuilding to expediting the rebuilding. Texts made around this time were also the first to contain references to the name Wan as an alternate title for Mekane, revealing the basis for later Maxwellist practices in the modern day. However, as we alluded to before, despite these incredible advancements, the true ravages of the First War of Flesh were upon the Mechanites here. The Sarkists, who had established the Adium Empire, were on the offensive. Thanks to Grand Karsist Ion and his Karsist minions, the Karsists, by the way, were high-level followers of Sarkicism capable of performing flesh magic, the Sarkis forces were more powerful than ever before. They had mobilized their troops, and brought in trump cards the likes of which the Mechanites had never seen before. Giant flesh beasts that acted as living siege weapons, human warriors turned into deadly monsters with Sarkic magic, and the most deadly of all, a bioweapon that the Mechanites called the Red Death at the time, though we know it better as the flesh that hates. As is often the case in war, this led to unprecedented advancements in technology on the side of the Mechanites, too. The most notable example perhaps being SCP-2406, an incredible weapon of war known as the Colossus, which made for a formidable tool against the teeming forces of the Adium Empire. However, the advancements on both sides only made the war all the more brutal, with scores dying on both sides and both empires being severely weakened as the conflict stretched on. Things got so desperate for the Mechanites that they even joined forces with the infamously ruthless and savage Davites, the worshippers of the Scarlet King, to defeat the Sarkists. The decisive battle of the First War of Flesh was the Siege of Gyros, the Sarkic capital of Greece, where Mechanites eventually breached the stronghold and slaughtered the Karsists within. Another missive sent from the Sarkist field commander Karsis Tundas read, Grand Karsist Ion. May this missive find you at Kaithira, for it shall be my last. Our enemies have begun their assault on the island. The fallen kingdoms and followers of Mekain have united against us, even as the nations crumble. The wounds sustained today will heal. Into the ages of ages we are undying. I vow that none are to leave this island alive. We summon the Red Death for the blood of heathens. We sacrifice ourselves. We will meet again in Editum. But while the Mechanite Empire won the war, they didn't survive it. Due to the people lost and the resources expended, the Empire fully collapsed shortly afterwards. Some survivors renounced their Mechanite faith and entered other cultures. Some splintered off to preach and practice mechanism elsewhere. The remainder settled on the secretive island of Amini to form their own city-state. 
Here they replenish their numbers and forces over the centuries, maintaining secrecy to avoid intervention from outsiders and vengeful sarkists. By the 6th century BCE, the Mechanites from the city-state of Amini were developing a degree of regional power once more, thanks to the boon provided by their advanced technology. They were no longer a military powerhouse, but the tiny state instead became a trade juggernaut, providing mechanical goods and weapons to nearby civilizations that in turn provided the protection that the Mechanites so sorely required. Their cultures would later be influenced by the Roman Empire and various Pythagorean cults, who inspired a love of numerology and cosmic harmony in this ancient civilization, returning shakily to its feet. The 5th century BCE became known as the Golden Age of Mechanite literature, and the state continued to grow through military alliances with the Achaemenid Empire and the Kingdom of Carthage. However, the city-state of Amini was eventually wiped out for good in the 1st century BCE. Followers of the Broken God faith remained, but they were scattered to the wind for almost 2,000 years until the Industrial Revolution struck the Western world. Seeing the great machines of industry rise up seemingly overnight convinced the lingering cells of Broken God worshippers that perhaps, after a millennia, McCain was now preparing to return. They assembled into what is now known as the Broken Church and began preaching the Good Word. And considering the industrial fever of raw, unfettered progress gripping the world at the time, the Gospel of Mechain seemed to be an attractive prospect indeed. Meanwhile, debate was raging inside the ever-growing church about the nature of adapting oneself mechanically, a practice that had been out of fashion since the days of the original Mechanites. Broken church loyalists believed that modification through any means other than drinking the god's ichor, like Robert Bermaro would later do, is an insult to Mechain. Others, however, saw it as a tribute and a way of getting closer to their creator. This was the issue that caused the first New Age schism and led to the formation of the Cogwork Orthodox Church during the 1840s. The faith would never be the same after this. The various broken god splinter cells found a lucrative market in converting wealthy industrial oligarchs of the production boom and talking them into becoming glorified sugar daddies for their various new augmentation experiments, all to becoming post-Nibanic beings, meaning mechanical entities who leave the unreliable world of flesh behind for good and commune with the shiny metal infinite. In exchange, these industrialists would be provided with advanced mechanite knowledge of manufacturing, as well as technology far beyond their years. Everyone was a winner, well, except the SCP Foundation, but we'll touch on that whole debacle soon. By the closing of the 19th century, it seemed like the Cogwork Orthodox Church might totally outmode its predecessors at the Broken Church. However, the early 20th century would bring the mysterious Robert Bromero onto the scene. Bomaro was a mysterious man with unknown abilities and connections, but he soon commanded power and respect, taking over the broken church and even being taken seriously in rival sects. He gathered up a group of trusted enforcers and augmented them into his disciples, supposedly being able to speak directly to Mechain. He and his loyalists collected hundreds of artifacts relating to the broken god, blowing the minds of all involved with just how quickly he was able to do so. He disappeared in 1943 and was gone for three years, during which time he conducted the famous God's Icar ceremony and returned to his people as the self-styled Builder of God. This made him an even more esteemed figure across the world of the Broken God, a kind of Pope of Mechain, supposedly bearing a direct line of contact with the Divine. There would be a defining schism in the late 20th century that produced the Church of Maxwellism, as some wished to move beyond the outdated dogma of the Cogwork Orthodox Church and began administering electronic augmentations rather than just analog machinery. This resulted in a huge controversy for church members, as the patriarchs reacted swiftly with a slew of excommunications. Those excommunicated would soon become the first wave of Maxwellists and take the tenets of the broken god into the internet age. All of these groups have made trouble for the Foundation in their own way, from the online evangelizing of Maxwellists leaking classified knowledge to the weirdness of the cogwork tickers being impossible to ignore, to the frequent battles between the Foundation and the Broken Church over items which they believe to be parts of Mechain. However, if certain prophecies are to be believed, the relationship between the Foundation and the Church 
won't remain frosty forever. One day, perhaps they'll even stand metal to fleshy shoulder beside the Sarkis too, against a threat far more dangerous than all of them combined. It has been one month since the end of the world. Thirty long days since Stella had watched her husband dissolve in front of her. One minute, mowing the lawn like it was any other lazy afternoon, and the next collapsing into a useless pile of flesh and jelly. The end didn't come like she always thought it would, with hellfire raining down and pale riders galloping across the land on horseback. It began in the kitchen, with her humming a song to herself, mixing up a pitcher of lemonade before she rejoined her family in the sunshine. Then they were gone, lost forever when the sun turned wrong. She didn't even have time to grieve them properly before the threat turned on her, as the creatures that had once been her husband, her son, and her daughter swarmed to the door, slamming their new bodies against the wood with wet slaps, calling out to her in warped voices, begging her to step back outside. She covered her ears and wept for hours, until she had no tears left to cry. It didn't take long for Stella to figure out that whatever had happened to her family, it was happening all over the world. The small town she had known and loved had transformed into a hellscape, a maze of monsters and deadly light. She retreated underground to old mine shafts and tunnels, left abandoned decades ago when the local coal trade had dried up. There, she quickly discovered that she wasn't the only one with that idea. There were others, survivors, who had managed to make their way down into the dark, away from the horrors above. There weren't many, and she could never get to attach to the ones she did meet, in case they too were lost to the sun. But as the days wore on in the tunnels, she found herself forming a small group of stragglers. Not quite a family, but something that could be one day, and definitely much better than going it alone. There was Stella, of course, using her background as an elementary school teacher to keep everyone on track and working together. Then there was Brian, a former volunteer firefighter whose training and skills with an axe came in handy more than once. There was Trina, a teenage girl who had been babysitting when everything went to hell, who had a knack for evading the flesh monsters and making supply runs. And then there was Doris, former military nurse and current de facto team medic, sharp and capable, in spite of being in her late 70s. They were brave people, brilliant, and refused to give up. Others came and went, spare survivors they picked up as they navigated their way, raiding the ruins of grocery stores and hospitals, but they always wound up leaving again. Or, worse, something would go wrong, and the sunlight would claim another victim. But the four of them stayed together, Stronger with their combined skills, willpower, and ability to sleep in shifts and keep an eye out for trouble. After some time in the tunnels, the group had come across a massive abandoned facility. None of them could determine where it came from or what organization might have run it, but it appeared to have been some kind of research lab. It was isolated, cut off from outside influences better than any of their previous hideouts had been. Whoever had once worked here had cleared out or been taken out in a hurry. But in their place, they had left behind rations, medical equipment, emergency generators, and clean drinking water. There were enough supplies to keep the group going for months, if they rationed carefully. And so they settled in. The abandoned research facility, whatever it once was, became their makeshift home. This unexpected sanctuary was cut off from the rest of the world. Clinical, cold, lonely, but a safe place for them to rest their heads. Now it had been a month since this all began. Stella shook her head at this realization, the passage of time feeling almost meaningless at this point. What did a month even mean anymore? What was a day when she couldn't even see the sun rise and set? As she sat there warming herself by the side of a foraged space heater, she thought about missing the stars, the moon, the promise of the cosmos. A time when the vast open sky was an invitation to dream, instead of something to hide from. That time was gone now. There was nothing to do but mourn it and carry on, if not for her, then for the others. They had all found ways to keep busy in this new place. Trina took to exploring the empty halls, the laboratories filled with strange equipment, the small rooms that looked like prison cells or police interrogation rooms. 
She had cooked up some theory about it being a government facility, like something out of an old episode of The X-Files. Brian had found an on-site library, filled with history books and scientific texts. There was enough to read in there, he said, that by the time he was finished, he would have the equivalent of several doctorate degrees. Doris had taken initial stock of all the medical supplies available at the site. Gauze, disinfectant, vials upon vials of medications she had never heard of, and had categorized them all neatly. Now she spent her hours mostly sitting with Stella, telling her stories about whatever she felt like. Her time overseas, her late husband, their children, decades-old neighborhood gossip. It felt good to talk, no matter what it was about. It felt human. They all had their ways of keeping their grip on their own humanity. It had almost gotten boring, holed up in the facility without the constant threat of danger pressing in from all sides. Boring, but peaceful. Stella could feel herself starting to nod off, her eyelids sagging, her dinner of canned beans sitting heavy in her stomach. Next to her, Doris had already begun to softly snore. Soon sleep would come for her, too, and bring with it dreams, memory of the life that was gone forever, the world as she had once known it. The dreams were tough, but waking up from them was even tougher. Still, she had to rest. She could only fight it for so long. She could almost hear her husband's voice when, Hey, Stella, you might want to see this. Brian was there suddenly, his words breaking through the haze in her mind. His tone was severe, and she knew that sleep would have to wait. She followed him down the hall for a while, before he stopped and turned her attention to a section of a damaged wall. It was rusted and corroded, black and gray, with massive cracks in the solid material. It looked like it had been slowly disintegrated over time by an incredibly strong acid. It was off-putting to look at, giving off the distinct sense that something bad had happened. But a lot of bad things had happened in the past month. I don't really understand what I'm looking at, Stella said, and Brian grabbed her by the shoulders, commanding her attention. This wasn't here yesterday. Hell, it wasn't here a few hours ago, he gestured to the damage. It just happened. And whatever is responsible is probably still here. A chill ran down Stella's spine. It seemed impossible for this kind of structural damage to happen over the course of a few hours. She could see twisted steel rebar, drips of melted metal that had trickled onto the floor. As she leaned in for a closer look, she gagged. There was an overpowering stench of rot and decay. It didn't take long for her to spot the source. A thick, black mucus covering the hole in the wall slick and slimy, and giving off the putrid smell. It wasn't like the material that had made up the flesh creatures outside. It was something else entirely. Something she had never seen before. She reached out a hand to touch it, but quickly caught herself. Whatever this stuff was, it was bad news. If it could do that to a solid wall, she didn't even want to think about what it could do to flesh and bone. What do we do? She asked. Inspect the area, make sure it's safe, see if it's some kind of toxic waste leak, or... He didn't finish the thought. He didn't have to. They needed to find out if this damage came from something living. Something that could be hiding in the building with them, and waiting for the chance to strike. When they returned to the main room, Doris was awake and Trina was there waiting for them. They agreed to split into pairs and search the facility, looking for any additional damage, strange black fluid, or signs of foul play of any kind. Trina and Brian went one way, while Doris and Stella went the other, each person armed with a flashlight and a weapon of some kind. An axe, a bat, a knife. Stella had found a loaded pistol when they first arrived, one that she hoped she would never have to use. Now she carried it with her, just in case. Stella and Doris walked together for an hour, keeping an eye out for anything suspicious. They didn't find anything notable, really, there were some bits of rust they hadn't seen before, an occasional black puddle pooling on the floor, but nothing like the scene Brian had found. As they walked in silence, Stella found herself beginning to relax. Maybe the worst was over. Maybe a pipe had broken somewhere and broken down a bit of the wall, but nothing else would really come of it. Then, from the other side of the building, there came a high-pitched scream. She knew that voice immediately. Trina, screaming bloody murder, and Brian bellowing something. She grabbed Doris by the arm, and the two ran in the direction of the sound. As they got closer, they could hear other sounds in addition to Trina and Brian's yells. Loud cracking, like something solid coming apart. 
bits of rubble falling to the ground, and the wet dripping sound of something thick hitting the floor. As the two rounded the corner to see what was happening to help their friends, Stella froze in shock. She had seen some harrowing things since that fateful sunny day. She almost thought she had become desensitized to horror, that there was nothing left in the world that could face her, but this moment proved her wrong. There was so much to take in and so little time. Brian was swinging his axe wildly at the floor, chopping at it helplessly in an attempt to break it apart. It quickly became obvious why. Trina was sinking into the floor, not through a hole into the basement below, but into the floor itself. It rippled and melted around her, changing from a solid surface to a thick pool of black sludge. She flailed and struggled, grasping at the ground around her, at Brian's arm, anything to yank herself free. But she wouldn't budge. She continued to sink. No, she wasn't just sinking. She was being pulled. Stella felt her legs begin to work again, and she rushed to Trina's side, grabbing hold of her arms with all the strength she had. All the while, Trina screamed in a mix of desperation, terror, and pain. Brian continued his assault on the ground, as if he could cut her free from the floor, and Doris moved to help Stella. She grabbed a hold of Trina's waist, but stopped suddenly. There, at the place where her body vanished into the floor, Trina was beginning to fall apart. Whatever had turned the floor into a portal, Whatever had rotted away at the walls, it was taking its toll on her body too. The flesh falling away from the bone, the muscles liquefying and everything becoming corrupted by that same black mucus. If they pulled any harder, Trina would be ripped in two, her chest, arms, and head on the surface, while her legs, stomach, and most of her vital organs were lost. There was no way to save her. Stella saw it when Doris did, and the two shared a long, sad look. Trina was here with them still struggling for her life, but she was already gone. As if it felt their hopelessness, the force pulling on Trina from below then gave a horrifying yank they were praying to not have to witness, and she was swallowed up by the ground. All that remained was a sticky black smear, a large crack in the floor, and three survivors where there had just been four. None of the remaining three slept a wink that night. Brian paced back and forth, holding his axe. Doris went over their supplies again, looking for anything that could be used to treat the effects of the corrosive black fluid, and Stella ran over their potential options again and again. They could stay and hope that the thing that took Trina never came back, or they could leave and face the possibility of succumbing to the sun or the influence of the creatures that once were people. She recalled dimly an old adage, the devil you know beats the devil you don't. Maybe that was true. Maybe it would be better to take their chances with the outside rather than stay and be hunted. But she thought of her husband and children again, watching them melt onto the grass, and she shuddered. There were no good options here, but she couldn't risk going out like that. They would stay. Whatever had taken Trina, there were three of them, and only one of it. Besides, maybe it had already gotten what it wanted, and now it would move on. She didn't know it when she fell asleep, only that when she eventually woke up, she was alone. Brian and Doris were nowhere to be found. She called out their names as her heart leaped into her throat. For a moment, she feared the very worst. But then, Brian answered her. He had been patrolling, looking for signs of trouble, but he was fine. She asked if Doris was with him, and he went pale. He told Stella that Doris had gone to an on-site bathroom to get cleaned up hours ago before he left. She should have been back by then. Without another thought, they took off towards the bathroom, and saw their worst fear realized. The door to the room was gone, rotted away, and Doris was gone with it. She had been taken before she even had the chance to scream. They stood there, taking in the reality of what had happened with silent shock. Then, a sound from behind caused them to turn around. It was a raspy, hollowed out sound, like air forced from a dying man's lungs. A dry, empty, evil chuckle from an inhuman throat. There they saw the creature that had stolen their friends. From a distance, Stella could have confused it for a man, a very old, very sick man, but still human. As it shuffled closer, however, that illusion was shattered. Its eyes were black voids, its skin gray and putrefied, its mouth a gaping, toothless maw of shriveled black gums, and it was laughing at them like it was enjoying itself. There was the smell again, 
that overpowering reek of all things foul. Stella drew her pistol and fired several shots. She didn't have the best aim, especially not when her hands were shaking with fear, but one of the bullets found its target and hit the creature in the cheek. It hissed, not in pain, but a perverse amusement, as the lead tore a hole through its flesh like wet paper. Globs of black blood spattered everywhere, spreading the rock wherever they landed. To her side, she heard Brian cry out in pain. When she turned, he was clutching his right eye. Some of the liquid had hit him there, and it was already taking effect. Stella's stomach turned as she saw something white slide down the side of Brian's face, his eye melting out of its socket. The skin around it followed suit, softening like putty and dribbling away from the bloody muscle underneath. Brian collapsed to the floor as the creature continued to advance on them, laughing louder and louder. It knew that bullets couldn't kill it, knew that there was nowhere to run. Stella grabbed a hold of Brian's arms, prepared to carry her fallen friend to safety, but he stopped her. I'm done for, he said quietly. If you try to carry me, you are too. She shook her head, unwilling to leave him behind, and he touched her cheek, forcing a smile on his decaying face. I, I didn't think I'd make it this far. I, I wouldn't have without you. So run, save yourself. She could hear the resignation in his voice and knew that he would not let her save him. I'll, I'll hold him off as long as I can, Brian promised. And with tears in her eyes, Stella turned and ran as fast as she could. As her feet pounded the ground, blood rushing in her ears, she could hear Brian screaming and cursing at the creature until his voice quickly faded into a wet gurgle. And then, silence. Stella sat in the center of the room that she and the others had once shared, clutching her scavenged pistol in her hands. Every creak, every errant sound made her jump. It could be anywhere, come from anywhere. She had escaped from so much already, survived more than anyone was ever meant to, had lost her love, her friends, her home. She wouldn't lose herself too. She held her breath as she heard it, clear in the darkness, drip, drip, drip. Her grip on the weapon tightened and she readied herself. If she had to go down, she might as well go down swinging. The old man, whether he was a man, a monster, or death itself wouldn't be taking her anywhere, not without a fight. Now go check out SCP-106 The Old Man Tale Until Death and SCP-001 When Day Breaks for more on the old man and what happens to the world when the sun turns against humanity.